A very good morning to one and all present here. I welcome you all to the virtual 11th World Conference on Pharmaceutical Science and Drug Manufacturing on February 13th, 2024, organized by Association of Pharmaceutical Research, APR. Association of Pharmaceutical Research is one of the renowned professional association meant for research and development in the field of technology. APR is an international forum for researchers, academicians, doctors, practitioners, for sharing knowledge and innovation in the field of pharmaceutical science and technology. APR aims to bring together worldwide researchers and professionals, encouraging intellectual development and providing opportunities for networking and collaboration. APR meets with its objectives through academic networking, meetings, conferences, projects, research publications, academic awards and scholarships. APR is honored to organize 11th World Conference on Pharmaceutical Science and Drug Manufacturing. The pharmaceutical industry discovers, develops, produces, and markets pharmaceutical drugs for the use as medications to be administered to patients with the aim to cure and prevent diseases or elevate symptoms. Many disruptive technologies and emerging trends are going to have a great impact on the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical sector must embrace these new technologies to provide better health in future and to focus on digital health. Considering this, APR brings together all the professionals, scientists, doctors, research scholars from pharmaceutical sector to share their thoughts, research works, and to discuss the recent technologies and trends. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our honorable dignitaries. With much pride, I would like to introduce the conference chair, Professor Dr. Mirza Arbai, Acting Dean and Professor, Department of Clinical Pharmacy and Pharmacotherapeutics, Dubai Pharmacy College for Girls, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. I would like to proudly introduce and welcome the keynote speakers for today. Professor Dr. K. Lakshmi, Professor in Dean, Chedinath School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Member, Board of Management, Chedinath Academy of Research and Education, India. Dr. Karthik Anandaraman, Vice President, Apollo Hospitals, PNL Commercial Leader, Ex Chief Operating Officer of Roche, Ex Director of e Pharmacy and Private Label Business, Unit Head of Biocon India. Dr. Mohammed Sharif, Regional Senior Medical Advisor, Janssen and EMEA, Dubai, UAE. Dr. Malika Rujana Rao Arjun Pichka, Head, Center for Excellence of Bioactive Molecules and Drug Delivery, Associate Dean and Professor, International Medical University, Malaysia. Associate Professor Dr. Palanirajan Vijayaraj Kumar, Head of the Department, Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, UCSI University, Malaysia. Dr. Kampon Sri Vatanakul, President and CEO, Datan Co, Thailand. Ms. Sama Raghav, Regulatory Affairs and Pharmacovigilance Director, Middle East, Organon, United Arab Emirates. Dr. Sasikala Chinnapan, Assistant Professor, Head of Department, Pharmaceutical Biology, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, UCSI University, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Now, I would also like to welcome and introduce the session chairs for today, Dr. Satish Kumar Sarankar, Principal and Professor, Akhil Bharati <coughs> College of Pharmacy, India, Dr. S. Murugesan, Associate Professor, Siddha Toxicology, National Institute of Siddha, Mr. Ravinandan, Assistant Professor, Pharmacy Practice, Sri Siddha Ganga College of Pharmacy, India. I would like to welcome all the participants and we are looking forward to your active participation. I would like to thank each one of you who have gathered here. I kindly request Professor Dr. Mirza Arbai, Acting Dean and Professor, Department of Clinical Pharmacy and Pharmacotherapeutics, Dubai Pharmacy College for Girls, to deliver the welcome message to the esteemed participants. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I feel extremely glad and gives me immense pleasure 
to welcome you all for this much awaited conference 11th world conference on pharmaceutical science and drug manufacturing before we kick start the conference i would like to express my gratitude towards you all who sincerely contributed to this event in order to make it a success this will not be a possible without your support and it gives me great pleasure to extend you all a very warm welcome on behalf of association of pharmaceutical research which is one of the world's leading professional association caring for the people apr and bioleaks is a non profitable professional association meant for research and development in the field of pharmaceutical science and technology it is a favorable time for everyone to renew the contacts and discuss problems of mutual interest with delegates from different part of the world it is gratifying to note that the agenda of the conference covers a wide range of interesting themes people who have been chosen for today's event have been chosen for a reason that is due to their mutual passion and your passion for a common goal helps us to bring you together and unite energy in realization of these goals whether on an individual level or a group level we all need each other for the fulfillment of our common goals and that's why it makes our resolution even stronger heartiest congratulations to all the speakers and the conference delegates as without your support this conference will not able to prove to be beneficial to a higher extent i wish you all to achieve the objectives in this conference thank you thank you one and again thank you sir we will now move on to the keynote lectures we have been waiting for I request Professor Dr. K. Lakshmi, Dean, Chetinath School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, to render the lecture. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. I request all the other participants to mute your audio. Am I audible, Joshua? Yes, ma'am, you're audible, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity. Uh, good morning to all for the 11th World Conference on Pharmaceutical Science and Drug Manufacturing. I am Dr. Lakshmi, Professor and Dean Chetinath School of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Second. So today uh, I would like to uh, give a keynote presentation on current pharmaceutical challenges and role of AI, and which is a navigating aspect of the future of healthcare. So AI is a buzzword now, artificial intelligent, machine learning and deep learning are very uh, upcoming field that too it is slowly venturing into the pharmaceutical industry. It plays a very pivotal role in advancing the healthcare system. So this advancement has tremendous contribution towards the innovation and in the drug development process. Uh, and uh, the manufacturing of footprint modifications is also needed so that it suits the current requirement and the current compliances. That too, after COVID, we have a lot of changes that has been made in the entire world. We are witnessing the changes that are uh, that are made in the entire world. So for that, of course, this AI platform and the virtual platform will definitely contribute and uh, those industries who are ready to adopt this newer technologies will be in forefront. This presentation explores the current challenges that uh, are faced for the transformation, which is required in order to adopt this AI technology. So these are some of the current pharmaceutical challenges. Uh, there is a rise in the drug development cost because 
every uh, day every uh, minute there is a requirement for a drug for a new drug for a new drug development the cost has raised up to enormous and uh, of course this is because of a lengthy and costly clinical trials that has to be undergone for any drug to be in the market audience please can you mute your audio and uh, even in the drug discovery process there are a lot of complexities which has to be met by the industry and uh, of course the regulatory hurdles and complaints these are the major challenges uh, industry faces when they want to launch a new drug so uh, there is uh, a difference between the traditional approach and the modern approach so as per the traditional approach it it doesn't mean that there is no drug that is coming into the market in spite of all these challenges we are getting new drugs in the market and this traditional approaches in pharmaceuticals again they face the limitation like the efficiency and speed by the time the drug comes to the reaches the market it almost takes 20 to 25 years it's only the approximate one even more than uh, the required time so uh, some of the uh, inefficiencies in research and development is actually contributing to this slow uh, discovery and approval processes and uh, it of course it is very very essential to recognize the need for something else some alternate has to be done so that uh, so all these challenges can be overcome and the drug can reach the market in a, a faster manner so uh, this ai artificial intelligence is uh, slowly venturing into the pharma industry uh, artificial intelligence is actually revolutionizing the healthcare and it is uh, opening up with the new possibilities say uh, in uh, that again we have different classifications like supervised learning and unsupervised learning so supervised learning comprises of machine learning and deep learning so people are nowadays specializing in each and everything and uh, in machine learning there are again different categories that are being followed and uh, uh, it, it can be any of this method so we can uh, see here the number of methods any of this methods can be adopted and uh, it is again each and every methodology is contributing to the drug discovery target identification because that is where the target identification lead identification uh, uh, appropriate uh, receptor and uh, drug binding so this is where the um, most of the time is wasted so and that too it high throughput screening can, is done if it is done manually if it is done in the laboratory it takes several years for us to progress so instead of that this artificial intelligence technique can yeah. be adopted so that while samsung actually kar do so that uh, it, it actually what high part on the participant of us it speeds up the uh, process so ai applications range from drug discovery to clinical trials as well as even it can be utilized in the regulatory compliance and of course nowadays there is a new concept called personalized medicine even in that ai can be used so this integration so we are not going to avoid the conventional methods completely it is like adaptation to ai process so incorporation of ai techniques into the existing one so the integration of ai has the potential to address long standing challenges and streamline the processes nahal band ho gaya so uh, what is the current trend yaar main kya bol rahi hu main mujhe pagal ho audience please can you mute so the current trend Uh, where ai is applied is it is applied in all this aspects the first one is drug discovery and development it is actually uh, enabling the process virtual screening so screening process is uh, multiplied to tenfold or hundredfold and the time is reduced to tenfold to hundredfold and molecular modeling and predictive analytics where most of our time can be saved and it is also used in the precision medicine drug repurposing nowadays drug repurposing is of uh, a great interest because 
uh, absolutely finding out a new entity which fulfills the all the requirement is very very difficult so because of that reason drug repurposing is again a very uh, advancing uh, a very convincing method which is adopted nowadays then drug formulation and delivery it is also adopted in drug formulation and delivery then clinical trial optimization regulatory compliance and safety then supply chain optimization so in all this field uh, ai is utilized so how ai is adopted in uh, drug discovery so uh, this is mainly, as I said in the previous uh, slide, it is for particularly for optimizing the screening process because screening is where most of the scientists and researchers invest their time. So uh, this AI adopted technique can uh, reduce their time and it, it is also precise. The accuracy and precision can be enhanced. And uh, so there are uh, some of the successful ai driven drug discoveries are also there that i will be showing in your, in the upcoming slides so they have already adopted this ai technology and some of the products are already in the market so these are the different various uh, steps that are involved like target discovery hit identification then hit to lead optimization then preclinical studies and clinical studies these are the various steps that are involved and the researcher and the scientist may be spending several years together in each and every uh, domain so uh, if ai is adopted it can uh, actually overcome the challenges it can reduce the time and it can also give a more efficient product so these are some of the uh, products that are there in the market. And uh, we can see here the Oops. pharmaceutical org organization, the list of pharmaceutical organization, which have joined their hands with AI organization oh, and uh, in order to produce the drugs uh, with collaboration. So we can see some of the examples, Rochi, Sanofi, Bayer, Novartis, AstraZeneca, all these uh, industries have already joined hands with AI organizations such as Microsoft because pharma industry cannot do it alone. They need uh, some uh, kind of uh, software integration and the expertise in the software. So uh, you can see here the products which uh, have come up is the drug discovery and clinical trials and the treatment for lung cancer, breast cancer, and they have come up with some small molecules for diabetes and comorbidity conditions. So uh, still the research is going on and uh, we can expect uh, more such products in future. So these are some of the AI tools that are used in the drug discovery. It's not that only the pharma industry should adopt all this. Even it can be uh, adopted at a smaller level in, uh, uh, in an academic institution also. So these are some of the AI model tools like a deep chem, RD kit, and I have given a description like a, what for each and every tool is used. So uh, using these tools, one can venture into uh, integrating this AI into their research. So AI in clinical trials, in what way it is used in clinical trials? So it actually optimizes the patient recruitment process because it, that is where... Uh, uh, that is, again, a very difficult task, a patient recruitment and maintaining the patient and then reminding them about their uh, 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 formulation and then the blood sample collection. All this are can be integrated with AI. The predictive analysis, analytics can be done, which actually enhances the understanding of patient outcomes, improving the efficiency of the entire work. And then it is uh, by implementing AI in clinical trials, definitely it contributes to the cost reduction and a faster development timeline. So particularly AI, if it is integrated, of course, for integrating the AI, some cost is involved. But still, finally, as a overall, there will be a reduction in the total cost and definitely a, a speeding up of the entire process is guaranteed. So this is again the traditional approach to the clinical development and it's a very, very lengthy process. It takes uh, uh, some years to complete. So we can see here the different uh, uh, 
uh, circles, a circle chain that is showing the research and discovery, then the clinical development, and then it has to be subjected to manufacturing, and then it has to be launched uh, as a commercial after the appropriate regulatory compliance. And then uh, even uh, it doesn't end there, even post-marketing surveillance is carried out till the uh, uh, drug is in the market. So uh, we all know that there are different phases of clinical trials, uh, early phase one, phase one, and then phase two, phase three, and phase four. So in all these aspects, this particular AI can be integrated uh, so that the time can be reduced and the cost can also be reduced. And of course, definitely there can be a precise output also. Because uh, human-driven error and uh, uh, system-driven error. So, but system-driven error can be minimized by appropriate training tools. So, uh, these are the different uh, uh, pathways where they can be adopted. These are the different uh, steps where this AI can be integrated, maybe uh, during the trial design. So for uh, analyzing and interpreting the data, it can be utilized uh, the site performance in order to assess the site performance. Because even the clinical research organization, they may be uh, carrying out uh, several projects received from different industries. So in order to avoid the confusions, uh, this integration of AI will support them in real-time monitoring of each and every data. Then uh, it can be utilized in the setting up of trial and conducting the trial even. So designing the trial, then the starting up of the trial, and then by uh, the, all the recruitment process can be automated. Then uh, the consent process, the consent process can be obtained and they can be compared. Any um, discrepancies or any errors can be identified and rectified. And the exact trial can be conducted. And finally, the interpretation, data cleaning by ML method. So nowadays, it's a, uh, all this uh, machine learning allows the data cleaning uh, faster and accurate. And uh, here we also use NLP, that is natural language processing tool. So there are different tools that are utilized for this clinical trial as well. So this uh, uh, methodology, it uh, uh, delivers the clinical trial enrichment strategies. Even the recruiters uh, are satisfied and even the patients uh, who are involved in clinical trials also get complete clarity and satisfaction. So that is what is being done. So this machine learning and deep learning methods can be applied to mine, analyze and interpret the data because nowadays we have a lot of data. Even after COVID, uh, the data is huge. Nobody is comparing with a limited number of data. Since the data is huge, everybody requires the adaptation of new technology. So patient's journey is also said to be very satisfied because they uh, are ab absolutely monitored and they get time to time uh, alert for by giving them the, some kind of uh, mobile devices or apps or wearables where they are uh, constantly reminded of what uh, uh, they, where their diet is, when the blood sample has to be collected or what kind of... Uh, uh, lifestyle they need to follow during the uh, progress of the trial. So this actually makes them convenient uh, so that uh, they need not have to put everything in their calendar and they need not have to remind uh, they need not have to remember everything uh, and uh, they need not have to visit the site every time. They can be monitored from the place where they are. That is the advantage of using this uh, uh, techniques. And uh, this uh, AI tool can is also applied in uh, drug delivery, actually. After drug discovery, after the clinical trials, the delivery, drug delivery is one important aspect where uh, most of the academicians are involved in the uh, research. Uh, we come up with the new products like nano, nanoparticles, liposomes, neosomes. So there are various kinds of drug delivery that are available in the market in order to fulfill uh, the different ADME, pharmacokinetic aspect of the drug. 
So here again, this AI tool can be used in order to get an enhanced nanosystem design, in order to get a better permeation uh, of the drug. And uh, of course, the modeling and testing of the drug can be adopted. And uh, what are the parameters that has to be selected? And in that, what are the sub-parameters which has to be analyzed? All this can be easily understood by the help of this AI and ML tools. So these are some of the AI and ML tools which are uh, utilized in the pharmaceutical product development. So one cannot master in all this, but of course, a little knowledge of each and everything could be very useful for us to contribute something to the society. So genetic algorithms, artificial neural network, actually genetic algorithm and artificial neural network exist uh, uh, several decades ago. Uh, but now it has, uh, it, it, was, it has uh, reached a certain height because of the advancement of other AI models. So support vector machines, particle swarm optimization, and artificial intelligence based expert systems, Monte Carlo simulation and multivariate analysis techniques. So I actually basically work in this multivariate analysis technique. This technique can also be utilized for not only for drug development, it can also be used for drug delivery. It is also utilized for simultaneous analysis of drugs using a simple UV visible uh, technique. So this is uh, what is about uh, the multivariate techniques. In that, again, we have uh, uh, two different important components like principal component analysis and partial least square. So this uh, AI and ML models are also utilized in PBPK modeling. So this PBPK modeling is again physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling is again uh, uh, reaching heights because uh, nowadays the recognition is given for uh, this from the regulatory aspect itself. So there are a lot of uh, regulatory agencies are coming up with uh, non-animal models. So they are encouraging this PBPK modeling. And still now there are certain drugs that are there in the market, which has uh, ignored the animal study. After animal study, after... Uh, uh, instead of doing the clinical trials, uh, they have adopted this PVPK modeling and uh, it has reached the market also. There are certain products which are there with this kind of uh, uh, background story. So here uh, all the details from the animal models and the in vitro studies can be fed into the machine learning and it can be uh, integrated so that we can without uh, doing the clinical trials, we can come up with the output or we can predict uh, the, all the other parameters that can be estimated from the human trials. So uh, this is what is all about. Uh, this AI-assisted PBPK model is uh, carried out with uh, all the other databases of the formulation so that the exact uh, uh, pharmacokinetic details can be obtained. Uh, like how we do the clinical trials and get the details, same thing can be obtained. Uh, what kind of absorption, the distribution, or how the uh, drug will be metabolized, where it will be metabolized, and how much percentage, all this can be easily obtained. So this is actually taken from an article and I have given the reference uh, at the bottom of the slide. So AI in regulatory complaints. Uh, at the end of the day, whatever way we adopt, whatever changes we adopt, at the end of the day, if it is not satisfied by the regulatory, it is not fulfilling the regulatory compliance, then it, it is again waste of adopting all these techniques. So what AI ensures regulatory compliance by streamlining the documentation and the reporting processes. Even the uh, documentation part which is given to the regulatory can also be streamlined. The quality control and data integrity can be enhanced. So uh, uh, it becomes efficient and reliable pharmaceutical landscape. So uh, the errors can be minimized because of the data cleaning. The unwanted data can be removed and the interpretation can be appropriate and accurate. So it is uh, also adopted in the personalized medicine because nowadays uh, we are slowly venturing into 
repurposing of drugs, personalized medicine. So uh, for that, again, AI's uh, database, because personalized medicine requires uh, a person's complete history and uh, uh, a person's understanding about him in all aspects. For that, again, AI's support will be very much useful. So what are the, uh, though it is applied in uh, drug discovery, drug delivery, regulatory, then in the analytical purpose in uh, uh, in the personalized medicine so it is we have seen that it is uh, util it is actually applicable in all the uh, each and every uh, zone of drug development but there are still there are certain challenges that are there in adoption of this ai uh, why everybody is not adopting this these are the limitations these are the challenges which an industry or a person faces so this is particularly the lack of enabling the data ecosystem. They have uh, low intensity of AI research. There are no people who are the expertise, lack of expertise who know this and inadequate availability of expertise, technology and research. This is another reason uh, because we require expertise. Anything can be adopted only if a person is expertise. But some uh, before COVID, even we were not familiar we were not experts with the zoom uh, meeting itself but after that everybody has become expertized so slowly we hope that this uh, scenario will change high resource cost and low awareness and then uh, uh, privacy and security is a question mark here and ethical regulation of course and it is uh, again it doesn't have an attractive ip regime to uh, insensitize the research and adoption so how to overcome this definitely this can be uh, overcome by addressing the data privacy and security because even uh, uh, security concepts are also undertaken by uh, same kind of uh, uh, domain experts so they with their help again privacy and security can be enhanced that should not be a hurdle for ai implementation an ethical consideration is also slowly, it is also changing uh, so that uh, there should be a collaborative effort uh, for adopting this technique. And ongoing research ensures that AI is implemented responsibly to overcome the pharmaceutical challenges. So there are uh, 11, these are the list of 11 big pharma companies who have already adopted AI. So Sanofi has adopted, uh, joined hands with the uh, LE labs and uh, they are actually uh, implementing they have implemented AI for drug discovery, clinical trials and the manufacturing aspects and Pfizer with IBM uh, so they have again adopted uh, uh, AI and uh, they have come up with a drug called Paxlovid which is a oral drug for COVID-19 and know what is, is directly cool, right? audience, audience please mute your audience. audience so now what is as joint hands with microsoft and nvidia miss manju prajapati please mute your audio Thank you. So Novartis has currently has 150 ongoing projects which are AI integrated and Jason and trials 360.ai is having more than 100 AI project. So AstraZeneca and Bayer, Merck. So every leading pharma company is slowly adopting and they have joined hands with the AI experts in order to come up with a new products so, so what is the future outlook of this particular aspect uh, it has a potential to revolutionize the pharmaceutical landscape and uh, definitely there there is going to be collaborative efforts between the pharma company and the ai developers and this is going to shape up the future and there are multiple ongoing research and developments that is going to uncover the new possibilities for AI in healthcare. 
So uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for patient listening. Thank you, ma'am, for the enlightening presentation. Your insights are invaluable to our understanding of AI's evolving landscape in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the audience can ask questions. You can either type your questions in the chat box or unmute your mic and ask. Hope there is no questions. If there are no questions, I once again thank ma'am uh, for taking her time and sharing her valuable knowledge and expertise with us. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on to the next session, I now would like to invite um, Dr. Kampan Sri Vatanakul to render the lecture. Hello, everyone. Um, because uh, now Dr. Kampan has his patient, he will come back in 20 minutes. Could you please uh, rearrange the queue, please? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. The next speaker, I request Dr. Vijayraj Palaniraji to um, render the lecture. Um, uh, no problem. Uh, wait a minute. Yes, sir. Okay, very good morning to everyone. Is it I am audible to everyone? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, is it my slides are visible to everyone? Yes, sir, it is visible. Sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
I am Dr. Vijay Rajkumar Palni Rajan and today I am going to present oral peptide delivery to the lymphatic system using mycodesium nanoparticles. Okay, myself, um, I am head of the department, Pharmaceutical Technology, and I am working in UCSI University for the last uh, 20 years. Um, so we are having uh, experience in uh, nanotechnology for uh, several years. Uh, today, we are going to present uh, our completed, one of the completed project and uh, their outcomes. Um, uh, here, um, in this system, actually, we have developed the nano formulations uh, to deliver the drugs to um, a lymphatic system. Um, actually, here, usually, uh, we used to deliver the drugs uh, to the human body through oral administration or by using intravenous uh, uh, injections or other routes. Um, yeah, usually, if you give any oral drugs, if it is uh, smaller, molecule, it used to enter into the blood circulation and um, it reaches into the systemic circulation. Uh, so how we can avoid this uh, entry of the small molecules uh, uh, into the blood circulation quite difficult. If we uh, give macromolecules, uh, macromolecules usually uh, enter into the lymphatic system. Uh, it will enter into the lymphatic system by two transportation uh, mechanisms. One is transcellular uptake, other one is uh, paracellular uptake. Uh, transcellular uptake is uh, quite simple. The macromolecules will come and attach with the receptors present in the surface of uh, lymphatic uh, cell walls, um, lymphatic uh, vessel cells. And here, uh, once it attach uh, through endocytosis process, it will enter into the lymphatic system. And, and the para Cellular uptake is quite different. Uh, it loses the tight junctions between the cells uh, present in the lymphatic vessels. Through this uh, uh, small hole, it will enter. And one more mechanism is um, uh, it will attach with some macrophages cells and it goes into the lymphatic uh, vessels. Uh, the main uh, issue was delivering these uh, macromolecules in oral delivery. Uh, once we take any drug orally, it goes into our gastrointestinal tract. Uh, everybody aware that our gastrointestinal tract, first organ is uh, our um, stomach. In the stomach, uh, it secretes the acid as well as it secretes the pepsin enzymes. Uh, these enzymes and acid will degrade the macromolecules. And not only that, some macromolecules will escape and it reaches to the duodenum. In the duodenum, the pancreas will release the lipospotease, amylase, like that enzymes. Uh, it uh, split the drug into the small, small molecule, especially the polypeptides, and it converted as the amino acids. Uh, this amino acid will enter into the bloodstream. And um, so these are the difficulty to deliver especially the polypeptides uh, like drugs by orally. Um, uh, how these polypeptides are degraded uh, in our gastrointestinal tract by using the enzyme like uh, trypsin or like that uh, proteases like that enzymes. These enzymes will come and uh, attach with the uh, polypeptides and it weakens the bond uh, present between two amino acids. Uh, um, so the bonds will be broken in this mechanism and it will be uh, converted into small amino acids. So finally, the polypeptides uh, reaches into the blood circulation as a small molecules. So this is one of the uh, complications. And, and if the polypeptides uh, escape this uh, or it is protected from these uh, enzymes, if it enter into the lymphatic system, no issue, but if it enter into the blood circulation, it goes into the first pass uh, effect, usually it occurs in the liver. So whatever the uh, polypeptides, if you enter into the blood circulation, it goes into the 
first first effect if we give the polypeptides orally uh, for avoid that we have to deliver the polypeptides into the lymphatic uh, uh, vesicles it is present in the villis of the uh, small intestine large intestine uh, everywhere and it uh, bypass the first pass metabolism uh, there are several drug delivery systems uh, used to deliver the drug to lymphatic vesicles. Uh, one is buccal delivery system, other one is uh, oral delivery system, then nasal delivery systems, pulmonary delivery system, transdermal delivery system, as well as the microneedles, uh, then vaginal delivery system. These are uh, comfortably, comfortably used by the pharmaceutical industries to deliver the drugs in the lymphatic system. Um, if we look into the oral drug delivery system, uh, our gastrointestinal tract consists of several villis. And the villis will absorb the drug and it circulates into the blood as well as the lymphatic uh, circulation. I previously told how I can uh, improve the delivery of the drug into the lymphatic system. It's quite complex process and it's mainly depend upon the log p value of the drug uh, maybe log p value is uh, above uh, 5 it may reach us into the lymphatic uh, system if the log p value is below 5 it will reach into uh, blood circulation it is the common phenomena but it's uh, very difficult to get these uh, drugs in this uh, log p value uh, so we need to uh, modified the formulations uh, we have to protect the drug and we have to facilitate the delivery of the drug into this uh, lymphatic uh, delivery system and um, once it uh, we make that one successfully it will reach into the lymphatic vessels then uh, it goes into the uh, lymph nodes uh, once it goes into the lymph nodes from the lymph nodes um, it may distribute throughout the body so we can distribute the uh, drug uh, throughout the body. This is the uh, hypothetical uh, concepts uh, we came up. Um, uh, for this, uh, proving this concept, uh, we have selected the human keratonitic growth factor. Uh, this human keratonitic growth factor is uh, used for uh, uh, treating the mucosities. Uh, it have around 210 amino acids. Um, sometimes it will be truncated. Uh, truncated uh, human keratonitic growth factors having 163 amino acids, uh, having 18.9 uh, kilodalton. Different companies are using uh, different kinds of uh, human keratonitic uh, growth factor. The difference is it is uh, uh, truncated. That means it will be uh, cut into some unwanted uh, amino acids and the remaining amino acids are used as a um, active agent. Um, and this is one of the uh, amino acids uh, used polypeptide uh, used by the pharmaceutical company and this uh, uh, we used to tell caparazine and it is approved by the FDA and um, this one actually used to treat the mucositis in the patients uh, usually the cancer patients uh, before starting the chemotherapy we used to give this uh, drug uh, because if we not give this uh, human keratonitic growth factors uh, it produces the mucositis from whole oral cavity to all our gastrointestinal tracts are destroyed by these uh, uh, chemotherapeutic drugs. Uh, to avoid that one, we need to uh, enhance the proliferation rate of our uh, cells present in our oral cavity as well as in the gastrointestinal uh, tract. And also we can avoid uh, the mucositis. Uh, for that purpose, the capavacin is given. Uh, to the patients and um, uh, but the problem this one to be given always uh, during the chemotherapy through intravenous injections uh, or um, by other methodology so the amount of the drug available to the patients is uh, very less because uh, it degraded uh, uh, by first pass metabolism um, so keeping into the view we thought that uh, we can make it in the oral drug delivery system so for that, uh, we prepare the chitosan nanoparticles. Uh, then after formation of the chitosan nanoparticles, we lyophilized, then we filled into the uh, capsules. Uh, capsules are uh, coated with uh, one particular pH uh, degrading uh, polymer. And um, this uh, polymer uh, will release the drug on, on one particular pH, uh, pH uh, 600 above. 
uh, because uh, we want to target uh, into the uh, genome and their pH is uh, quite okay. At the same time, um, we can uh, improve the uh, release of the drug in that particular uh, pH. So how we made this uh, ketosan nanoparticles in our laboratory, it's quite simple. Uh, actually, this is uh, done in controlled environment. The temperature is maintained at four degree temperature. Uh, we dissolved the ketosan uh, in uh, acetic acid, 0 0.1 molar acetic acid. Uh, it's around the pH, we brought it here uh, four. Uh, thereafter, uh, we uh, added the TPP, tripolyphosphate uh, solution. This tripolyphosphate solution is uh, mixed with uh, peritonitic growth factor. Then it is added uh, drop wise. The pH will be uh, raised from four to six at the time the formation of the nanoparticles will occur. The formation of the nanoparticles uh, happens due to reginization process at the same time. Um, the TPP will interact with the chitosan and uh, it forms the uh, small particles. Uh, this formation of the small particles seeing in the neck the eye quite difficult. If we add more amount of the tripolyphosphate uh, beyond their limit, uh, cytotoxic as well as uh, it increases the particle size. To avoid this one, uh, actually we used the uh, UV spectrophotometer. Uh, here, um, each addition of uh, TPP solution uh, in the chitosan solution along with the keratonitic growth factor, uh, we measure the percentage uh, reflectance uh, the percentage uh, reflectance was uh, keep on dropping um, by using a second derivative curve. We uh, identified that completely the ketosan dissolved in uh, acetic acid uh, will converted in the form of small particles. Uh, once we confirmed at that point, we stopped the addition of the uh, TPP and the keratonitic growth factors. Uh, after that, uh, by using a, a zetometer, uh, we determine the zeta potential of the chitosan nanoparticle formed as well as it, the size. And the zeta potential is around the 30, uh, 20 to 30 it comes actually. Uh, at the same time, um, it is the positively charged um, and the size we can control it uh, around 100 to 200 uh, nanometer uh, it comes. Uh, Actually, we performed this experiment by using a polyethylene glycol as well as without polyethylene glycol uh, to uh, minimize the uh, size distributions. Uh, and also after formation of the nanoparticles, um, the cross-linking happened and the rigidization taken place or not. Uh, we, we identified by using uh, IR spectroscopy. Uh, at the same time, the presence of uh, KGF in the hydrogen nanoparticle, I also identified by using uh, IR spectroscopic techniques. And um, this um, KGF, uh, why it's present in the nanoparticle? Because uh, the KGF can uh, interact easily with the uh, ketosan. The interaction between the KGF and the interaction we confirmed by using a, a molecular uh, docking studies and uh, by using a patch dock server as well as um, uh, drug discovery studio. Uh, also, we like to know the uh, shape of the nanoparticles. The initial studies, uh, we are unable to find the shape of the nanoparticle because uh, if we use the scanning electron microscope, uh, it will uh, melt the uh, nanoparticles at a high temperature. To avoid that, we used the nitrogen environment uh, to uh, minimize the temperature changes during the studies. At the same time, we have used the platinum coating. Audience, please uh, mute your phone. Okay. Uh, we have used the scanning electron microscope. Uh, the nanoparticle uh, first we coated with the platinum. After that, uh, we changed the environment by using the nitrogen. Thereafter, we took the scanning electron microscopic studies. Then we found the nanoparticle is uh, more or less uh, spherical in size and it is at uh, 100 nanometer. At the same time, we identified the amount of the 
keratonitic growth factor are loaded in ketones and nanoparticles. And uh, um, for that, we performed the ELISA test to, to get one standard graph. Um, so these complete studies uh, we have um, published in one uh, article in uh, nearly 2018. And uh, this is the direction of formation of a uh, recombinant human keratonitic growth factor loaded with uh, kytos and nanoparticle based on its optical uh, properties. Though is, this article is completely discussed about uh, how we made the uh, keratonitic gold nanoparticle formed and how uh, we determined the formation and we determined the shape of the uh, nanoparticle. Uh, further, the, the main concept of the preparation of this uh, nanoparticle, we want to improve the cell proliferation uh, rate. Uh, so we have uh, selected the human um, <clears throat> gastrointestinal cell. That one is uh, FHS 74. Um, uh, actually, we performed the uh, cell growth studies with presence of uh, kytosin nanoparticle, the presence of uh, uh, KGF alone, uh, thereafter, uh, we loaded the uh, KGF with uh, kytosin and nanoparticles. Uh, thereafter, we have compared the growth studies. Uh, after 25 uh, hours deviation, we have seen the significant uh, difference uh, between the uh, growth of our uh, intestinal cells. Uh, uh, here, we ca can see that uh, even the a kytosin nanoparticle alone, uh, it's not cytotoxic to the uh, human intestinal cells. At the same time, uh, it slightly improves. Uh, but when we are compared with the keratonitic growth factor, the uh, growth rate factor uh, also improves the uh, intestinal cells uh, proliferation rate. If we load this uh, growth factor with the kytosin nanoparticles, uh, it's given the better uh, proliferation rate and so how it is happening we want to determine by using the fluorescent uh, microscopic studies. Uh, first we have um, stained these uh, intestinal cells uh, by using a uh, DOPI. Uh, DOPI is a nuclear staining agent thereafter uh, we loaded the uh, dyes, uh, dopamine dyes uh, in the nanoparticles and then uh, we incorporated with these uh, cells. At the time, we noticed that these nanoparticles are capable to attach in the surface of the uh, cells. At the same time, after 74 hours, uh, it moved towards the um, nucleic uh, acid present in the cells. Uh, so uh, all these things uh, we visualized with uh, different time intervals. Uh, for example, zero hour, three hour, and 72 hours, the, how the uh, nanoparticles are moving inside the cells that will be determined by using a fluorescent microscopic studies. So this is uh, happens uh, why we want to identify uh, because uh, we know that uh, there is the receptor called the FGFR uh, receptor. It is mainly present in the intestinal cells. And so this receptor uh, we selected to find the interaction between the nanoparticles and the, with the KGF. Uh, so by again, uh, we use the patch doc server uh, to find the interaction between this uh, receptor and uh, KGF alone. Uh, so the KGF itself having a very good uh, interaction with uh, this receptor site. Um, and also uh, we already uh, proven that the KGF not only, not only interact with the receptor site and also it will uh, interact with the ketosone also. And also the ketosin will interact with this uh, FGF receptor. So this also we identified. Um, further, uh, we made the complex of uh, uh, KGF with uh, ketosin nanoparticles. Then further we interacted with the uh, receptor sites. Uh, this uh, KGF uh, interacted with the ketosin. Further, it uh, interacted with the receptor and uh, it have a very good uh, binding affinity with the receptor site. It is very strong. Uh, uh, after confirming all these things, um, the prepared nanoparticle, we decided in, to fill into the capsules. Uh, for that, we purchased the 
uh, capsules uh, obtained from USA, that is uh, Tropac. These capsules are very small in size. Uh, the capsule size is M. This is the specification for the capsule. This is mainly used for the animal studies. And so uh, this is the diameter of the capsule. The prepared nanoparticle we have filled uh, inside this capsule, but these capsules are made by the uh, gelatin or uh, by the, the cellulose. It will release the drug at uh, low pH itself. This is one of the complications in this uh, commercially available uh, capsule. Uh, so in this capsule, we have filled the our chitosan nanoparticle. The amount of the chitosan nanoparticle is uh, very less because it, we need only uh, five micrograms of the uh, chitosan nanoparticles uh, loaded with uh, this amount of the drug to be filled. So to make up the volume, we used the uh, other excipient and also we have used the loop pectin, uh, one milligram. This will uh, used to inhibit the proteases uh, to prevent the degradation of the released uh, KGF. At the same time, we used the lactose to make up the volume. Uh, so these capsules, I previously told that it may degrade in the acidic pH. To prevent that, uh, uh, we approached the pharmaceutical company. From there, we uh, discussed with them. We decided to uh, use the uh, different uh, polymers. Uh, here we have selected the polymer uh, Eutragic. Uh, Eutragic 100 is uh, coated with the, our uh, capsule because this uh, Eutragic 100, it released the uh, drug uh, only in the jejunium pH. That means we can protect these capsules uh, up to pH 6. In the pH 6, uh, it uh, dissolves the capsule and it releases the nanoparticles. Um, uh, so how we made the coating? So it is a very simple. Once the capsules are uh, filled with the nanoparticle with, and along with the other excipients, uh, we dissolve this uh, uh, eutragic polymer with uh, acetone, profanol, and water system. And so uh, this is the name of the polymer, Colicot uh, MAP100P. Uh, it released the uh, nanoparticles only in the pH uh, 6. Um, so also, this polymer needs some other equipment, uh, other excipients also to, uh, to make a very good uh, coating. So we use the dark titanium uh, oxide and tertiary uh, ethyl acetate uh, all mixed together and we coated this uh, capsule. Uh, this is the uniformly coated uh, capsule. Uh, this capsule uh, we given to the animals uh, to check it. Uh, this is the uh, capsule. Uh, ingredients uh, present inside the capsules. Uh, uh, actually, for animal studies, uh, we have selected the rabbits as well as for uh, uh, rats uh, for two purposes. Later, I will tell why we selected rabbit as well as rats for uh, checking the release rate of the studies. Um, before going for the animal studies, we performed the in vitro testing to ensure that the capsules will be broken into the higher pH, not in the acidic pH. So we used the common dissolution uh, apparatus. So we started the dissolution studies with uh, hydrochloric uh, acid, 0.1 molar, pH 1.2. Thereafter, uh, we are keep on changing the pH of the uh, solution. And after that, we are checking the amount of uh, KGF uh, released from the dissolution uh, apparatus by using a ELISA kit. Um, so we found that if we not coat the capsules uh, with um, uh, eutragic, uh, it will release completely in pH uh, 1.2 and also uh, the some amount of the drug will be uh, degraded. Uh, but if we uh, coat the drug uh, with uh, uh, eutragic uh, and it release the drug uh, after one hour, if we start changing the pH of the solution in the dissolution media. And so the amount of the drug was uh, keep on increased uh, up to six hours. So the coating uh, is uh, protect the drug in the pH uh, 1.2. Thereafter, it start release the drug in the pH 5.5 and 7.4. So in that manner, we protected the chitose and nanoparticles in the pH uh, 1.2. Then we started releasing the drug at the pH uh, 5.5 and 7.4. 
And uh, this further we confirmed by uh, using uh, animal studies uh, for using a uh, rat. So we got the animal ethical committee approval. Uh, but uh, uh, how to confirm this one is quite complicated. So what we done uh, during the preparation of the uh, capsules, we incorporated one more uh, dye that is uh, called a brilliant blue. Uh, so once the capsule was uh, broken in the jejunium, uh, we can see the uh, release of the drug in the jejunium and it changes the color of the uh, small intestine. So we can easily visualize this one uh, in the presence of the dye. So it double confirmed that uh, the drug was, uh, or the nanoparticles are re released in this area. Mm. Thereafter, we conducted the um, release studies of the drug in the animal. We have used the rabbit uh, as an animal. Uh, we given the AGF uh, in a intravenous injection and we withdrawn the uh, bread at different time intervals and we identified the amount of the uh, drug present in the uh, rabbit blood. At the same time, we given the uh, drug in the oral route in the form of the capsules. We able to uh, get good amount of the uh, drug distributed in the rabbit body. Okay, so this complete work again uh, we have uh, published uh, in the research article. That one is the rabbit as the animal model for pharmacokinetics in entry coated capsule containing uh, recombinant human keratonitic growth factor uh, loaded with the chitosan nanoparticles. So this is our uh, complete uh, research grant. Actually, it is funded by a fundamental uh, research grant screen by uh, Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much about uh, patiently listening about my presentation. Uh, I welcome and the question session. If you have any questions, please free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, the audience can feel free to ask any questions now. Is it any questions? You can ask freely, no issue. Even your fundamental things. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to the next speaker. I once again thank Bajirat, sir, for taking your time and being with us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ramesh, for giving the opportunity to um, present our research work to the audience. Thank you very much. Okay. So our next speaker is Dr. Mohammed Sharif the Regional Senior Medical Advisor for Janssen EMEA, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Okay. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me for this event. Please let me know when you can see my slides. We can see your slides, sir. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me for the for this event. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk about in the upcoming few minutes about the interpretation and impact of free world evidence uh, clinical data. Uh, just in the beginning, this is my disclaimer: the opinions expressed and data in this presentation are solely my own and don't express the views or opinions of Johnson Johnson and Johnson, as you could see. This is the uh, agenda for our um, different topics that we are going to cover today about the definition of real world data and uh, what is the difference between real world data. Ah, and... <laughs> 
Excuse me if you can, audience, if you can mute yourself, please. Uh, the second part related to the real world evidence, relevance and value, evidence generation methodologies and the practical consideration when executing any evidence generation. So in the beginning, what is the difference between the real world data and real world evidence? Real world data is the data used for decision making that are not collected in the conventional randomized controlled trials, while the evidence, real world evidence is the evidence derived from real world data through the application of research, specific re research methodology. As you know, the real world data is uh, available in the different resources. It might be available in the prescription and by survey panel data, physicians, opinions, research experience. Also, you can find it in the electronic medical records, discharge case and notes, registries in some centers in some countries, uh, patient reported outcome, imaging, genomics, devices, lab on biomarkers, you can find in the insurance claims, in addition also you can collect it through the social media. Uh, so there is a lot of resources that you already can collect the real world data for, for the patient in the healthcare system. And the evidence of real world data can help companies across brands and functions. There is a different function really can get the benefits of the real world data and real world evidence. Like for example, the real the research and development, the RWE and can reduce uncertainty with the studies that reflect the actual healthcare practice and also can improve the clinical study design and execution for greater predictability and efficiency of the study and minimize the number of the patient needed to uh, be enrolled in such studies. For the medical affairs and safety and pharmacovigilance team to enhance the study design, planning, and the ongoing monitoring of patient safety, effectiveness, and the protocol adherence in the real uh, world research studies. Health economic uh, outcome related or the market access team, they really can access to the RWD and tools you need to support more robust health economic outcome related. Also, it will support to generate evidence to conf confidently use to different stakeholders to support your value proposition and the value story while communicating about the, the, the drug or the medications that you are talking about. Commercial and brand team also, they, it's very important to get insights about how the patients are diagnosed, monitored, and treated through uh, treatment journey also to develop better brand plans and increase the performance. And finally, the, it, you can create RWD platform to fit your enterprise needs and leverage technologies. And we'll see some examples today how really technology can support you in, in that. And it has shown that the RWE can increase the product performance life th through life cycle, the product life cycle, because really you can conduct in a different phases. You can have some real world evidence in the pre-discovery phase one, phase two with the objective to define the ideal patient population. What is the unmet medical need? What is the burden of the disease? What is the current standard of care to achieve a re and also the, to achieve a reimbursement to product profile? It could support you to extend the life cycle in the regulatory and approval HTA assessment by having the assess the burden of the disease and estimate cost, and also to compare the effectiveness and the budget impact accurately versus the standard of care, uh, in addition to meet post marketing requirement like past studies. Competitive positioning, it's uh, incremental evidence on the clinical trials support you in a differentiation and also to assess the adherence to the drug. New indication by having a new target population, and finally, at the late, later stage of the product life cycle, like the loss of latency, it can you can differentiate yourself again as a generic or biosimilar, and also to have like an effective switching technique to prove the difference in the efficacy and safety profile between the generic and between the current treatment. So, but Again, data from randomized clinical trials remain critical for, for and found the critical foundation for almost all initial coverage and payment decision. 
But as we all know, the randomized clinical trials are not well suited to answer all research questions. Like, for example, for example, the target population, the sample, usually the sample typically represents a highly selective population in a controlled care setting with a short-term follow-up period. So RCT are not feasible or ethical for some patient to groups, for example. Low sample size prevent, prevents the subgroup analysis later on. So is this all really important? So as we, we all know, it's complementing the RCT. And this is an example from the published in the New York Times asking question, do clinical trials work, the RCTs? Because they found that roughly 53% of the new cancer diagnosis, for example, are in a people 65 or older. But this age group accounts for just 33% of participants in the cancer clinical cancer drug trial. So RWE, it's really important, complementing the randomized clinical trials, and it's increasing the value over time because the value for RWE and relevance increasing by different factors. This is including, but not limited to, the growing payers and provider demands, the evolving regulatory envir environment, as you could see uh, with austerity measures everywhere, with the budget, control in all countries, the rapid innovation in technology, you can have a, a faster data, you can analyze more than, faster than before, a lot of tons of data, and as and we'll see an example for that. Increasing the pricing pressures everywhere, patient as a decision making, the patient, also they have a say now, so RWE that could support in this, improve this one. And rewarded evidence audience and their different decision making needs. We'll see as we see here, there is a different question for each uh, stakeholder. For example, the, for regulators, they need to understand the current and the future product indication and any risk mitigation measures. So they always have a question, is the product effective and safe? For the payers, they always focusing on the value based decision making. What is the product value in terms of cost effectiveness? The healthcare professional, they always focusing about the clinical decision making process. What is the product clinical value and how can it be used optimally for the patient? And finally, for the patient, it's the individual decision making and shared decision making is really important. And the patient is always asking what are the product advantage versus other therapies available in the market or versus other competitors in this case. Here we will go and take a deep dive about evidence generation methodology and the practical consideration. We have a different types of these and I know that you might be aware of all of most of them, like including, but not limited to the systemic literature reviews, KOL outreach of the shelf data assets, observational studies and evidence platforms. Let's start with the first methodology. This is including the systemic literature review. As you all know, the systemic review is a review in which there is a comprehensive search for relevant studies on a specific topic. And those identify are then appraised and decided according to predetermined and explicit methodology matching with the key, key research questions based on the key business questions that you have. Why do we really need systemic literature review? To facilitate the rationale for the decision making, the healthcare provider, researchers, and the policy maker are really unundated with unmanageable amount of information. You could imagine that we have over 20 million citation in PubMed, over 32 million citation in MBs, approximately 75 to 100 RCTs published daily. Unusually, so usually it's impossible to consider all relevant individual primary uh, research studies in the decision-making context. So the systemic literature review enable stakeholders to keep up to date with the evidence accumulating in a field and to practice evidence-based medicine. Especially if we thought about the payers and the regulators that assessing medication across thera different therapy area, across different indication. So it's not really easy to have the full information about all therapy areas, uh, which is really totally different from each other 
to be able to take the right decision making. The second methodology regarding the KOL outreach, the, it's informal outreach to external stakeholders can often can, of, can often form a good foundation for other evidence activities. This is including like KOLs, clients, payers, and pharma pharmacists. But there's a key points you have to remember before doing that. Ensure you have developed a structured conversation document before reaching out to the key venue leaders to maximize the value of the conversation. Reach out to other internal stakeholders before approaching QLs, medical, like have you, your different stakeholders in the, in the pharma company, for example, including the medical access team, commercial, etc. Face-to-face interview, email communication, or advisory board could be potential ways to get experts' inputs and cover gaps in literature review. And here, this is a very common example about the Delphi panel or Delphi methodology can be used to calibrate insights from multiple KOLs as an example. So here, there is the three steps or the three phases that you have to go through while you are planning to have a Delphi uh, consensus. This is for, initially in the beginning, you have to prepare the evidence this including what is the key activity in this part. To select and contract five to 10 experts to participate on panel, conduct a search to identify the evidence-based statement for treatment algorithm developed, the, to extract data from statement development and rating of the evidence level, develop protocol for execution and analysis of uh, Delphi panel. The deliverables expected here, as you could see, the panel selection of the expert extracted statement for testing and Delphi protocol. The second phase, it's mainly to run the Delphi panel. And the activities in this part, the three round modified Delphi panel. The first round to circulate draft documents with the list of statement to all panel members. Uh, round two, as you could see, the list of statements that didn't meet consensus from the round one is, to, is sent to all members. Round three, face-to-face -face working session, and the expected deliverables, as you could see here, like three rounds of Delphi panel, data analysis, Delphi panel consensus on treatment algorithm, for example, if you're checking, for example, about tumor X patients. Um, then move to the last uh, phase with the Delphi, including the document, re the, your results. Write for, uh, for report on Delphi treatment algorithm, for example, for treatment ex for tumor X patients. Write scientific journal article uh, on Delphi treatment algorithm and submission of the article. So the expected deliverables after having this KOL outreach to have a full report on Delphi treatment algorithm, for example, for tumor X patient published and available now to gather yeah, all available information to date in this KOL, for, for KOL outreach. The next methodology or next uh, thing, it's uh, primary and secondary data collection, the off-shelf data assets. What is the definition as your primary data? Data captured for a specific research purpose. While the secondary data, data captured as part of routine healthcare administration, data captured as a primary data for a previous study, which is subsequently reanalyzed for a new research question with permission for sure. And here, this is a retrospective studies often rely on a secondary use of the patient level data which is becoming increasingly available in all markets. As we mentioned in the beginning, there is a different sources on, of the shelf that you can find the data from electronic medical records for the health records, uh, so claim data, hospital data. So you have a lot from lab biomarkers. Again, there is a great opportunity kind of available, available now to generate more and more data for better understanding the clinical routines, the standard of care, and uh, the current uh, clinical practice in, in different markets. And the observational study, the prospective and retrospective observational studies are conducted under the protocol, as you all know. And we should have SAP, the statistical analysis plan, 
to expect what is like, or to 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 plan for the expected result coming from the study. And here, just a briefing about the retrospective, prospective versus primary and secondary data collection. As you could see here, it depends. When is the data structure decided? When setting up the study, so it will be a prospective study. Before setting up the study, it will be a retrospective study. And regarding here, the where is the data captured? Is a new data set for, for specific study research? So it's a primary data collection. It's uh, in a pre-existing uh, database already available. It's a secondary data. And sometimes you can have a hybrid, like mix between the secondary and the primary data, uh, especially in the retrospective prospective study design. So if you have a primary data in a prospective setting, it's true you have a pragmatic clinical trial perspective or a prospective registry study. If you have a primary data in a retrospective, this is mainly you will design a chart review. It's not applicable to have a secondary data for the, the prospective uh, data setting. But if you have a secondary data retrospective, this is a retrospective database analysis. And for sure, the hybrid can work in both uh, either prospective or retrospective because it's a mix in between. And as you all, you all know, technology is playing a critical role right now. So this is an example for using technology in real world evidence. There is a different methodology, different techniques, but here we will focus about a specific one. But at the beginning, as you know, the unlocking patient information, this is the challenge of the unstructured data. As you all know, more than 80% of healthcare data is logged in unstructured text, including the medical history and the clinical notes and captured in a free text field, mainly due to the manual review and the coding process required to make the information compatible with the healthcare IT system. A lot of unstructured data that available that could re really add a lot of value for the decision making, uh, more than 80% as, as you could see. And here, the technology, the, sorry, technology as a game changer by extracting all exist, existing patient, patient information from this unstructured database, database, using a natural language processing. This technique by one of the type of the artificial intelligence called NLP, the natural language processing. By that, you will have easily structured data regarding safety information, link them, link them to each other, display a patient pathway, genetic profile, and patient outcomes. So let's dig deep more about the, what is the clinical NLP or natural language processing. Yeah, natural language processing is the form of the machine learning which enables the processing and analysis of the free text when used uh, with the medical notes. It can aid in the prediction of the patient outcome, augment the hospital trial system, and generate diagnostic model that detect early stage of the chronic disease. So as you could see, it's coming in the heart of the artificial intelligence, using human language and computer science. It's very important that NLB mainly focusing on the free text available in the different uh, electronic medical records or, the, or in the system to be analyzed. How the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and NLP work together. Simply the AI is a full umbrella that in AI, the main objective teaches the system to do intelligent things. While the machine learning teach your system to do intelligent things that can learn from the experience. Natural language processing teaches the system to be intelligent, learn from the experience, and understand the human language. The natural language processing, the research field deals with the interaction between, the, between human language and the computers aiming to communicate machine and the humans by using natural language. It's a combination from natural language understanding, as you could see, deals with the methodology, which you try to understand how to give relevant meaning to the natural language with, with it feeding in the computer, to the computer. 
while the natural language generation, as you could see, deals with the translation of the artificial language of the computers to generate a meaningful text for humans in natural language. How can NLB support the healthcare system, industry in a different way and a lot of publication and it, it played a critical role indeed during the COVID time. Many publication published about the NLB natural language processing because it was really fast playing in less in just a few weeks, you can have data based on the system. So it can improve the clinical documentation, accelerate clinical test matching and support the clinical decision making. Finally, the communication and engagement strategy, because sometimes you might have the greatest study, but you are the most enthusiastic person. Don't assume that all other people or other stakeholders they are really enthusiastic about your study as you are. As you could see, so we will see a different communication strategy to improve your visibility, to improve your engagement for your clinical research or our real world evidence, as we could see. The communication strategies for, from the start of the real world studies, it's really important. During the study design phase, medical communication experts can help to prepare the ground for future acceptance of the evidence generated by, by different ways. Number one, for example, Ensuring the study concept is aligned with the current trends in the, in the therapeutic space. For example, carrying out literature review or managing focus group. Uh, second important thing is that clarifying the study values to stakeholders, for example, conducting SWOT analysis to help build the key value message. Finally, explaining the methods used, uh, including the strengths and limitation and how these can address the research question like the volume study design manuscript, for example, in this one. Studies, the, the, there is a different strategies to engage study stakeholders, and we have two types of stakeholders, as we could see here. Internal engagement strategy and the external engagement strategy. So it's important to communicate. For the internal engagement strategies, the internal stakeholders, this is including the study team, the medical affairs, other company function, functions, including the commercial, the legal, compliance, pharmacovigilance, health economics, corporate communication, also senior management. They have to be informed from time to another about the stage, about the expected outcome, and about the final result. So medical communication experts can support the development of engagement strategies and uh, in uh, in improving the collaboration among the internal uh, teams and functions by helping to understand the role and the involvement of each stakeholders on the study, providing example of engagement tactics that can be used for each stakeholders based on the interest in the study, and also providing the communication tools and templates that best apply to different internal stakeholder requirements. On the other side, the external st stakeholders, like advisory steering committee should comprise a variety of stakeholders in the disease area to cover all decision-making needs, like the patient group should be involved with as, and should be targeted as an external uh, professional association, key opinion leader and healthcare professional regulatory experts. The professional medical communication can really support con continuing the steering committee engagement to optimize the decision and the execution of RWE by defining the cadence and timing of the meeting, determining the tactical agenda and providing the details report, the communication of advisory group in the collaboration with the medical communication expert can really advise on the early and timely planning of the key congresses and, stra and the strategic events to ensure the submission deadlines are met. Various aspect engagement and dissemination can be considered like the promotional asset publication and peer-to-peer -peer review. So it's very important to have like a planning from the beginning about the final analysis, final publication. If you are planning to have some interim analysis, you have to be ready with interim analysis, preparing the statistical analysis plan for each interim analysis from the beginning to, to have all that to improve your feasibility and the expected outcome from your uh, study. And here, this is my last slide, just 
summarizing the main questions that you have when before starting any study. Before starting any for evidence generation projects. And if you have like key business question, key research question, you have to ask different questions. What are the evidence needs and the periods? Which value do I need to show? Is it mainly insights, regulatory? Is it related to cost, the thought leaders? What are my research questions? Which specific question will we address? It's a comparative or descriptive. Treatment pattern or outcome or patient reported again. Product agnostic or, or on brand. Epidemiology consideration. And different uh, objective for sure you might have as a research question. What data source should I use? What are the data sources that serve my research question? Is the primary data? Is it secondary data? Shard, uh, like shard database or existing registry? Or a survey could be enough? To, to, to get the insights that I need. And finally, what is the right approach from budget perspective, from time, quality, standard, and uh, feasibility? Thank you so much, and uh, happy to have any uh, question from yourself. Thank you, sir. I'd like to express our gratitude for your wonderful presentation. Uh, the forum is now open for questions. Thank you so much. Okay, I think if not, we can feel free to reach out to me at any time if you still have any question or have anything. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for spending a valuable time with us. Thank you. So our next keynote speaker is Dr. Kampon Srivatanakul, President and CEO, Vitatem Co, Thailand. Can you please share my presentation, please? Hello. Just a minute. Yes, sir, you can share now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Download, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. So I am loading my presentation. Uh, good morning, sir. Okay. Today, I would like to share my pharmaceutical development uh, for nutrition supplement and also uh, in the future, I would like to promote more on herbal medicine. Uh, for today, I like to explain what we intend to do with Thailand. I think many of you have heard about nicotinamide mononucleotide. The abbreviation is called NMN. This molecule has been receive a lot of attention that it could uh, reverse aging. But today, I would like to share with you the concept of using this nutrition supplement for the treatment of chronic kidney disease. Nicotinamide adenosine dinucleotide, or NAD+, has been shown to be a coenzyme and key regulator of metabolism, stress adaptation, cellular homeostasis, and also being involved with aging. It has been shown that the level of NAD plus usually decreases as when we are getting older. As for the slide shown on the upper right hand column, at the age of newborn, down to 14, 80 years, NAD plus has been shown to decrease as we're getting older. So, it has been understood that aging 
can be contributed by decrease in And also the development of aging as a disease. Now, we start to learn that the NAD level start to decline during aging. And therefore, a lot of things has been upset that, including certain regulation gene. Uh, for those of you who may have not been involved with anti-aging treatment, sirtuin has been shown to be very important of longevity gene. If we could activate our certain gene, we can actually live longer with a healthy profile. So therefore, right now, we have done a lot of study concerning NAD plus to regulate certain gene and can make people to be a bit younger. Now, with certain gene and NAD, it can also prevent DNA damage. Uh, the DNA damage can be measured by what we call DNA methylation. And we will be using DNA methylation as the biomarkers of aging, including chronic disease such as chronic kidney diseases. Now, NMN and NR are the precursor of NAD plus. And therefore, we can now be able to give supplementation of NMN and ND plus in order to increase NAD level and can prevent further DNA damage. With the bigger molecules like MMN, in terms of pharmacokinetic study, uh, we like to prove that NMN can pass to cell into stimulate mitochondria. And the mitochondria function will be regulating ATP properly. And therefore, we have done a lot of study to understand that NMN <laughs> enters the cell to the special core transporter. And this special core transporter called SLC12A8 will be responsible to carry NMN into the cell and into mitochondria. So therefore, we are now have done bio IVT study to confirm that by consuming by mouth, NMN can reach to the cell, to the mitochondria. And after that, it can activate increase in NAD+. Uh, we have done the study to confirm that NMN sub, uh, supplementation can boost up NAD plus level. And we have co confirmed the study that done in 12 weeks duration with the mean age of the subject of 20, more than 25 years. And NMN, after consuming for uh, 12 weeks, NAD and related metabolic levels start to increase a lot. In the my study model, NMN synthesis can enhance in mice injected with nicotinamide phosphorylbosyl transferase, resulting in longer lifespan. So, with increase in NMN and resulting in longevity in mice, we are now trying to use it to use this simple molecule for treating aging disease. The study that we have done uh, further is to try to prove that NMN will be very useful for longevity and also treating of aging disease. In terms of pharmaceutical concept, 
the reason that I started to move forward with chronic kidney disease is because chronic kidney disease has become a big burden for the society. In many countries, including Thailand, we are seeing a lot of uh, kidney dialysis unit. It would be nice if we can use this simple molecule to pass to the critical study and later on we can promote that instead of helping people uh, with aging, we can also help with chronic kidney disease. In the main trial has been done by many investigators. Uh, Yi et al. in 2023 did annual trial among 80 middle-aged volunteers. Daily consumption of NUN for 60 days, and they divided into placebo, NUN 300 milligram, NUN 600 milligram, and NUN 900 milligram. These parameters are tested combined with treated and placebo group. Blood NA plus level significantly increased at day 30 and day 60. And when has to be safe, no side effect was found in all 80 cases. The 60 uh, minute walking test, it has shown that walking distance significantly increased. And this showed the best among when treated at the dose of 600 milligram and 900 milligram. Blood biological age among possible group significantly increased and no changing among MNHC group as best try and 60 days. So this is uh, the trial that confirmed the health benefit of NMN. Now, we are moving forward with treating early diabetic nephropathy with NMN. The Biological thesis uh, behind our treatment <clears throat> concept is that sirtuin is an NAD plus dependent deacetylase whose expression decreases with age. And in several diseases, including diabetes and kidney failure, sirtuin in actuation in prototype upregulate chronin 1 and reduce synaptopodin level. <coughs> leading to food process investment and albinuria. So that also can help to prevent protein urea as well. These unfavorable changes can be ameliorated by environment treatment, uh, suggesting that certain reactivation will stop the problem mm -hmm. of damage caused by kidney failure. Okay. We also compare the combination between the comparison between NMN and NR. Both of these molecules are precursor of NDPAS. Both of them seem to be quite effective in treating chronic kidney diseases. And we have found that NMN is slightly more superior than NR. And this study confirmed that we continue to use NMN as the way that we would like to conduct the clinical study to compare the effect of NMN in treating chronic diseases. I would like to uh, invite everyone who might be interested and in studying the effect of NMN. We are planning to conduct the randomized control study uh, using NMN up to the dose of 1,000 1, milligrams per day uh, for treating chronic kidney disease. And we also measure primary endpoint, especially for uh, protein urea reversal and maintain a GFR function. And with this, we will start to develop the clinical trial in Thailand just uh, about a few months ago. And hopefully, 
if anyone who become interested with study of this simple molecule, please contact us and we can help you to develop Mantai synthesis study further. Well, before I will end my presentation, I would like to, to explain my concept that in Asia, we have to try to do research and development on healthcare product based on nutrition as well as herbal medicine much more than the Western because we have been using nutrition for the treatment of many diseases and herbal treatment have been widely used in many countries in Asia to treat the disease. It's about the time that we have to make the use of nutrition supplement and herbal medicine to be completed with a pharmaceutical drug development. And this will require a lot of network and support. The more and more if we could conduct the trial, share the data, and also have the meetings such as today, it will lead to the better success. For me, innovation is important, but connection is also much more important. It will be good concept that we can start to develop healthcare product, herbal treatment to our platform of the meeting today. I would like to thank for your kind attention. And if you would like to collaborate with Thailand and our medical group, please feel free to contact me at this email. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If you have any question, please ask. Thank you, sir, for sharing your expertise and experiences with us. Um, the forum is once again open for questions. Okay, if no further question, no, thank you very much indeed, and please feel free to contact at my email at any time. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank, thank you for joining you. us today. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. So our next speaker is Dr. Malikarajuna Rao Arjun Pichika, Head of Center for Excellence for Bioactive Molecules and Drug Delivery, Associate Dean and Professor, International Medical University, Malaysia. Okay. Uh, am I allowed to share my screen? Yes, sir. You can share your screen. Okay, can I confirm that you all can see my slides? Yes, sir, we can see your slides. Okay, uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, thanks for giving an opportunity for me uh, to share my thoughts on uh, some of the recent advances in cancer therapy. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, the recent progress that was happened on antibody uh, drug conjugates. Okay. And the reason why I have chosen this antibody drug conjugates is uh, nowadays uh, more and more uh, drugs are being discovered and more than 100 of these ADCs are in clinical trial. Uh, at this point of time, these are mainly used uh, for the treatment of uh, cancer. And uh, the people believe that uh, these ADCs do have better safety profile compared to uh, existing chemotherapy drugs. Yeah, am I audible to everyone? Am I clear? Yes, sir, you're audible. Yes. Okay. 
first if you look at the history of uh, the development of the adcs okay yeah uh, the first idea came in 1910 so at that point they thought that yeah it is possible to kill the cancer cells uh, without affecting uh, what is it, without affecting the uh, normal cells but at that point they do not know anything about it actually how it has to be done and uh, uh, what are the things that we but this is what they have proposed and we propose this as a magic bullet over the years uh, you can see that okay uh, for the first drug to be approved by us fda uh, in 2000 so it is about 90 years uh, at this point of time the concept is the cancer cell is seeing something different from the normal cells can target that different one but at that point they do not know that it is a g okay so at this point of time uh, we all know that um there are few genes which are specifically expressed in few cancers or uh in few cancers uh certain levels of genes are upregulated so if we can specifically target those genes which are present only in cancer cells okay then definitely we can treat the cancer without affecting the normal cells okay uh of course uh, from 2000 in 2000 there is a first drug and now there are 16 uh, adcs are approved by usfda and apart from these 16 there are about uh, 100 uh, adcs which are in clinical trials and most of the pharma companies are really uh, looking into okay if any medicinal chemist would like to um, pursue their research career uh, in discovering uh, new medicines for cancer this is one of the uh, potential uh, area that we should embark upon okay. now if you see the difference between a chemotherapy and adc adc means antibody drug conjugates okay in chemotherapy and we know that the therapeutic window is very narrow okay stands for minimum effective dose and mkd stands for maximum tolerable dose so it's very narrow so what does it mean that means by any chance if the patient takes a medicine little bit uh, at a higher dose it can put that patient at risk that is the uh, problem with this chemotherapy and also there are a lot of side effects with the chemotherapy whereas in the case of adcs you can see that the therapeutic window is broadened therapeutic window is broadened the reason for that is we know that the antibody is very large molecule okay since it is a very large molecule it cannot enter into the cells that do not contain a particular antigen which will identify this particular antibody in that way you can see these adcs offer uh offer selective toxicity towards the cancer cells okay. if you look at the uh, structures of the adcs and the main components of the antibody drug conjugates okay this is what we are talking about antigen which is specifically present in a few cancers or it could be over expressed in cancers okay different from normal cells and we know that this is a basic biology so antibody will recognize a particular antigen okay and uh, so in that way this antibody will be attracted towards this antigen this antigen can be a gene or can be a protein then to this antibody they attach a cytotoxic drug okay a cytotoxic drug through a linker so 
and this cytotoxic drug is called waterhead uh, warhead for destroying cancer cells or it is also considered it is also called as a payload so here the concept is this one um, because of this antibody it will specifically identify the antigen which is present in the cancer cell then this antibody can enter into those cells when it enter into those cells along with this antibody it will also carry this cytotoxic drug then um, once it enters into the cancer cell this cytotoxic drug is released and kill the cancer cells that is the simple concept of this adcs now what are the uh, characteristics that we should look for before we embark on discovering adcs okay first thing is whatever the antigen that you are looking for it could be a protein or it could be a gene okay it should be abundantly present in tumors and they should be present only in uh, small quantities in normal cells and it is internalization that means it is within that means whatever the antibody that we will take okay uh, it should be uh, taken by the cells okay the second one is this is the antibody okay and it should be attached to the payload payload means it's a cytotoxic drug through a linker okay there are different types of linkers are there uh, some are called cleavable and some are called non cleavable okay and uh, they are also used some amino acids like a cysteine or lysine okay as a linkers and cleavable linkers means acid labile that means uh, the linker can break of an acid so that this cytotoxic drug will be released okay protease cleavable means cancer cells contain an enzyme called protease that protease breaks this linker so that the drug will be released within the cancer cells okay or a uh, disulfide linkages okay and they can be broken easily inside the cancer cells okay here the most important point is the drug should not be released until it enters into the cancer cells that is the key point okay that entirely depends upon the nature of the link and nowadays the people are talking about non cleavable okay uh, that means uh, even though once even though it enters into the cancer cells it do not cleave at all uh, without cleaving also it can kill the cancer cells that's what the people are uh, looking at now then you may wonder why is it so the reason is even though we are target the adcs to release the drug only within the cancer cells but there are numerous studies that have indicated that the uh, anti cancer drug is released uh, from this anti adc in the systemic circulation thus causing still some kind of a side effects okay. and there is a potential to change the number of payloads per antibody that means how many drug molecules we can load on a single antibody is called dar okay that is a drug load per uh, then the third point is what are the uh, drugs that we can attach to this antibody these are the various things uh, microtubule inhibitors dna damaging agents dna cross linking agents and also rna inhibitors here the interesting point is we may wonder that oh the existing chemotherapeutic drugs can be attached to the antibody or not the answer is yes but however their potency is very very low okay so uh, the take home message here is whatever the adcs that are approved by the us fda they do not contain uh, already approved uh, chemotherapeutic drugs why is it so that i'm going to explain later okay then uh, what are the things that we should look into first one is a circulation that means whatever the adc that we synthesize it can reach to the target cancer cells okay 
so but for that the precaution should be taken the drug should not should not be released into the blood stream okay it should release only into the so the cancer cells that's where we need to uh, the second one is whatever the antibody that we choose it should specifically identify the antigen okay that is present in the cancer cells okay that is very important so to retain the specificity and also the affinity the another one is internalization that means once it is attached to a cancer cell the cancer cell should be in a position to obtain okay uh, that adc then only it can grow within the cancer cells and sometimes what happens means once it enters into the cancer uh, cancer cell some of the adcs okay will be recycled back okay and how is it so Uh, that I will explain later. But here the key thing is the recycling should be as minimum as possible. You cannot completely avoid it, okay? But it should be as minimum as possible. Um, and the release once the drug ADC enters into the cancer cell, it should release the drugs into the inside the cancer cells. and the action and whatever the cytotoxic drug that is released within the cancer cell we should kill the cancer cells oh uh, these are the some of the parameters that the people use okay antigen uh, requires a substantial expression by tumor cells but limited expression by cells in normal tissue is very important because if the antigen is also present in a normal cell then you you cannot get a selectivity or specificity then they you need to choose a linker that makes the adc stable within the blood stream okay then payload the whatever the antibody that you choose it should be able to uh, load uh, huge amounts of or required amounts of the cytotoxic drug okay then the pharmacokinetics of the adcs should be optimum so that it maintains the levels of the adc and also maintain the levels of the cytotoxic drug at a constant level okay and a conjugation site that means the way that we link this drug to the antibody okay it should bind only at a particular site because if it binds at many different sites then you will get a different uh, types of adcs what we require is we require adcs with um, a specific number of uh, cytotoxic drugs that means one adr uh, one adc should contain two drugs or uh, two molecules or three molecules or five molecules or six molecules but usually it is even number 2 4 6 8 okay or is the better if you look at the mechanism of the adcs how it looks like is suppose this is antibody drug conjugate okay and this one already i told you that antibody uh, cytotoxic drug and linker so when it reaches to the cancer cell okay it goes inside and uh, this is uh, endosome then this is the lysosome and here you can see that it breaks okay the cytotoxic drug is being released okay and here uh, the important point is uh, at this point this adc is in a blood stream so it should not be degraded here uh, that's why it gives very specific uh, toxic effect towards the cancer cell and the another advantage of this one is you know the cancer cell they metastasize that means it will proliferate so uh, we should kill the cancer cells and also we also should kill the cells which are prone to be uh, cancerous in future okay or in near future that is called bystander effect that means it kills the cancer cells and also it kills the cells which are in the near vicinity okay that expresses that particular antigen uh, here the key point is if the cell does not if the nearby cell does not um, use the antigen then it won't kill it okay. 
which is this is the more detailed one what will happen means this adc first goes into the endosome then from the endosome it goes to the late endosome from the late endosome it goes to the lysosome and from the lysosome the drug is released but here you can see that the drug can be released from the early endosome stage or late endosome stage or uh, lysoso lysosome stage but among from three different sites the drug release is more from this lysosome okay and in my earlier slides i told you that the people are talking about non cleavable linkers so what this non cleavable linkers do is it releases the drug only in the lysosome not in the uh, endosomes okay and th that's why uh, the potency is more okay? and also i have talked about the recycling and some of the adcs that are entered into the entered into the cell cell or uh, tumor environment okay it will is that called uh, it will be recycled out then uh, this cancer cell what it will cause is it causes the disrupt the microcubule or disrupt the dna and how it will do is uh, in total uh, it can elicit cytotoxic effect or anti cancer effect through three different mechanisms cdc that is complement dependent cytotoxicity adcc anti antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity and adcp that is antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis so these are the four three mechanisms through which these adcs kill the cancer cells in the tumor environment and at the same time it also inhibit okay uh, some of the uh, pathways okay suppose this uh, hcr2 should be conjugated or should form a dimer with hcr1 hcr3 or hcr4 then only it will uh, produce the signal okay but when you give this uh, kind of a uh, antibody okay now is here when you give the antibody it will inhibit the signal and at the same time the presence of antibody in this hcr2 will prevent it to form dimer with other hcrs okay so uh, that is about uh, in summary the mechanism of the adcs okay. and so far uh, the currently available or us fda approved adcs on the adcs which are in the clinical trials they act on these targets these are called as antigens okay of course this one uh, represents the target antigen sorry this one represents uh, driver oncogenes hcr2 and egfr they are the ones that causes that drives the cancer or that produces the gene uh, is responsible for the cancer okay then these are the one these are the antigens that are present in the vasculature okay that is tumor micro environment and these are the things that are there present in uh tumor stroma okay and these are the things which are expressed both in normal cells and also in cancer cells but in cancer cells they are present in very very high concentrations and the other thing is uh, these are the target antigens in hematological malignancies for a blood cancer okay so far the adcs most of the adcs that are uh, approved by the us fda they are mainly for blood cancer okay not for solid tumors okay now if you look at the antibody selection okay so you need to choose something like uh, which specifically recognizes uh, the protein of interest or the gene of interest okay here this is the antibody structure here you can see this is a heavy chain okay it is not involved in the recognition of the antigen only the light chain is the one that uh, recognizes the antigen that is present in cancer cell okay or in tumor environment whereas this one heavy chain is the one that is responsible uh, for the antibody to attach uh, to the immune cells within the body 
Now, here you can see that there are three things that they do, okay? Uh, three mechanisms, okay? One is binding to the FCYR. And here you can see that uh, this is the heavy part uh, of the antigen, okay? Heavy and uh, immunoglobin. Uh, this is attached to the a particular uh, immune cell in the body, okay? Then afterwards, what will happen means once it is attached, this is attached to the receptors, okay? Uh, so that the antibody will be attached to this cancer cells. And once it is attached, and it will uh, release the drug, and the drug will cause uh, apoptosis through these two mechanisms. Look at the linkers. Okay, these are the various linkers. Other one is a disulfide. Here you can see that valine citrulline linker that is dipeptide linker, and they are also do uh, glucuronidation. These are the uh, four linkers commonly used in the preparation of the ADCs. Okay, and uh, linker which is used. Uh, uh, non cleavable uh, thioether linker. As I told you earlier, this linker is uh, release the drug only in uh, lysosomes. Okay. Now, in one of my uh, earlier slides, I told you that the existing chemotherapeutic drugs, okay, or anti cancer drugs, are used, are not used as part of the ADCs. The reason for that is, if you look at the potencies of these uh, five fluorouracils and nitrogen masters, they are in the between smaller to nanometer. Whereas these things, thirteens, myasthenins, these are the ones which are widely used or widely present in ADCs, and you see that their uh, fifty values are in the nanomolar to the picomolar. So that means the take home message here is in ADCs, whatever the cytotoxic drug that we use, it should be very, very potent. Or, in other words, you can say that if you take the drug normally, it will kill the patient. Okay. But when it is attached to the antibody drug conjugate, then its activity will be optimal. So that is the key message here. Okay. Now, uh, of course, how here you can see that this antibody uh, contains a lot of lysines, okay? And this is the linker, okay? This is the linker, and this uh, circle one is uh, the drug, the cytotoxic drug, and you can see that how it is being attached here, okay? Now, uh, this um, immunoglobulins, they contain a lot of thiol bonds, okay? You can see a lot of uh, S bonds, huh? SS bonds here, okay? And in total, there are four types of immunoglobulins. Here, what happens is, uh, another technique that they do is, they uh, partially reduce uh, this um, disulfide uh, linkers that is present within the one. And here, you can see that a partial reduction so here you can see that one, two, three, four, four disulfide bonds. Among four di disulfide bonds, only one disulfide bond is reduced. Okay. Then you add a linker here. Then you can see that two uh, drug molecules or two cyclotoxic drugs are attached to the one. Uh, then uh, this is the improvised version of uh, 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 disulfide linkers. Here it is called uh, eucapic thiomap caps. Okay. And these are the thiomaps. Then you do fully reduce it. Okay. In the previous case, you reduce partially, but here you reduce it fully. Then since you are reducing fully, all the disulfide bonds are broken. Okay. And here also this cap is removed. Then again, you oxidize it. When you oxidize it, uh, except this, all other uh, disulfide bonds are oxidized. Then you do the conjugation. 
then uh, the cytotoxic drugs will be attached here. Again, here for one antibody, you can attach two uh, drugs. Okay. And this is another one, uh, selenocysteine. Here also this thing, you do the mild reduction, then this thiol group will be, uh, re uh, seleno group will be reduced so that the thiol group will be free. Then when you do a conjugation, this SH group will bind to the link that is carrying the drug molecule. Okay. So here, all, until now, what you can see is for antibodies, for one antibody, you can load uh, two molecules of drug. Okay. Now the click chemistry, uh, click chemistry means it's a uh, actual reaction. Uh, until now, whatever you have seen in the previous three slides is it is either oxidation or reduction, but here it's an actual chemical reaction that is happening between the linker and the antibody. Okay. And these are the some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of the various conjugation methods. I'm not going into the details okay, of it. And uh, the most important thing that what we want is, we want a homogeneous ADC, okay? We don't want the ADC uh, to be recycled, okay, the second thing. And third thing is, we don't want ADC to release the uh, cytotoxic drug in the systemic circulation. These are the three things that we will pay attention, okay? Now, uh, these are the various uh, cytotoxic drugs that they are being used, okay? Actually, from the name itself, you know that none of these drugs are used in chemotherapy, okay? None of these drugs are used in chemotherapy. And, yeah, these are the DNA damaging agents, okay? Iterating, when we take this drug as it is, it is toxic. But when it is attached to the uh, antibody, Yes, it selectively kills the cancer cells. Okay, these are the some of the examples. And when you look at the evolution of the ADCs, uh, now they say that uh, there are three generations. Okay, the first generation it is based upon the uh, mice uh, antibodies. Uh, in the second generation, humanized antibodies, and third generation it is fully fully humanized. Okay. And here, the main problem is low potency, okay? But now these are very highly potent, okay? And here, you can see that uh, in third gen uh, ADCs, you will have, you can load two to four cytotoxic molecules on a single antibody. Whereas in the first generation, it is uncontrollable, okay? Now, the advantage of this third generation ADC is, is it is highly homogeneous, whereas the first generation is uh, first, first generation and second generation also heterogeneous. Okay. Uh, these are the approved ADC drugs so far, okay, and most of them they are used for uh, what is this called uh, blood cancer, okay, uh, hematological malignancies, and these are for uh, solid tumors. Okay. Uh, that's all uh, from me. Uh, thanks for listening and uh, I'm happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you, sir, for sharing your valuable inputs with us. Um, the dais is again open for questions. Audience can feel free to ask any questions. Okay. If there are no questions, can I sit? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. 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 Moving on to the next keynote session, our next speaker is Dr. 
Sasikala Chinnapin, Assistant Professor, Head of Department, Pharmaceutical Biology, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, UCSI University, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Good morning, everyone. Can I share my uh, screen? Yes, ma'am, you can share. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank organizing committee for giving such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, today, I would like to share about the electro spinning and electro spin nanofiber. Nanofiber is nothing but it's a fiber like structure with a range of nano size. Structurally, it is different from the nanoparticle. Mainly, we are using to deliver the drugs. Also, we can use for the treatment of wound. And also we can use for biosensor to increase the sensitivity, also for the regeneration of the tissues in tissue engineering. So today actually I'm going to focus on how the nanofiber can be used for the treatment of chronic type of wound. So as we all know, there are two type of wound, acute wound and chronic wound. So we are going to focus on chronic wound because it takes longer time to cure the disease. So there are different types of uh, wound we can see. is a diabetic induced chronic wound. Sometimes it will be leads to the amputation. And bed sore can cause the chronic type of wound. And ulceration in the lower extremities also can cause the ulceration. It leads to the amputation. Uh, any disease in the circulatory system also leads to the chronic type of wound. So sometimes, you know, major accident or injury it will be lost the tissues, it can able to make a chronic type of wound. So the treatment of chronic wound is a major concern among the patient and clinician because it uh, seriously affects the quality of life. So around in worldwide, if you see, 6 million people are suffer from a chronic type of wound. So as we see the wound care market, Currently, we are more than 10.41 billion USD we are spending for the treatment of chronic wound. It will be increased around 16.81 billion USD in 2028. So what are the major challenges when we treat the wound care? So one is achieving efficient. Because till now, we don't have any ideal drugs for treatment of chronic wound. So that's why it leads to the amputation. Other major challenges, infection in the chronic uh, wound. So the next is how we can reduce the cost, whatever we are spending for the treatment of chronic wound, also improving the patient experience, also other major concern. So currently we have a lot of uh, drugs are available uh, for the treatment of uh, wound, like we are using gauze, uh, film, fiber, hydrogel, hydrocolloid, foam, alginate, we can use this type of uh, uh, treatment, but the main concern, sometimes this also can able to give the allergy to the wound area. Also the frequency. Frequently we need to change the drugs. Okay, or sometimes it will be adherent to the wound area. So removing or clear from the wound area also is very difficult. So if it is very chronic time, Okay, sometimes we are using debridement therapy. By using surgical knife, we remove the hardening material. But you think that if you remove from the wound area, definitely it will be very painful. Also, we have tissue substitute. Okay, so we take the cadaver tissues and we can replace. It will be help to regeneration of the tissues in the chronic wound. But the cost is very high. Sometimes host rejections will be occur. Sometimes it can able to uh, uh, cause some of the infection in the particular region. So other therapy, VAC therapy is available. This also is very costly. It also can make the infection in the particular region. Also, we are using hypercorrective oxygen therapy to improve the oxygen supply to the particular wound area. 
but you know sometimes when you are using oxygen okay so lung collapse will be occur so should be very careful whenever current drug therapy we are using for the chronic type of one so what actually we need to think to get the ideal uh, drug therapy for chronic type of wound you should be moisture control because if the high moisture also can able to leads to the infection so whatever drug therapy we are using that should be non toxic and cost efficient and should be biodegradable and biocompatible as well and also you should be control the infection so that's why actually we are taking here nanofiber because uh, nanofiber has a unique physical and chemical appearance it can able to place in any small place also so there are different type of techniques are available to make a nanofiber but here we are selecting electro spinning nanotechnology because the poor soluble substance also we can make as a fiber by using electro spinning technology or any type of polymer we can able to use by using this type, type of technology also cost also cost wise also is less so the special about the nanofiber it actually when you see the structure of the nanofiber it look like the similar structure of the extra, extra cellular matrix on the skin so it easily can able to attach with the skin okay it can able to help for the regeneration of the tissues in the wound region the second concept behind the nanofiber usage is actually the nanofiber can exchange the gases because one of the major concern in chronic type of wound lack of oxygen that's why it take longer time to cure chronic wound so this nanofiber can allow the oxygen to the wound area so that it can able to help to contract the wound so this also is act as a protective layer it prevent the infections if any excess of fluids are present in wound area this nanofiber can able to absorb and as i said nanofiber will be a uh, targeted drug delivery easily we can able to make nanofiber with the biocompatible biodegradable and non toxic and non allergic nanofiber we can able to make by using electro spinning technology okay so this is the schematic diagram so to make nanofiber we need drugs and polymer okay so there is a syringe pump here we are going to keep the syringe in syringe pump to regulate the flow of solution okay so that is a collector region usually we collect the nanofiber in the collector region so we are apply high voltage so the high voltage current will pull the solution into the collector region the deposit as a nanofiber so there are some parameter always we need to remember whenever we start the electro spinning nanofiber so one first one is the deposition of distance so the distance between the syringe needle and collector region should be the correct place if it is far away the nanofiber cannot able to deposit on the collector region it is very too short also it is actually uh, the globules the solutions will be deposited as a globules or uh, all the fibers will be deposited in one area it will be causes arching effect there is no any uniform layer of the nanofiber so next polymer concentration so concentration also will be designed to make the nanofiber if the viscosity is very less okay so it cannot make a nanofiber it will be deposit as a liquid in the collector region so it is too high means that concentration also cannot be able to come from the needle so viscosity will designed to make the nanofiber and next voltage if it is you give high voltage the solutions will be sometimes it will be evaporate okay so we need to optimize the voltage also so flow rate also will be designed to make the nanofiber the flow rate is very high so as i said it will be deposit like uh, deposit like a globules we cannot get a nanofiber so needle size needle size also will be make 
to get the nano size of the nanofiber. So before we start with the electrode spinning nanofiber, we always we need to remember uh, this parameter. Okay, so we can use two type of polymer to make the nanofiber natural source and synthetic source. Okay, so here collagen elastin also good natural polymer we can use to make the nanofiber, especially for wound healing. So we can able to uh, manage with the synthetic sources to increase the stability of uh, natural polymer as well. So hybrid solutions also we can use to make the nanofiber. So some of the studies you can see here, Kaizen curcumin loaded nanofiber. Kaizen, you all know it's a flavonoid. It is antioxidant, anti-inflammatory property. Curcumin also one of the potent wound healing activity. Okay, so when they are making actually PCL PEG polymer, okay, so they can show within 14 days more than 80% of wound contraction they observe. Okay, also drug release, they observe 14 days. So sustained release you can observe whenever we use the making with the polymer. And next, another studies are shows that metformin, anti-diabetic drugs also help to cure the wound uh, healing. Okay, so they made lanofiber with the PLGA. It shows more than three weeks as drug release. Uh, so you can see more than 90% wound contractions within 14 days. So next study shows that nano uh, estradiol, they, made nano, uh, they make nanofiber with the polyurethane dextron polymer. So this also shows more than 95% uh, of uh, wound contractions. So as I said, we need to standardize the parameter before when we load to the drugs into the polymer. You can see here, this is the voltage controller and this is the syringe pump. Okay, so we can place the syringe here. So here you can see the attachment with the syringe. Okay, we are giving the voltage here to the syringe. So you can see here is a collector region. There are two region, one, uh, two collector region. One is a static method, another is dynamic method. Static method means, okay, so it is not movable. So the nanofiber will be deposited in one place. But the dynamic means rotating drums. So these rotating drums actually controlled by the speed controller. Okay, so when we rotate the drum, this actually uh, liquid will be deposited as a nanofiber when we are giving high voltage. Okay, so that's why as I said, first we need to set the current, how much voltage we need to make nanofiber what is the flow rate of the solutions? Okay, so what is the distance between the syringe and collector region? So this all actually is a design to make the nanofiber. So in our lab, actually, we have done electrospinning nanofiber of alpha mangosteen. This is a phytochemical from mangosteen plant. Okay, so we actually check in the RAT, a diabetic induced uh, model. So different rate and different voltage, different distance. Okay, so we try, okay, because we need to optimize the, this parameter. So when you see here, the pump rate 0 0.3, voltage 10 and distance 20 centimeter. So this actually parameter actually gave continuous jet fibrous nanofiber. After we designed, after we set the parameter, then we loaded the drugs alpha mangosteen with the polymer of kytosan and PEO, and we made nanofiber. So we have done the characterization. The same analysis also shows the nano size of uh, alpha, alpha mangosteen nanofiber in both the concentration. So after that, we have done wound healing activities on a STZ induced animal model. We, we observe day seven and day 14. 4% of alpha mangosteen shows the significant wound reductions when compared with the diabetic control. So also we tried antibacterial activity. You use the, we use the PVA with the 4% of PVA and 0.5 ml uh, speed uh, flow rate and voltage 12.5, rotation speed 125 RPM we used. Also we got nano size of nanofiber. It shows against uh, effective against a phylococcus RAS. So from the conclusions, I can say that nanofiber 
we can use a one-time applications. The frequency we can able to reduce. It shows excellent healing property as per the study. And we can reduce the pain. And it's actually it's a transparent layer. So easily we can able to monitor the closure of the wound. And we can reduce the risk of infection because it acts as a barrier, also cost effective. That's my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh... Thank you, sir. The forum is again open for questions. Audience can ask their questions or type their questions in the chat box. If there are no questions, I will move on to the next session. I once again thank Dr. Sasikala, ma'am, for joining with us today. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very, very, very much for the opportunity. We'll see. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, bye-bye. Moving on to the next speaker. Uh, ma'am, can you please stop sharing your screen? Thank you, ma'am. Next keynote speaker, Dr. Ms. Sama Raghav, Regulatory Affairs and Pharmacovigilance Director, Middle East Organ and United Arab Emirates. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Can, can you hear, you hear me, me? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Okay, okay great. great. Thank, Thank you for, for the presentation. presentation. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start, start sharing, sharing my screen. screen. So, so you should see, see now, now my screen. You just confirm. Okay, great. We have okay. some echo in your voice, ma'am. Sorry, Sorry, some, some echo? echo? In your voice, we cannot hear it clearly. Uh, just, just a second, I will uh, connect, connect my uh, headphones. Just a second. Just a second. No, no ma'am, we can't hear you. Okay, just a second. And now, now we can now. No, ma'am, we can't hear. Also, you can't hear now. We can hear now. We can hear now. Now, now is okay. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. So, um, thank you for the invitation. Today's presentation, mm -hmm. uh, I will talk about the new trends in uh, biopharma R and D. Mm -hmm. um, this is a regulatory perspective. So first, I would like to uh, do this disclosure that all uh, views and opinions expressed in this uh, PowerPoint presentations are uh, my uh, views and uh, opinions, and they are not attributed to Organon or any other organization that I'm uh, uh, affiliated to. This is our uh, topics for today, or our agenda for today. I will give a snapshot on the global R&D pipeline during 2023, uh, future and emerging innovation in healthcare, mm -hmm. and the global megatrends and drivers for regulatory 
affairs, global uh, transformation, or, uh, global evolution. Summer, and uh, sorry, uh, are you are you talking to me? No, ma'am. There's somebody else talking. Muted his audio. Okay, so digital transformation of the, the regulatory process, dynamic regulatory assessment approach, digital endpoints, and complex clinical trials as well. So uh, first, uh, I will give you like a snapshot about the pipeline during 2023. So the, this research uh, is showing us that in uh, 2023, we have actually uh, 6,147 products in active development from phase one to regulatory submission. And this uh, is showing a, a slow growth, 2% only over the last two years. Uh, but it is maintaining uh, 83 from 2017 to 2022. Oncology, still uh, uh, the, the focus of the pipeline, contributing to 38% of the pipeline or 2,331 uh, products, and growing at 10.5 kgar over the last five years. Then we will uh, find the neuro neurology uh, products continues to represent 11% of the pipeline. The focus is uh, on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's this, uh, disease uh, products. The source of industry scientific innovation continue to evolve with more than 2,800 companies or organizations that are, are uh, currently contributing to the R&D pipeline. Uh, as you can see here, uh, China uh, actually is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, I just need to do this because I can't see the, so China uh, headquartered companies now account for 15% of the pipeline with, uh, actually it's, it's growing uh, steadily. Uh, as we can see, in a decade ago, the, uh, the Chinese companies were only contributing to uh, 4%. So while Europe and Japan shares have fallen, uh, China is uh, steadily uh, growing in, in their shares. So for the emerging biopharma companies, we can see that they contribute to two thirds uh, of the molecules in the pipeline, up from uh, 51 in 51% uh, in 20, 2017 and one third in 20 uh, in, in 2002. That shows us that uh, emerging biopharma companies are evolving uh, in a higher pace in the last, in the last uh, uh, five or six years. U.S. and China headquartered companies account for the largest share of the emerging biopharma pipeline at 46% uh, for U.S. and 20% for uh, China, respectively. So when we are talking about the pipeline, uh, we should uh, actually uh, shed some light about the emerging technologies and the scientific innovation that are evolving now, and they have a big uh, potential, uh, e either from the impact side, uh, they will have a great impact in the coming years, or from the scalability and applicability to, uh, to be uh, leading the uh, coming uh, biopharma uh, and uh, uh, scientific innovation um, picture. So we have, of course, the uh, just a second. 
the genomics, of course, for early diagnosis. We have uh, low-cost viral diagnosis uh, and remote diagnostics, which uh, uh, we know as lab on a chip. Uh, broad spectrum antimicrobial drugs, digital endpoints. We will talk about them in in uh, in a minute. Uh, stem cell technologies for replacements of muscles and organs. We have adaptive and complex clinical trials platform, and of course, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, tools, and uh, innovations for risk predictions and clinical decision support. So uh, we can see uh, an evolving global trends that uh, actually act as drivers for change in the global regulatory ecosystem. First one, we can see the, of course, the, ge the geopolitical uncertainty with uh, an increasing number of wars, and, uh, pandemics, uh, uh, catastrophic uh, uh, like uh, catastrophic circumstances, like uh, earthquakes. Uh, so uh, this geopolitical uncertainty with big wars in, uh, now is driving companies to uh, direct their uh, R&D towards uh, certain products. And at the same time, it uh, actually uh, threatens the uh, the amount of uh, funds uh, that are directed to the the global R&D. We have the climate change where uh, companies are now uh, in, in the biopharma sector, they are uh, required to decrease their uh, carbon dioxide footprints and to invest more in, uh, manuf to, in green manufacturing and uh, 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 the, the KPIs for the climate change uh, to fulfill the KPIs for the climate change measures. Uh, we have the advances in bioscience. Now we are uh, talking about the cell therapies, uh, genomics, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, evolving uh, technologies in the biotherapeutics landscape. And we have the, un, uh, the, the opportunity to, the, to unlock the healthcare system and the need to unlock the healthcare system with uh, increasing population all around the world, uh, increased number of pandemics mm -hmm. to put a great pain on the healthcare systems worldwide. And of course, the digital disruption the new uh, evolving tools like AI, machine learning, data analytics, big data that, uh, ha that have the potential to transform uh, the full uh, healthcare system uh, worldwide. When we talk about the digital disruption, specifically in healthcare, we are talking about automation and robotics. We can now see standardized automated processes across the full uh, value chain of the uh, healthcare products from the uh, R&D step until the service uh, provision stage. Then we have big data, the vast amount of generated data in uh, health uh, all over the world and AI uh, machine learning tools that will uh, greatly support the uh, clinical decision making and the clinical outcome. We have the cloud computing and blockchain technologies that uh, will provide a huge opportunity for data sharing and facilitate collaboration and allow real time data sharing uh, either uh, in clinical trials stage or in the regulatory submission stage or even uh, in the real world uh, uh, evidence creation as well. We have finally the supply chain digitization. We are now having uh, track and trace uh, tools and track and trace technologies implemented 
in uh, most of the countries now to digitize the supply chain to be able to track and trace the products across the supply chains uh, until it reaches the patient. So uh, these uh, drivers actually is driving uh, are driving the uh, global regulatory affairs or regulatory science to uh, to emerge and evolve towards some trends. These uh, trends are, uh, as you can see, the global collaboration, harmonization and reliance in sharing and collaborating in uh, regulatory review and regulatory data sharing. We are seeing now a lot of uh, initiatives uh, and movements toward reliance. Reliance meaning that countries or uh, health authorities in some countries can rely on the previous approvals in the other countries or uh, sharing the assessment data and the assessment reports uh, to uh, other markets so they uh, are not uh, actually enforced to do the full review process again. We have uh, also seen the digital transformation to leverage data analytics and AI and we could see some uh, uh, examples for how health authorities or companies uh, getting benefited from this uh, digital transformation and digital technologies that are evolving now. We have the innovative clinical trial designs, the complex uh, clinical trial designs that adapt and uh, respond to the actually the, the new drivers and the new trends in the healthcare uh, systems. So um, it allows for some uh, designs uh, for trials to make the development uh, timeline shorter and decrease the number of uh, patients needed in clinical trials so we can develop the the, the unmet uh, medical need uh, the drugs uh, in shorter time and with less uh, amount of uh, resources. Then we have cloud-based submission process and data sharing platform that uh, is actually revo revolutionizing the uh, regulatory submissions and products uh, approvals uh, worldwide. Uh, it's also evolving now. We have, of course, clinical trials, uh, diversity, and uh, we are, uh, a lot of uh, tools now uh, are evolving to facilitate uh, the, the, the hiring of uh, patients uh, in different geographies, in uh, different, uh, uh, and, and incorporating different vulnerable groups or underserved groups. And we have the power of real world evidence now uh, that uh, are evolving and the data analytics that uh, actually make us able to, uh, uh, to, to launch new drugs uh, in, in shorter times and rely on the real world evidence it, sometimes in even uh, the designs of the, the R&D uh, clinical trials. And of course, the most important things and the most important trend that is evolving is how to incorporate patient voices in regulatory decision making and uh, empower patients to have uh, to, to be heard and to be uh, their needs to be addressed during the uh, product uh, development stage and the regulatory review stage. So uh, the future uh, regulatory ecosystem, according to these evolving trends, uh, expected to, or uh, it should be a di very dynamic and agile to allow for the absorption of all, of all these evolving technologies and that is, you know, uh, updated and uh, uh, every second now. So it should be collaborative, as we uh, mentioned, uh, health authorities, companies, 
should rely on data sharing, uh, should uh, empower more uh, reliance uh, approaches. So uh, not every country uh, is able to do a full review. Uh, some countries uh, have really very low resources in their regulatory bodies, so they have to utilize the collaboration and the data sharing during the review process and rely on other uh, big uh, health authorities or major stringent health authorities uh, review and data. Uh, the, the, the regulatory process will, will be uh, accordingly risk weighted. Only products with high risk will be uh, actually uh, involved in intensive reviews and uh, intensive evidence uh, generating uh, kind of development plan. However, the products with low risks or uh, the products with the previous uh, uh, performance uh, or previous uh, review uh, and approvals in other markets will take a, a lower weight uh, when it comes to risk. So it might uh, uh, it might pursue less intensive review. Then we have the outcome and performance based approach as well. So uh, health authorities can rely on the history of the company inspections, the company quality assurance measures to uh, prioritize the resources. Uh, in, in terms of uh, inspection, quality assurance, uh, testing, and uh, prioritize resources towards uh, the, the lower performance uh, uh, companies or systems. And we have also the data-driven instead of document-driven approach. As we will see in the coming slides, the current uh, regulatory process or the regulatory submission process is basically based on documents with unstandardized kind of uh, data or uh, text. Uh, however, this uh, hinder uh, uh, the data sharing because uh, the data in different documents are not having the same standards and the same um, structure, they are uh, entered in different structures, so it hinders uh, to a bit uh, the, uh, the data sharing. However, when we move to data-driven approach, uh, information and submission information and submission documents will rely more on data in databases, in automated uh, database and uh, software, so uh, these software will uh, be able to uh, hold standardized data and um, will facilitate uh, data inter interoperability so we can uh, uh, share data between uh, companies, health authorities, or even uh, into collaboration between different uh, clinical entities or different academic entities easily. And we have this adaptive iterative approach that is uh, actually uh, relying on uh, early discussions between the uh, company or the uh, marketing authorization holder in the uh, very early stages of the clinical development to have a discussion with the health authorities about the uh, design of the clinical trial and how this design can evolve according to the interim measures. So we are able to bring the, the innovative products uh, faster and easier to the patients. Uh, so uh, to be able to do the data sharing and collaboration, we have to work uh, to standardize the R&D data uh, and consequently the regulatory data. And as we talked now, the current submission process or the current regulatory process collects all the uh, clinical and preclinical 
safety, efficacy, and quality data in the, the, the famous uh, common technical document structure that is developed by the ICH. So um, we are actually relying on capturing all these data in a structured document-based um, uh, document uh, submission uh, consisted of uh, uh, five modules. And then this document, if every time we have a health authority specific requirements, or we have revision based on information requests, or we have, for example, new product presentation like different concentration or different dosage form for the same API, or we have amendments through the life cycle like changing manufacturing uh, procedures or changing the, the product specs or whatever changes we are having to do, we actually need to modify this um, document that is responsible for this change. However, the future approach that is actually based on the standardized data that are captured in databases are uh, relying on uh, submission uh, contents, contents data management automation and content authoring automation. All the, uh, the data and information that are created during the development process captured in a standardized database, uh, content authoring uh, uh, management systems, and uh, finally, we have the cloud-based platform that facilitates the real-time sharing of uh, the development uh, data, and the development analysis uh, between the company and the health authority. So we don't need to repeat a whole document because we just changed uh, certain data in one of the steps in this document. So to this actually approach will facilitate will help us create this kind of dynamic registration uh, or a dynamic uh, regulatory uh, submission process through uh, data sharing through the cloud based uh, and the cloud computing uh, tool where we uh, are able to have this regulatory dialogue during all the value uh, chain of, of the product since the very early R&D stages until uh, post-marketing uh, post, uh, uh, changes as well. And this uh, evolving and continuous dialogue actually uh, bring uh, more, uh, uh, more, more analysis and more uh, actually evidence evidence to uh, regulatory decision making as it evolves. So it facilitates this uh, iterative and agile process of responding to whatever happening in the research uh, and the, the clinical uh, trial or the real world evidence. It facilitates the responsiveness of the regulatory process according to whatever emerging during this uh, uh, evidence uh, creation across the the, pro the full product life cycle. Uh, these are examples, platforms, how uh, the global uh, ecosystem uh, approach is approaching the data sharing and the initiatives to standardize data and start to rely on this standardized data to uh, bring more agility and more um, uh, dynamic uh, dy dynamic to the, the regulatory and the clinical development uh, stages. So we have, I will not go uh, into um, details. I will, of course, share the, the slides uh, with you. However, these um, HL7 uh, initiative, uh, from Balkan or the ISO IDMP, there are uh, actually initiatives that standardizing data across uh, uh, the full healthcare system. 
So uh, now big health authorities like FDA, uh, EMA, uh, are actually relying on these standards uh, to facilitate data sharing and uh, facilitate interoperability of, of systems. And we have FDA implemented already one of the, the initiatives to rely on these shared data, do some analytics to uh, actually uh, help them to uh, to make their assessment process faster and uh, more efficient. Uh, the other initiatives also are initiatives to facilitate clinical data sharing um, through a networks that uh, all uh, stakeholders can enter and see the uh, some uh, shared data from different clinical uh, trials so they might uh, benefit from these shared data. Moving to another uh, trend uh, that we are saying, uh, which is clinical uh, trials, the complex uh, clinical trials, CCTs. And actually these, uh, this kind of, of clinical trials are really important because it brings patient centricity to the core of what we are doing in the R&D uh, part. Uh, these kind of newly newly uh, designs or new innovative designs uh, actually give us the opportunity to uh, to be able to, for example, uh, randomize patients to to treatment strategies or create uh, subgroups based on the biomarkers. So we don't have to. Uh, uh, to have this huge uh, clinical trial population in the uh, traditional trials. This is uh, done, for example, in the biomarker-led uh, designs, in adaptive designs. For example, we can change the size of the trial, or we can change the endpoint, or uh, combined uh, treatment selections. All of this based on uh, interim results. We don't need to finish the full Clinical, uh, clinical trial to see it uh, failed, so we need to do another one, uh, especially in uh, rare diseases, in, um, in some diseases that do not have the, the huge population that uh, we need in the, uh, the, the traditional uh, diseases or the traditional um, golden standard of uh, randomized clinical trials. Also, um, we are sometimes we are able to uh, to test uh, several uh, treatment options um, in parallel. So all of all of these designs you can uh, see here in this list are used in um, successfully approved uh, FDA products in in uh, us uh, in in the the recent uh, years and it really uh, uh brings a lot of new innovations in uh, less time and with less resources to patient access for patients to access their treatment as early as possible another uh, and the final uh, trends that i will share uh, that will really bring uh, patient centricities, centricity and diversity would facilitate the diversifying of, of the clinical trials, which is digital endpoints. Um, digital endpoints is uh, actually the novel type of endpoint that are derived from digital health technology, generated data, the sensors, the, the wearables. And uh, actually this will facilitate uh, actually the, the the, the clinical uh, data collection outside the clinical setting during the patient daily activities. However, there are some factors need to be there for this uh, new uh, approach to be uh, of success. We need very strong patient engagement plans so uh, to, to monitor, uh, to be able to monitor patients during their daily activities. Um, so they do not uh, 
impact the, the, the trial uh, rules or the trial design, uh, we should uh, provide patient-friendly digital health solution so they can use it easily. They um, Because if any technical issue happens, it will, uh, of course, disturb the uh, data collection and the, the, the trial plan. We need to provide high quality digital measure, high validated digital measure, and fit for purpose digital solution as well. Uh, this is also one of the big global initiatives to uh, support this kind of uh, uh, digital endpoints measures. Uh, it is uh, actually initiated by the European Federation for Pharmaceutical uh, uh, Industry, and uh, actually it provides uh, very uh, important uh, tools, which is the catalog component, where they uh, list all the digital measures that are uh, validated and tested before, so it can be reusable in other uh, trials. And it also provides a collaboration ecosystem where uh, all uh, stakeholders can have a kind of uh, discussion, scientific uh, uh, experience sharing between uh, stakeholders that facilitate this uh, connection and facilitate the, uh, uh, this, this kind of new uh, concept to evolve. Uh, this is how the, uh, the initiative uh, provides the transparency among the stakeholders, novel insights uh, from real world health setting. Uh, they collected from the, the, the participants in this initiative, presenting evidence in a consistent way to regulators, access to data, in an agile approach, as we mentioned, visible and accessible publications of standards related to digital measures, multi-stakeholders interaction for faster uh, uh, qualification advice, development, validation, approval of digital endpoints, and reusing measures across diverse uh, disease areas. Here I uh, reached the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you all. Um, this is my email and my LinkedIn account. Uh, I would like to hear from you. And I'm open to hear any question or any uh, comments from the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your valuable insights with us. If the audience has any questions, you may feel free to ask now. If there are no questions, then we'll probably wind up. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Thank you. Bye-bye. So with that, we are wrapping up the keynote lectures for today. Uh, general announcement for the participants who are presenting today. E-oral presenters, you will have presentation time of eight minutes and two minutes for question and answer. E-poster presenters, you will have three minutes for presentation and two minutes for question and answer. I take this opportunity to welcome our um, session chairs for today, Dr. Satish Kumar Sarankar, Principal and Professor, Akhil Bharati College of Pharmacy, India, Dr. S. Murugesan, Associate Professor, Siddha Toxicology, National Institute of Siddha, 
Mr. Ravindran, Assistant Professor, Pharmacy Practice, Sri Siddhananda College of Pharmacy, India. The presentations will start sharp at 12 o'clock. I request all the presenters to be ready with their presentation. I would like to call the names of the first three presenters, Dr. V. Anitha, Simon Lester Periara, Dibya Das. If you're not available, we'll move on with subsequent presentations. My colleague Archana will take over as a moderator for the afternoon sessions. Thank you. Hello, am I audible? Good afternoon, sir. Ah, good afternoon, uh, madam. Divya Das. Divya Das. Okay, madam. Uh, 
uh, i request uh, all the participants uh, i mean uh, delegates who are going to present that strictly adhere to the timings and okay, in sir. advance uh, in advance uh, all the best uh, thank you sir okay i now request the first presenter dr anita vetrevel to present good afternoon one and all present here myself dr anita professor sri sairam sadha medical college and research center let me allow the slide share Is the slide is visible? No, ma'am, it's not. Is Sri Sri Lanka is here? Ma'am, is Mrs. Sri Sri Lanka is here? She will chat chat for me. Okay. I send my PPT to her. Anyone, I don't please? think she is here. Ah, uh, yeah. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Yeah. Myself, Dr. Anita, she professor at Sri Ram Sudha Medical College and Research Center, Chennai. My topic is. Physico chemical analysis of purified croton tiklim, that is nail volume, denotes in Siddha text as per OIS guidelines. Introduction. Next slide, please. The Siddha system of medicine is one of the early and Indian medical system known to the mankind. Several indigenous Siddha formulations developed and speculated by the ancient Siddha practitioners. The global market for the Siddha formulation appears to be impressive, but the need of the hover is to ensure the quality. Given the global demand, a modern standardized procedure was used to ensure the preparation, identification, purity, and self life. Next slide, please. My aim is to determine the purity of raw materials. Next slide, please. Hence, the main aim to present the investigations to standardize the noble Siddha drug Nirvalam as per the OIS guideline and reveal the property of the drug in the scientific community for the better understanding about the standards of the Siddha drug. We are collecting the uh, drug in the Nirvalam. Uh, the Nirvalam is uh, commonly cultivated in the Nepal. Then, uh, so, it is called as Nirvalam. Our process uh, is, uh, we are obtaining the drug from the, our draw drug store. We are uh, purifying this uh, nirvalam to the process of, uh, next slide. The process is, the purification process is the cow dung extract and the uh, cow's milk and the, next slide please. Cow's milk, cow's urine and the boiled seeds in the lemon juice. After This is the purified nirvalam picture. After um, we done it to the powder form. Next slide, please. This is the coarse powder of the nirvalam. It is a um, it is in the coarse material and strong characteristic in rough enough. The property is non-free flowing. Appearance is the blackish. Next slide. Our physical chemical study is done on the first the solubility profile is the chloroform, it is insoluble, ethanol, it is soluble, water, it is soluble, ethyl acetate, it is insoluble. Determination of water soluble extract, it is soluble. That is uh, we are done on the physical chemical study. In the solubility profile, percentage of loss on drying, determination of the total ash, determination of the, the acid. So insoluble ash, determination of the alcohol soluble extractive, determination of the water soluble extractive and pH determination. Next slide, please. This is our report. Loss on drying 105 degrees Celsius. It is the 
three point nu plus or minus. That is the mean value. The total ash is two point two zero. Ash is insoluble. Ash is one zero point one nine. Water soluble extract. It is ten point six. That is alcohol insoluble extract. It is four point five. The study is reference is the Indian Pharmacopoeia Volume One, Government of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Indian Pharmacopoeia Commission. The pharmacological uh, laboratory for the Indian medicine guidelines. The study is done under the guidelines of the pharmacological laboratory, pharmacological laboratory of the Indian medicine. Next slide, please. Here is our discussion. Next slide, please. Ash value is useful to determine the authenticity and purity of the sample, and also these values are important to the qualitative standards. The total ash value and ash that insoluble ash, water soluble ash was found in 2.20, 0.91, 10.6 is. The water soluble extractive value plays an important role in the evaluation of the crude drugs. Less extractive value indicates the addition of exhausted material, adulteration, or incorrect processing during the Dying or storage. The small water soluble extract value indicates the purity of the drug. Without exhausted material, adulterated product or incorrect process during the dry, during dying or storage. Next slide, please. Our conclusion is standardization of the nerve volume was carried out by approximate analysis of the ash values. That is total ash, acid insoluble ash, extractive values, alcohol in. Alcohol soluble extractive and water soluble extractive loss on drying and pH value. The results obtained be compared to the standards. These are all our results compared to the standards. We conclude that the drug is pure from the above results of standardization. Next slide. These are all the references we take in the in Sutta text. The in Theran says. Uh, the purified nirvalam, it is the uh, known drift of uh, Devar Arundum Marundagam. That is the, after the purification, the nirvalam is compared to the Amrutam. So, the, uh, we, uh, I emphasize the standardization of the nirvalam purification method. The result is coming out. This is all our reference. This is our acknowledgement. I, I am extremely thanks to our management of Sairam Siddha Institution, our ex-principal, Dr. Ais Madhukumar, uh, Sairam Siddha Medical College. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. I request the session chairs to hit this question and answers. Madam, uh, what is the limitation of your study, madam? Yes, sir. What is the limitation of your study? Research limitation. Uh, we are uh, uh, next. We are going to the uh, clinical trial. Though uh, we start as the physical chemical analysis. This is our uh, motive. Ah, okay, okay, madam. Can we move on to the next person, sir? Yes, madam. Yes, ma you can ask the remaining uh, two session chair, madam. Next, I call upon Simon Lester to present his e oral presentation. Is my presentation visible? Yes, you can continue. Okay. So good afternoon to one and all present here. Today, my topic of presentation is isolation and bioactive studies of alkaloid fraction from Cymoroba glauca leaf TC methanol extract. So here, this is the content. We will start with the introduction. So in the first slide is the introduction. So here we can understand how important is the medicinal plants are for human welfare and well-being? Because the medicinal plants contain a wide variety of uh, biological compounds and another second, especially the secondary metabolites like alkaloids, flavonoids, quasinoids, and phenols, and many other biological compounds, which has a potential uh, activity against microbes, uh, then uh, uh, anti-cancerous activity and microbe, antimicrobial activity. So uh, in the 
current and present context and many medicines are produced from mm, the medicinal plants. So here uh, in the aims and objective, next is the aims and objective. The aim and objective of my study was to analysis the phytochemicals which is present in the uh, leaf extract, methanol leaf extract of Cymaroba glauca leaves and to study its antibacterial property and finally to study its cytotoxic effect. So in the upcoming slides, we will be dealing with the experiments which I have done for the project. Okay, so uh, starting with the materials and methods, the first is the sample collection. The, uh, sample collection, first we have to collect the sample, wash it in clean water, and we have to dry it in, uh, in room temperature for 7 to 8 degrees Celsius and make sure that you are not drying it under the sun. And now we have we, we are going to take the plant extract. The plant extract is taken by a method called Soxlet extraction. And here we have used mm, uh, a solvent called methanol. And why the reason why we, we are using methanol is that on the basis of the previous researchers done, uh, uh, ethanol extract, methanol extract have yielded more result than the ethanol extract. So that is the reason why methanol extract is taken for this experiment. So after taking the plant extract, uh, we have done uh, three tests, that is the Mayer's test and the Drajendrov test, then the Salkowski test. And out of this three, the Mayer's test and the Drajendrov's test is used to uh, test the presence of alkaloid. And both the tests gave the positive result and indicating the presence of alkaloid. So this is I have also uh, pasted the pictures here uh, indicating the positive results for alkaloid. Then uh, from this plant extract, the alkaloid, the crude, from this crude plant extract, the crude alkaloid is taken uh, by separatory funnel method by, um, by using mm, a chloroform as a solvent. And finally, uh, we got 3.760 gram of crude alkaloid. And now we will be dealing with the most important three experiments, that is the GCMS analysis after getting the plant extract. First, we did the GCMS analysis. The results will be, uh, uh, will be discussed in the upcoming slides. Then the antibacterial activity test. That is here we have uh, uh, taken uh, four strains of uh, different bacteria, that is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Salmonella typhimurium, and Bacillus subtilis and Escherichia coli are analyzed by disk diffusion method by using 0 0.1 gram per 100 ml uh, methanol extract, methanol plant extract. So uh, we will discuss it later. And then uh, the last test was to study the cytotoxic effect, that is the germination inhibition assay. So basically what we do is we will soak 10 different, 10 seeds of uh, green gram in five different concentration of the plant drug, which is the methanolic extract of the Cymaroba glauca leaves. And we will observe it for 96 hours. And after the 96 hours, we will calculate the, uh, calculate or we will observe the growth of the bipolar structures, which is the radical and the plumule, to study the uh, cytotoxic effect. We will discuss it later. Okay, so now we are moving on to the result. So first is uh, uh, the antibacterial activity. So here are the pictures. We, uh, I have pasted some pictures here. So it's showing the zone of inhibition. The first is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Salmonella typhimurium and Bacillus subtilis and Escherichia coli, and you can see the pictures. And now we will uh, see the result, the actual results, that is, from the, uh, here we have taken two systems, that is the crude extract and the crude alkaloid. And out of this, the crude extract has shown for the four strains of bacteria, the crude extract has shown a high uh, inhibitory rate than the crude alkaloid. And now you can see, uh, mm, yeah, out of the four bacterial strains, Bacillus subtilis and Escherichia coli has showed the high zone of inhibition with 24 millimeters of mm, zone of inhibition. And Salmonella typhimurium and Pseudomonas aeruginosa has shown 12 millimeter and 16 millimeter zone of uh, inhibition respectively. And the crude alkaloid in the crude alkaloid, Bacillus subtilis and Escherichia coli has has ha, haven't shown any uh, antibacterial activity. Uh, 
Salmonella typhimurium has 8 mm zone of inhibition and Pseudomonas aeruginosa has shown 10 mm uh, zone of inhibition. And here we have taken streptomycin as the control which yielded a constant result. So now we are moving on to the uh, green gram inhibition assay result to study the cytotoxic effect. As I mentioned the process procedure earlier, it was uh, the green gram seeds were soaked in different five different concentrations: 15.7, 31.3, 62.5, 125, and two, 250 uh, mu gram per ml concentration was taken. And here what we uh, uh, observed is that. As the concentration of the plant drug increased, the growth of the bipolar structures, that is the radical and the primule, has significantly uh, uh, slowed down its growth. So these were the uh, results which, uh, which we got from the um, green gram inhibition assay. Now, uh, so these are the pictures. I have uh, provided some pictures here. You can see it from here. Okay, so uh, we have taken uh, a control, water control. To, uh, which has uh, which has attained a full growth of radical and plumule. Okay, so these are some pictures. So we will move on to the discussion part. That is, as I said earlier, we have done a phytochemical analysis after getting the plant extract. Uh, we have subjected the plant extract. Mm, for GCMS analysis, gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy analysis. And what we find is that we found an alkaloid called Canthin-61. And on the basis of the previous uh, phytochemical researches done on the same plant, it is found that Canthin-61 is an alkaloid which possesses a wide variety of properties, which include uh, anti-cancerous property, anti-tumor uh, uh, anti property, and most importantly, the anti-proliferative property. And antibacterial efficacy, as I said earlier, the zone of inhibition was uh, was higher for the crude alkaloid, and uh, has uh, is and the result was were comparatively less for the uh, crude uh, crude extract showed more result than the crude alkaloid. And these are the result of here. I have provided the chromatogram of the gas chromatography. That is, uh, I have here, I have uh, indicated the um, our alkaloid with a blue triangle. You can see it from here with a retention time of 4.37. So, yeah, that is all about uh, the GCMS analysis. So, the cytotoxic effect, saying about the cytotoxic effect, uh, as I said earlier, when the concentration of the plant drug or the extract increases, uh, the rate or the growth of the bipolar structures also decreased. And I said, as I said earlier, Canthin-61 is an alkaloid which possesses a wide variety of properties, which include the one of the most important properties, the anti-tumor and anti-proliferative property. So we can assume that. So here, having said that, Canthin-61 uh, has, Canthin-61 has an anti-proliferative uh, or anti-mitotic property. We can assume that it is due to the uh, effect. It is due to that Canthin-61 has also contributed, is, is one of the component that has come, contributed to the anti-proliferative or the anti-mitotic activity of the, uh, of the green gram seeds. So here in this, from this context, we can also say that the cytotoxic, from the cytotoxic effect result, we can also say that the uh, cymroba glauca leaves can also be used for the treatment of cancer. Uh, on the basis of the previous studies, it has also shown to be an effective, uh, it has shown to be an effective agent on human cancer cell lines. So um, that's all. So with that, I'm concluding my presentation. So that's all. These are the references. I have provided the references. So thank you. That's all. Thank you. I request the session chairs to proceed with the questions. Sir, have you identified any other bioactive compounds, sir? Uh, there was, uh, since my study was primarily based on uh, the alkaloid extraction, yeah, there were so many uh, in the chromatogram, it showed so many other uh, components like quassinoids, flavonoids, and triterpenoids. And uh, in the 
uh, in the first few slides, I have also showed a picture that is, I have conducted the Stalkowski test, which has shown the uh, presence of triterpenoids. So there are uh, so many other components, but since my study was completely based on the alkaloid, I was uh, more focused on the alkaloid and one was extra, one was found, one alkaloid was found and yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. Any other questions, sir? If not, we'll move to the next person. I call Divya Das to present her e-oral presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Is it visible? Hello. It's not visible, sir. Oh, okay, just a minute. Now. No, sir. Okay, just a minute, ma'am. It's now, visible now, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so today. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, my topic is method development and validation by LCM SMS of an anti hyperglycemic drug, Cetagliptin. So, this is my contents. So, next, the introduction. So, Cetagliptin is a DPV4 inhibitor and an oral anti hyperglycemic medication used to treat type 2 diabetes. So, previously, biomedical methods are having some drawbacks. So, here we are trying to overcome the problems. So, here the quantification. Uh, method is reliable. The extraction procedure was very simple and cost effective. After that, to determine the therapeutic efficacy of the drug, this method was is very successful and accurate, and it is applied in BAB studies with the prior permission from the ethics committee. So the experimental work. So here, a simple, sensitive, and rapid, rapid high-performance LCSI MSMS method was developed and validated for the quantification of cetagliptin using metoprolol as an internal standard in human plasma. So the drug cetagliptin was extracted finally. So the parenteral and protein ionization envisage ratio is given below. And the, where the monitor, it is monitored of triple quadruple mass spectrometer operating in the multiple reaction monitoring. And it is in positive mode. The linearity range was between 1200 nanogram per ml to 4.68 nanogram per ml. And the total chromatography runtime was seven minutes. So the method was validated as per the USFDA and European Medical Agency's guidelines. So here the materials and methods, the active pharmaceutical ingredients of cetagliptin, IS, peripolol, and the blank human plasma samples were obtained from AMS step by study services, Jadapur, Kolkata, and as well as the chemicals and equipments. It is a DCGI approved lab in Eastern India. So the chemicals are used acetonitrile, milk water, ammonium solution, and methanol. So here, the HPLC and ESI MSMS I used. So the LCMS condition, the column is C18 phenomenon column. And in mobile phase, the 10 millimolar ammonium acetate in water with 0.1% ammonium solution is in pump A and pump, pump B ammonium solution in methanol. In this mobile phase I try uh, choose by trial and error method. And the total flow is 0.5 ml per minute and the injection volume is 10 microliter and the total runtime is 4. So here the gas and source parameter, here the parent time is 205.3 and for and the daughter and is this one. So the plasma extraction procedure. So we do the spike in blank human plasma samples from the deep freezer and allowed them to thaw at room temperature. Then adequate 100 microliter of blank plasma and added 50 microliter of drug and 50 microliter of ice because there's a blank plasma. So I need to first develop the method. And after that, mix it for one minute, then add 300 microliter of cold acetonitrile in it and vortex mix it for 10 minutes. Then cold centrifuge at 12,000 RPM for five minutes. After that, separate the upper organic layer into the autosampler files and then inject the samples into the LCM samples. So here the calibration curve. So this is the Q1 scan of cetagliptin, the 408.5. And this is the MS2 scan of cetagliptin. So here the calibration curve of the cetagliptin. So here the 
peak of the LLOQ means lower limit of quantification, LQC, lower limit, low quality control, medium quality control, and high quality control of the CT equilibrium. These chromatograms are from LC machines. Here now, the result and discussion the intra and intraday precision uh, of and accuracy data for cytoglyphene in human plasma. In, as per the rules, that uh, the LLQ is within uh, 80 to 120 percent, and the LQC, MQC, HQC is 85 to 115 percent. So, as per my result, all accuracy within the range means my intraday and intraday was passed. Then the storage conditions. So here I perform phase width of ISTHA and stability, auto sample stability, short term stability, and long term stability. I done. So after that, the result, the accuracy within the 85% to 150%, it means the stability of the cytoglyphene of my method is established. So now conclusion: the binaural method developed the cytoglyphene is highly specific, sensitive, and found very simple and reproducible. The method involves a simple specific sample preparation by the protein precipitation technique. Only 100 microliter plasma needed. The overall analysis is time promising. The method was validated as per USFD and EMA guideline. So this method was successfully applied for the pharmacokinetic studies and BAB studies. So here are my references. And here I acknowledge uh, Dr. Himal Shrikar Maji sir, Dr. Uh, <coughs> my co-guide late professor, Dr. T.K. Paul sir, and the cab study services. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request the session chairs to proceed with questions. No question. Thank you, sir. If there are no questions, we'll pro proceed with the next person. I call upon Ms. Pooja Dr. Day to present her reposter. I'm audible, ma'am. Yes, you are, ma'am. Please continue. Yes, yes, ma'am. We are not able to see your screen, ma'am. So please start sharing. Just meet, ma'am. Just meet. Okay. Now it is visible, ma'am. No, ma'am, please try again. Now we can see a screen, but not your poster. Now, ma'am, poster is visible. No, Hello? poster is not visible. In screen sharing, you'll have to select your uh, PPT so that you can share it. Am I select my poster? Visible? Yes, it's visible now. You can start. Okay, okay. 
good afternoon everyone i am pooja today i am here present my poster presentation the topic is development and optimization of phytoconstituent based dry powder inhalation for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease copd is a common and common preventable and uh, common preventable and treatable disease that is characterized by persistent respiratory systems like progressive breathlessness and cough COPD damages air sacs and thin air sacs in the lungs as per the WHO report COPD is the biggest cause of death worldwide as per the WHO uh, report prevalence of COPD in India is between 6.5 to 7.7 percent COPD prevalence in India males ranged from 3 percent to 8 percent whereas in female ranged from 2.5 to 4.5 percent so the drug is my my water constant drug is uh, naringin it is anti-inflammatory anti-cancer potential cardiovascular benefits and uh, anti osteoporosis the proliposome enhances the deep, uh, deep lung depositions the methodology uh, in methodology i use the simple spray drying technique in that the organic and aqueous phase mixed with and uh, stirring for 30 minutes then we spray dry and then we got the dry powder then results in results, we uh, we use the optimal mixture design for the optimization of batch. The components are uh, carrier drug lipid ratio and the responses we check the uh, the compo the effect of components we check on the responses that is uh, entrapment efficiency, particle size, angle of repose. A A graph shows the uh, entrapment efficiency. We increases the uh, drug ratio and the lipid ratio. We increases the entrapment efficiency. It uh, shows the significant results. And the B B is the particle size. A B is the particle size. It shows the uh, not significant is because of the uh, B increases the uh, drug and uh, lipid ratio. The particle size is decreases. So we uh, result is not significant. Third is uh, angle of repose. Uh, angle of repose. It is a significant. It shows the significant effect. Uh, the carrier ratio and the lipid ratio was increases then the uh, angle of repose is also increases and d is the moisture content we increases the carrier ratio the also moisture uh, the moisture content is decreases it shows the significant effects on the uh, interfet, uh on the moisture contents then we uh, the optimized batch then we further characterized for the ftir dsc fesm in vitro drug dissolution, particle size, and in vitro aerosol performance. Then in FTIR graph shows there is a no there is a no interaction between the uh, excipient polymer and drugs. It shows the our formulation is compatible with the excipient. Uh, the drug is compatible with excipient and polymers. Then the second figure shows the FASM field emissions scanning electron microscopy. The A graph shows the pure drug. It is the rod shape and rough rough in nature. The B shows the spray dry drug, which is sprayed uh, spraying in the spray dry. It shows the rough and uh, spherical in shape. But the C shows the formulation. The C graph shows the formulation. It is a spherical and smooth in surface. If we conclude it, is our formulation is converted into the a powder form that is fine powder form. Then uh, DSC we check the the differential scanning electrometry, the melting point of the drug and excipients. There is a no interaction between the uh, uh, interaction between the drug and the polymer. Then we uh, uh, then we done the XAID and XAID XRD characterizations. XRD characterization in that the uh, drug is converted. The drug uh, drug is converted into the amorphous form. The uh, amorphous one we concluded here. We concluded the our drug is converted into the amorphous uh, crystalline into the amorphous form. Amorphous form. Then we done the uh, in vitro uh, drug dissolution between the formulation spray dry drug and uh, pure drug. And the uh, formulation sh shows the prolonged drug, uh, drug release in uh, 24 hours as compared to the spray dry drug and pure drug. Then we check. Uh, then we also done the powder uh, laser powder diffraction for the powder size uh, for the determination of powder size. Then we got the uh, three micro. Then we got the three micrometer uh, for the powder, which uh, it is a. Uh, uh, it is a deposition for a deposition in the lung. The size, uh, the size is range one to five micrometer. Though oh, our no. our uh, powder size is three point five micrometer. Then we done the in vitro aerosol performance for uh, for the powder is deposition in the lungs at the at what stage? Then uh, capsule. The uh, we check the uh, spray dry drug and the formulation. 
<coughs> the formulation shows the deep uh, deep lung deposition as compared to the uh, as compared to the pure drug uh, as compared to the pure drug the a the b uh, the b color the blue color shows the spread right nine engine and the orange color shows the uh, formulations uh, at the uh, six stage the at the uh, stage number six our formulation is good if we conclude the our formulation is uh, deep uh, lung deposition uh, then we done the analysis of uh, cell proliferation on the stem cells or a5 4 and the a5 4 length lungs a uh, cell epithelial lungs epithelial here we show there is a no prolif uh, pro uh, proliferation of the cells as uh, we check the uh, pure drug and the formulation there is a no cell proliferation in the formulations it inhibit the cell of, of uh, proliferations and then we also done the in vivo bio uh, lung biodistribution uh, in that the uh, formulation oral uh, formulation pure drug and spray dry drug uh, by oral route inhalation route the uh, inhalation route shows the uh, maximum lung uh, lung deposition as compared to the as compared as compared to the pure uh, pure drug and spray dry drug the conclusion in the present study, we have successfully developed an adenine polyposum for COPD using the simple uh, simple single spray dry technique. Uh, in the in vitro aerosol performance using cascade impactor provided higher drug, uh, drug deposition in the uh, lung in the lower region of the lungs. Therefore, the naringe polyposum formulation developed was found to be an op op optimistic approach to the administration of the naringe to the lungs for the treatment of COPD due to its sustained release. Acknowledgement the ethical committee approval. Uh, all the animals experiment con uh, conducted in the present study were approved by the institution animal ethical committee all the experiments were st strictly adhering to the guidelines for the committee for the control and supervision of the experiments on animals in india thank you thank you echoes the session chairs to proceed with the questions ma'am which animal have you using this study sorry sir which animal? So we start right. Male and female. Okay. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next person. Thank I you. call Anjali E to present the E oral presentation. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, it's visible. So, a very warm good afternoon to all. Uh, myself, Anjali, a fifth year doctor, pharmacy student from Great College of Pharmacy, in Kerala, India. So uh, my topic uh, about the presentation is the evaluating the multifaceted impact of dapagliflozin on type 2 diabetes mellitus patients with comorbidities. So uh, first one is the introduction. So diabetes mellitus is a chronic metabolic disorder. Uh, as we all know, it is characterized by the hyperglycemia. And also diabetes comorbidities includes cardiovascular diseases, uh, then hypertension and renal impairment. So commonly used OHs, that is oral hypoglycemic agents, include the sulfonylurease, metformin, and in, uh, all other includes the insulin, uh, which have been the cornerstones of the therapy for decades. And recent studies introduced the novel therapy, that is the HGL2 inhibitors, apagliflozin, canagliflozin, and pagliflozin, which is sodium glucose core transporter to inhibitors. So the traditional is these primary acts by reducing that is metformin primary act by reducing the hepatic glucose production and improve the insulin sensitivity and also decreases the GI glucose absorption, thereby reducing the uh, hyperglycemic effect. Uh, next is the sulfonylurease, uh, which increases the insulin secretions and also thereby decreases the glucose production. Then insulin, as we all know, it is a direct replacement of the deficient or. or and also, these uh, agents have been effective in managing hyperglycemia, yeah, but fail to control the comorbid comorbidities associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus. So, for that, only the uh, latest novel therapies like SGL2 inhibitors, which is a newer class of anti diabetic agents, 
have been uh, innovated or uh, have been uh, approved by the FDA uh, for the treatment of di uh, diabetes along with the comorbid conditions. So here, Zapagatrosin, uh, which is a SGL2 inhibitor, it operates by inhibiting the renal glucose reabsorption. Uh, that is by inhibiting the proximal convoluted tubules, thereby leading to the, uh, that is the reabsorption by the PCP, thereby leading to the increased glucose excretion in the urine, that is glycosuria. And this unique mechanism not only lowers the uh, blood glucose level, but also offers a potential benefits for those who are having cardiovascular comorbidities and also certain renal health uh, patients. Next is the rational study. Since uh, my uh, study, uh, which compares between the traditional agents and as well as the dapagliflozin, uh, based upon their effectiveness, safety, and health. So here's a rationality that is giving increasing prevalence of diabetes related comorbidities and also the availability of new treatment options like dapagliflozin. Uh, it is uh, required for uh, may, uh, may be the uh, need for the conduct of the empirical study. And also, this study aims to systematically evaluate and to compare the clinical safety, efficacy, uh, that is, uh, safety, efficacy, and impact on comorbid comorbidities between dapagliflozin and also the commonly prescribed traditional anti diabetic agents in diabetic patients. So, this research uh, that provides a uh, potential. Uh, Means like it provides a better way to understand the newer drugs like dapagliflozin and offer advantage beyond the glycemic control and also it can be used for the further treatment in comorbid conditions those who are having diabetes. So uh, this is the same thing that is the need of the study to involve the patient counseling uh, and to you know involve in treatment landscape for diabetes and also to grow the prevalence of diabetes and comorbidities. Next aim. So the aim of the study is the multifaceted benefits uh, to understand the multifaceted benefits of dapagliflozin in the treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus patients with comorbidities. Uh, so the objective was to measure the efficacy of dapagliflozin in terms of HbA1c, uh, fasting blood sugar, then uh, postprandial blood sugar, and also the injection function. To compare, uh, next one was to compare the multifaceted effects of dapagliflozin while comparing uh, that is with the other oral anti oral hyperglycemic agents, then to study the safety parameters of dapagliflozin and to monitor the uh, prevalence of the adverse effects occurring, then to uh, study the prescribed pattern of dapagliflozin in the patients uh, with comorbidities and to measure their outcomes. So the methodology is that the study design was a prospective observational cohort study and the study site was uh, at Karana Middle College Hospital of Paleo Institute, uh, Palakkad. Then the study period was of a six-month study. Uh, the data collection will be carried out for a period of six months. Then the sample size was calculated based upon the prevalence rate of 60% from a journal by G.J. Murray uh, in the year of 2022. And the sample size was calculated to be 65 patients for each group. Each group, in instance, they have been classified patients into two groups. That is, one uh, patient in the person, and the next group, uh, those who are having the uh, non diabetes process. That is, uh, those who are not having the diabetes process therapy. Uh, so this is the uh, reference value for HbA1c, FBS, and P uh, PRBs. We are following the American Diabetes Association study criteria. Uh, so the first is the inclusion criteria. Both males and females of age 40 to 80 years have been included in the study. And those who are doing the uh, written information concern, then those who are using the comorbidities with diabetes. The patients who are taking insulin as well as other oral hypoglycemic agents, and also the patients who are newly prescribed with dapagliflozin therapy. Next is the exclusion therapy. Here, of pregnant and luxury women, psychiatric patients, and advanced uh, renal disease, that is CKD stage 4 and 5, then immunocompromised patients and type 1 diabetes mellitus patients were excluded from the study. So, the study procedure is that the study was to be conducted with the aim to study the multifaceted effects of dapagliflozin and to compare its effects and safety parameters with commonly prescribed oral anti diabetic agents on patients who are uh, with diabetes for visiting the general medicine department. And also, the patient's income concern will be collected from the patients to access the data from their patient patients and also based upon their uh, medical record laboratory record and also uh, uh, interview will be conducted uh, so as to collect the data from that. Uh, based on the information collected, they are categorized, as I already mentioned, categorized into two groups. That is one patient, one having patients with mono or multiple therapy that includes the dapagliflozin, 
and then another group having patients with mono or multiple therapy that include commonly prescribed anti-diabetic agents, excluding the dapagliflozin. So here we will measure their social history, past and present medical medications, medical history, then age, gender, diet, and clinical manifestation, along with the lab data also. Uh, next, as the study results will be evaluated based on the following parameters, that is the changes in the glycemic level, that is FBS, PPS, uh, PPBS, and HPUNC will be monitored. Uh, then ejection fraction, from the, also ejection fraction from the baseline of three, four, basically three follow-ups are uh, advised uh, for the, to observe the study result. So the HPUNC, we are having a two months follow, uh, that is three months duration, two follow-ups will be collected. Then ejection fraction, six months duration, two follow-ups will be collected. Then for the safety of the graphite person, uh, let's instance of PD, we are using the narrative scale. So the statistical analysis, coming to the statistical analysis, we are using the student P test, uh, that is the glycemic control and the ejection fraction of two groups. Changes will be monitored or measured using the unpaired P test. Then analysis of variance that is uh, used to uh, examine the effect of both treatment group and the presence of comorbidities on changes in glycemic control as well as the ejection fraction. Then hazard ratio is used to analyze about the areas, uh, the time taken uh, the area occurs on the patient, and also to quantify and compare the risk of experiencing such an adverse effect uh, is uh, for that uh, hazard ratio is used. Study flow includes the encompassing from the attraction form and the uh, narrative scale. So coming to the results, that is, this, these are the preliminary results we observed uh, from our ongoing study. Uh, here we understood that uh, both patients, that is may, uh, male and females are included, but mostly uh, males are then having the dominance. Uh, at least 30 years old, males are more in our study, demonstrating a notable improvement in glycemic control while when they are using with glycoprotrosin comparing with all other or uh, hypoglycemic agents. Then HbA1c, FBS, and RBS levels were lower uh, when they have been newly started with the dapagliflozin. Uh, and the, uh, which was indicating that the medication's possible therapeutic benefit, and also it reduces the risk associated with comorbidities. Uh, that is, the, the intervention related uh, from the preliminary data, we found that the twofold benefit have been reduced by dapagliflozin in patients who are having the comorbidities. Then further research is required to understand the safety and uh, further more efficacy of the medication. Uh, so the discussion from the preliminary results, effectiveness was understood from the uh, lower glycemic level, that is HbA1c level was drastically re uh, reduced and the better management of the DM was found. Then safety, uh, for some patients only the report, rare reports of UTI was seen, uh, for others uh, as most common the hypoglycemic effect was produced since they were on multiple OHGs and insulin was also given. Then cardiovascular benefits were shown as they have uh, the ejection fraction was drastically reduced. For some patients, we have observed that the ejection fraction, those who are having uh, the uh, severe ejection fraction that is uh, slow, uh, drastically reduced, they have been improved so that uh, making the patients uh, beneficial and the risk of CV death, that is cardiovascular death, have been reduced. Then weight loss was also observed in two, two to three patients that they have been, uh, when they, they're taking with other oral hypoglycemic agents, they have gained weight and while they have been given with JAPA, it has been uh, helpful for them to manage the weight. So the conclusion is that we have found positive outcomes, marking a significant stride in our study of JAPA reprocessing impact on type 2 diabetes patients with comorbidities. The improved glycemic control, that is the reduction of HbA1c, FBS, and RBS, suggested therapeutic promise. And also the added benefit of reducing the probability associated risk were also a multi advantage that we have found. Uh, yet, it's crucial to note that this study is ongoing with preliminary findings and continued research is essential for better understanding. And also the investigation lays down the groundwork of evaluating the outcome and apply of dapagliflozin in various uh, treatment strategies of the diabetes patients. Uh, so these are my uh, references I have been provided with. Thank you. Thank you. I request the session chairs to proceed with the questions.
sir do you have any questions sir okay we'll move on to the next person i call upon eknath to present his presentation Mr. Eknath, please present. Yeah, yeah. Wait, just. My slide is visible. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. Everyone. Today, I am going to present the poster on the title Fabrication of the Kytos and Dextron Nanoparticle Encapsulated with the Vildag Leptin by using the microreactor assisted synthesis followed by the spray drying for a treatment of diabetics. So, in this um, method, we have used the microfluidic techniques, I mean, the microreactor we have used in the microreactor. Basically, two solutions we have passed one solution containing the drug plus uh, stabilizer, and another solution containing the another for, uh, polymer. So, in the basic mechanism, the in encapsulation of the drugs is the um, complexation or the polyelectrode complex uh, with the cationic and anionic uh, polymer. So, we have chosen the dextran and chitosan as a polymer to encapsulate drug by, and we have used the method that is the um, micro reactor based uh, synthesis of the nanoparticles. Uh, here is a setup I have given in methodology, and we have uh, sonicated the samples by using for the 50 minute. And after that, we have passed through the uh, two channels one solution A and solution B. In solution A, uh, containing the uh, chitosan plus the vildagliptin, as well as the solution B containing the dextron sulfate. And that is passed through uh, with the constant flow rate. By using the constant flow rate, we can, give, uh, we can get the homogenized, homo homogenized particles in the uh, nano suspension. And that, that prepared nano suspension or the nanoparticles were um, characterized by using the various techniques. So first, uh, we have uh, determined the particle size by using the jitta uh, jitta uh, Sizer. So, and in that, uh, we have also used the design experimentation uh, by using the box bank and design for the optimization of the formulations. So on the basis of that, we have chosen the uh, one uh, six batch. I have not given the data of the box bank and design, but we have chosen the one optimized batch. From that optimized batch, we have uh, got the near about particle size is more uh, near about 200, uh, 210, and the uh, polydispersity index is a 0.2. Uh, 0 0.324 that is indicating the homogenized uh, formation of the particles as well as the uh, part, uh, jitta potential it is slightly negative so it will be giving the acceptable collateral stability of the formulation then also we have uh, analyzed the same uh, fsm of the spray dried nanoparticles uh, it has been uh, showing the spherical nanoparticles uh, and the particle size was uh, near about 100 nanometers uh, so that will be uh, spherical uh, uh, spherical uh, surface morphology of the nano, uh, spray dry nanoparticle. Also, we have analyzed the physical and uh, physical chemical properties. The, we have studied the FTIR, then the DSC, TGA, and the XRD. So DSC, TGA, we have uh, used for the determination of the stability as well as the crystallinity or the um, uh, whether the formulation is dimorphized or they're not. So on the basis of that, we have just uh, uh, taken the TGA, uh, TGA study. So as compared with the pure drug, the, our formulation as having the near about on the 550 uh, temperature. So near about 60 to 80% formulation has been lost their weight and uh, near about at, at the same range, pure drug has almost uh, exhausted. So that indicating that the complication of the polymers with the drugs, it indicating the enhanced stability. As well as the DSC, also it will be shifted the uh, that uh, peaks were shifted toward the higher range, so it indicating that the drug peak is not um, showing in the formulation. So it indicating that the encapsulation of the drug formulation in the uh, polymeric complex. As well as we can see the um, XRD study. In that XRD study, you may see the sp uh, spectra of the VLG. You can see the uh, intensity of the peak is higher as compared to. Uh, VLG nanoparticle or the spray dyed nanoparticle. It, it, it means it indicating the decrease in the intensity of the 
intensity of the drug peak it indicating that the drug has gone in the amorphized nature so it indicating it will be useful for the increase in solubility then uh, we have characterized the um, uh, characterized by using these methods also and the analyzed by the mtd assay as well as the their uh, glucose inhibition activity as well as the on um, their uh, mtd assay so this is all about uh, my presentation thank you sir yeah, please. i request the session chairs to proceed with the questions Sir, which type of cell line have you using, sir? L6 cell line we have used in that. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I once thank again you, remind so the participants that e-oral presentation is for 8 minutes and 2 minutes question answer and e-poster presentation is for 3 minutes and 2 minutes question answer. Now, I request the next person, Prasanjit, to come and present. Hello. Your Hello. posture is visible. You can start now. Am I audible? Yes, Hello. sir, you're audible. OK, thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, very warm good afternoon to all. Uh, myself, Dr. Prasenjit, and I am presenting one case report uh, in this uh, presentation. So it is titled Navigating Drug Hypersensitivity in Treatment Resistant Schizophrenia, a case study of close-up in induced reactions. Coming to the introduction of this study, as we know that hypersensitivity reaction to drugs are adverse reactions which cannot be predicted and it can occur within one to six hours after taking the drug in the form of symptoms which can be mild to life-threatening anaphylaxis. And there can be some delayed reactions which can be in the form of skin rashes. The hypersensitivity reactions can include fever, periorbital edema, and rashes. And in this case study, we will see about a drug that is called clozapine, which is an atypical antipsychotic drug used for treatment resistant schizophrenia. And it has led to several adverse drug reactions in the following case. Discussing about the case, its progression and treatment. So a 25 year old lady presented to the psychiatry OPD with symptoms of delusion of persecution, reference, auditory hallucinations, bipolar personality, and multiple suicidal attempts and she was started on tablet olanzapine 10 milligram half tablet od and tablet lithium carbonate 300 milligram one tablet od and it was being continued for one month that uh, and but there was no improvement in the symptoms and after that the patient was also started on tab olanzapine that is 20 milligram the dose was increased and the dose of lithium carbonate was increased to 300 milligram bd later on tap clonazepam that is 0 0.5 milligram was added but still there was no improvement in the symptoms so the patient was admitted in the psychiatry ipd and initially tablet olanzapine was increased till 30 milligram od but following that due to no response tablet haloperidol that is 5 milligram od was started and olanzapine was cross tapered and clonazepam was stopped Patient was also given modified electroconvulsive therapy sessions and after four sessions there was a plateau in the response and so finally the patient was started on tap clozapine that is 375 milligram OD and she was discharged when the symptoms resolved with tablet clozapine 200 milligram BD to be continued for the next few months. After the one month of the starting of the therapy with the clozapine, the patient presented to the dermatology OPD with adverse drug reaction, which was in the form of fever, swelling of eyelids, and pruritic rashes all over the body. And she was also having deranged liver function tests, that is AST value 598 international unit per liter, ALT 959 international unit per liter, ALP. 233 international unit per liter and that's the reason why the patient was later on admitted to dermatology ipd and the pruritic rashes fever eyelid swelling resolved completely after the withdrawal of the drug clozapine and the patient was also given injection dexamethasone that is 20 mil 2 milligram iv and tablet fexofenadine 180 milligram bd and it was been continued for eight days later on the patient was transferred to psychiatry ipd because of exacerbation of psychotic symptoms as the patient was not on any antipsychotics so she was again started on tab haloperidol 2.5 milligram and it was increased to 7.5 milligram 
Again, the patient developed uretic rashes all over the body and deranged LFT, for which haloperidol and lorazepam were withdrawn and tap prednisolone was started. And this adverse drug reaction was being reported and finally the rashes subsided and the patient is now on tablet haloperidol that is 5 milligram under the cover of steroids. So right now, because of the cover of the steroids, there is no hypersensitivity reaction which is observed and there is moderate control of the psychotic symptoms. Coming to the results of this study, the diagnosis was made clinically as the patient's condition improved significantly after the withdrawal of the drug that is uh, close up in and giving the counteracting drug that is injection dexamethasone IV 2 milligram and causality assessment was done according to WHO Uppsala monitoring scale and close up in was found to be a probable cause for this drug hypersensitivity reaction and according to modified Hartwig and severity Siegel severity assessment scale it was a moderately severe adverse drug reaction and uh, it was coming under the level four here you can see the patient is having the irid swelling and on the other uh, picture you can see there are periodic rashes which are seen all over the forehead and it was also present throughout the entire body coming to the discussion in the previous studies it was found that lozapin is associated with hypersensitivity reactions like myocarditis by an immune mechanism which might be the underlying mechanism in this case also so the immune mechanism which was observed was eosinophilia and this eosinophilia can be dose dependent that is it can occur more with higher doses of clozapine or other antipsychotics like haloperidol which will explain the causation of the adverse drug reaction in this case and as we know that following an immune reaction there is an immunological memory against the causative and the similar agents which explains the type for hypersensitivity reaction which occurred because of the administration of haloperidol after the administration of clozapine and finally coming to the cl uh, conclusion clozapine has led to the drug hypersensitivity reaction in this patient and it was ascertained by the causality assessment and there was cross reactivity which was seen between the different group of antipsychotics that is clozapine and haloperidol and these are the references which i have followed thank you thank you sir I request the session chairs to proceed with the questions. Sir, have you obtained uh, consent from the patient, sir? Uh, sorry, sir, I didn't get you. Sir. Consent, patient, the consent. Yes, 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 consent. yes, 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 yes. I have taken the written informed consent in both the vernacular language and also in English also. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, I call upon Ayman colleague to present his e-oral presentation. I request Ayman colleague to start his presentation. We will move on to the next person. I request 
Dr. Krishanish Das to present his presentation. Hello. Hello, hello, hello everyone. Uh, right now I'm sharing my uh, screen. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Hi, Ayman. You can present at last. Please wait. Uh, ma'am, I was trying, but I couldn't hear anyone at that time. Uh, there's no problem. You can just present at last. So please just wait for some more time. Okay. Sir, you can start, sir. Sir, you can start now, sir. Hello? Oh, is my screen is visible? No, sir. It's not visible. Okay. No, no. sir, it's not visible. Okay. Just just to... Is it visible now? No, sir. It's not visible. Just no, just... sir. It is not. It's not visible. Your screen is visible now, sir, but not yes. your no, okay, okay. Now is it visible? Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, 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 man. So. Hello everyone, I am Dr. Krishnashish Dash, academic junior resident at Ames Kalyani, and I am presenting a poster on the following topic, that is Unmasking Hidden Risks, a case report of QTC prolongation with simultaneous administration of clozapine and fluconazole. So here we say that uh, clozapine is actually an atypical antipsychotic which is renowned for its efficacy in treatment resistant schizophrenia. And also fluconazole is actually widely used as an antifungal agent they both carry their own therapeutic benefits. But when we administer them concurrently, then there is a risk for various uh, adverse cardiovascular side effects. And one of them is QTC interval prolongation. By this report, we actually are unmasking those hidden risks in this patient. So case progression and treatment, actually uh, in our case, there is a 23 year old male, Saurav Sarkar, who presented at Ames Kalyani OPD on 4th October, 2023, with symptoms of suspiciousness towards family members, suicidal tendencies, having thoughts of hands getting dirty, hearing multiple voices, and excessive uh, shaking, excessive washing of hands. So when uh, then we started on tablet clozapine, 400 mg once daily, tablet risperidone, 2 mg four times daily, and capsule fluoxetine, 40 mg once daily. Some symptoms did regress, but he complained of acidity, epigastric pain, and all, and after one month, we uh, started with tablet esomeprazole 40 mg. Again, after one month, there was uh, complaints of nausea and vomiting of the patient, and we started on tablet ondansetron 4 mg. Same treatment we continued, but the patient continued to have all those symptoms. And then ultimately, he complained of vomiting several times, loss of appetite, and he was admitted to psychiatry IBD on 25th January. We did upper GI endoscopy for this patient on 30th January and it revealed esophageal candidiasis. And for that reason, we started tap uh, fluconazole 200 mg once daily. And also, along with that, the previous medications uh, we gave with the same dose that is tap clozapine 400 mg, tap fluoxetine 40 mg, tap risperidone 8 mg, and then we also gave tap ondansetron 8 mg. Patient complaint of sudden onset chest pain and palpitations and ECG was being done. We found out the QTC interval to be 428 millisecond on 31st January. It raised to 447 on 1st February, 
454 on second and ultimately 474 was the value on 5th february fluconazole we withdrawn from 5th february and then it came to be 461 and ultimately on 8th february it was 456 so this is the qt prolongation uh, we are considering in our institution the normal qt interval in males to be less than 460 millisecond so it became significant on 5th february and then became normal that is 456 millisecond on 8th february so we discussed that uh, flu bo both these drugs fluconazole and clozapine can block outward potassium channel in the cardiac muscle actually there is a human ether a go go related gene hrg gene which is encoding for the pore forming subunit of the potassium channel so thus there is late potassium outflow which also delays the ventricular repolarization and it ultimately causes qtc prolongation fluconazole actually is an inhibitor of the uh, enzymes of the cytochrome family that is uh, uh, cyp3a4 cyp2c9 and cyp2c19 on the other hand clozapine is actually an enzyme inducer of the enzyme cyp1a2 cyp3a4 2c9 and 2c19 so here due to mutual interaction and inhibition of the those enzymes by clozapine by fluconazole administration ultimately clozapine's uh, concentration increased and as also both of the drugs can cause qtc prolongation so ultimately there was the uh, huge qtc interval which resulted also there may be also a possibility that fluoxetine is also an enzyme inhibitor so possibility of increased concentrations of clozapine and flu uh, risperidone due to enzyme inhibition by fluoxetine cannot be ruled out and uh, on the other hand prolonged use of clozapine may also alter the immune function disrupt mucosal barrier exert its anticholinergic side effects and by this it can cause esophageal dysmolality and thereby predisposing to various life threatening infections like esophageal candidiasis so this may be the cause that patient developed candidiasis we conclude that every clinician should exercise caution when co administering these types of drugs like clozapine and fluconazole together due to the potential for qtc prolongation and associated adverse cardiac effects close monitoring of qtc interval and consideration of alternative antifungal agents or dosagonists are always warranted in patients receiving concurrent therapy and then uh, we have taken uh, some of the references three of uh, us we have found out from various journals and in every uh, reference we have seen that there is clozapine fluconazole interaction may cause uh, prolongation of qtc interval uh, thank you uh, my dear teachers and seniors thank you very much thank you sir i request the session chairs to proceed with the questions my question is that uh, can it be generalized in your, uh, your opinion that uh, every patient can uh, have such kind of problem while co administering uh, both drugs uh, sorry sir just just please uh, can we repeat the question in 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 your opinion yeah, yeah. co administration of both the drugs can be yeah, yeah. Uh, generalized for all the patients means uh, whosoever is receiving these two drugs together so there is a chance of this qtc prolongation yes sir yes yes sir it can be it can be generalized in 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 maximum of the patients as per our search in different journals that uh, those drugs which are mutually inhibiting the enzymes of the metabolism of the other can cause the increased concentration and can even if if uh, they can also cause qtc prolongation so this can be generalized yes to some extent okay thank you sir thank you sir sir you have mentioned the patient name sir it's not acceptable sorry sir you have mentioned the patient name yes sir yes it's sir it's not acceptable sir it's acceptable yes sir i have taken a prior consent in both english and vernacular language so that's why okay, I... sir. yes sir well, thank you sir thank you sir next i call upon ayman colleague to present a presentation am i audible now ma'am yes you are audible okay. oh i hope my screen is visible to all 
Yes, it's visible. You can start now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my topic of today's presentation is comparative antimicrobial evaluation of synthetic drugs and essential oil against some human pathogenic bacteria and fungi. So before beginning the presentation, I would like to um, talk something about the normal human microflora. So there are some particular locations in our body where like scalp, nasal cavity, and mouth where these normal microflora coexist in a human body and they maintain a certain niche in a human body and form a protective barrier that curve the invasion of uh, certain pathogens and aid in digestion also. But uh, sometimes it happens that this normal uh, microflora can escalate the immune system and become pathogenic. Uh, like in the case of a weakened immune system uh, as an immunodeficiency. Uh, this could be due to malnutrition or chemotherapy or any trauma or surgery or due to intake of immunosuppressive drugs, AIDS and cancer or unhealthy lifestyle. So uh, we know that there are a whole lot of, lot of opportunistic pathogens, but this study would be clearly uh, discussing only a few bacterial and fungal pathogens like Staphylococcus aureus, uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Enterococcus faecalis, Mycobacterium smegmatis, uh, Malassezia furfur, Candida albi albicans, and they cause a whole va variety of infections like uh, abscesses, cellulitis, nosocomial infections, catheter-related bloodstream infections, infections of the obturated root canals or periodontitis, endocarditis also, and uh, dandruff-related dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, etc. So to fight off these infections, we mainly rely on antibiotics and antifungals that belong to different classes, like beta-lactams, aminoglycides, and glycopeptides that act on different parts of a bacterial cell to inhibit their growth. But uh, as a matter of fact, we can also uh, depend on some natural remedies like uh, the secondary metabolites of plants like essential oils, that are primarily composed of uh, terpenes and terpenoids uh, that have high antimicrobial uh, activity. And they are mainly derived from barks, uh, leaves, and seeds of the plant, and they are volatile in nature and protect the plants against diseases and their predators. Apart from that, uh, mm -hmm. they are also used in cosmetics, perfumes, and as an insect repellent or an aromatherapy, mm -hmm. also in foods and medicines. So uh, we know that today we have a very growing concern of antimicrobial resistance and these pathogens, they develop some strategies to, to become resistant to these antibiotics and antifungals, like uh, they modify the antibiotic or they modify the target itself, or they can also alter the cell permeability, or um, they may also develop some efflux pumps uh, to pump out the antibiotic. Uh, to uh, to combat these uh, problems or overcome this problem, we can use we can depend on essential oils uh, that can make the membrane permeable to the antibiotics. Um, that is, the drug resistance strain can also become drug sensitive. Also, they can inhibit some enzymes of the bacteria that degrade the antibiotic. So, in that case, also the bacterial cells uh, have some faulty enzymes and they become sensitive to the drug. Uh, another thing they can do is uh, they can inhibit the efflux pumps. Uh, by that, they can block uh, the antibodies from going out of the bacterial cells, or they can uh, cure the plasmid. That the uh, the plasmid that's carrying the resistance genes, they can just remove those, and then the uh, bacterial cell can be will become competent to these antibiotics. So the aims and objectives of my work are the isolation of uh, the pure culture, which was achieved by cordon seeding method. Then uh, the qualitative analysis of the antimicrobials achieved by uh, Agardus diffusion and the quantitative analysis of the antimicrobial, which was achieved by minimum inhibitory concentrations, minimum bactericidal or fungicidal concentrations. So these are my experimental requirements as listed some of the bacterial and fungal pathogens, uh, the antimicrobial drugs and the essential oils, the nutrient media and the volumes required for the diffusion and the MIC assay. So uh, these are the pictorial representation of the bacterial and the fungal um, uh, cordon streaking and with visible district colonies and the abbreviations are mentioned below. Uh, then for the diffusion assay, uh, we took a Newton agar for the bacteria and Saber or Dextroke agar for the for fungal. And following their respective incubation time and temperature, we got these results. And here we can see that penicillin was highly effective against S. aureus and also against Enstrococcus faecalis, um, and uh, followed by 
scanamycin and um, uh, followed by rifampicin and ampicillin. We can also see here that S. epidermidis was found resistant with penicillin and vancomycin and uh, uh, mycobacterium smegmatis was also found resistant towards penicillin and ampicillin. Similarly, for the antifungus, we saw that clotimizole was found to be highly effect, uh, effective as compared to amphotericin B. And with the essential oil, we saw uh, that... Uh, for the uh, essential oil, we saw that all of the essential oils were effective against all the tested uh, pathogens, even with the pathogen that were found resistant towards some antibiotics with lemongrass giving... Um, characteristic results. Uh, this is the graphical representation of the distribution assay. Here we can see that penicillin and amp ampicillin was found highly effective towards Staphylococcus aureus, while gentamicin, rifampicin, and canamycin was found to be effective uh, with all the tested pathogens. Uh, with the anti antifungals, we saw that clotrimazole was found higher, higher in comparison uh, with respect to inhibition as compared to amphotericin B. And with the essential oil, we saw that all of the essential oils were uh, effective to all of the tested pathogens to some degree, and even been effective to those pathogens that were resistant to some antibiotics. This is the pictorial representation of uh, the distribution assay, and these clear areas shows the zone of inhibition that were measured in millimeters. Uh, following that, uh, we did the minimum inhibitory concentration uh, following a two-fold dilution series with the concentration as mentioned below. And we saw uh, that uh, pelicinin was found very effective uh, with giving concentration of 0 0.9 microgram per ml of concentration. Similar results were found with rifampicin and ampicillin giving very low minimum inhibitory concentrations for all the tested pathogens. Uh, as compared to the essential oil, we saw that palmarosa and peppermint oil were found effective for all the pathogens as compared to lemongrass. So coming to the conclusion of my study, we could see that the, all the essential oils taken inhibited the growth of all the tested pathogens to some extent, contrary to few antibiotics that failed to suppress the uh, proliferation of some pathogens. Uh, in fact, that uh, lemongrass essential oil depicted the most favorable uh, results, giving distant zone of inhibitions for the majority of the tested pathogens while also being efficient towards the resistant pathogens. Uh, and smegmatis was found re resistance towards penicillin and ampicillin, but its growth was prominently in inhibited by lemongrass and peppermint essential oils. Similarly, was the case for uh, Staphylococcus embidermidis, although peppermint oil showed very low inhibition. And... Uh, there are additional research is necessary uh, to thoroughly assess the full potential of these investigated essential oils that could provide valuable insight for their more therapeutic potentials. These are my references. Thank you so much. Thank you. I request the session chairs to proceed with the questions. No question, ma'am. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next question. Professor Gangadhar Damale, please present your presentation.
सर प्लीज स्टार्ट सर Okay, next I call upon Neha Singh to present her e-poster. Okay. Ma'am, please start, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I uh, share my screen. Okay, ma'am. There is some error actually. Just Ma'am, if you're having issues, we can move on to the next person and you can present after them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Actually, there is some issue. Okay, ma'am. Next, I call upon Dr. Ramani to present an e-oral presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you, ma'am. Shall I share my screen, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Please start. Yes, ma'am. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Your screen is visible, but your PPT is not yet open, I think. Now? No, ma'am. I'm sharing, ma'am. Um, can you stop sharing and then start sharing again? I think there's okay, some issues. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am.
now it is open ma'am no ma'am i think it is loading we'll give it a minute It's loading, ma'am. No, ma'am, it's not visible, ma'am. Have you selected your PPT, ma'am? In screen sharing, there will be an option yes, to select yes, your PPT. Share my screen. I'm sharing, ma'am. Mm. Now you can see, ma'am. No, ma'am. I can only your files ma'am I can see your files but I cannot see your PPT ma'am participant can now see your PPT is coming, ma'am. I will check with the host to see if there is any issues on our side, ma'am. Please wait. Okay, ma'am. First, open the PPT. Next, sharing the screen. Yes, sir. I opened the PPT, sir. Already I opened the PPT, sir. Okay. The screen is loading. Now, is it visible, ma'am? Sir, is it visible, sir? Wait, 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 wait. It's not visible, ma'am. But my screen is your screen sharing. The screen is there, but I think that your system has got hanged. Is it visible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Okay, you can start. Okay, ma'am. Myself, Dr. M. Ramani. My topic is molecular screening of acinetum heterophyllum identifies potential inhibitors of typhoid, typhoid fever, target typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase. Introduction Typhoid fever is a gram negative bacterial infection caused by the bacterium called Salmonella typhi, a rod like shaped pathogen. Salmonella typhi is both food borne and water borne pathogen. Developing nations exhibit a higher incidence of typhoid fever as a result of inadequate sanitation practices and incorrect use of antibiotics, hence fostering the emergence of drug resistance in the microorganism known as bacteria salmonella typhi. The enzyme typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase plays a crucial role in the biosyn biosynthesis of aromatic amino acids, particularly in the shigimate pathway. The shigimate pathway is accountable for the biosynthesis of aromatic amino acids namely tyrosine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. The enzyme known as typhoid 1,3-dehydroquinate dehydratase facilitates the biochemical reaction in which 5-dehydroquinate is transformed into 3-dehydroshigimate, the process described in a crucial stage in the production of aromatic amino acids. In the context of salmonella type B, drug development lies in the disruption of the shigimate pathway, which is absent in human. This characteristic renders the pathway a selective target for antibacterial drug binding of phytocomponents with the 
core amino acid tested in 143 and lysine 170 of the target typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase by forming hydrogen bond will hinder the function of the enzyme and thereby inhibits the biosynthesis of aromatic amino acid essential for the survival of the pathogen cellular type B. Thereby, phytoconference which inhibit the target typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase may act as a potential therapeutic agent for the management of typhoid infection. Aim and objective, the present study, we retrieved three bioactive compounds such as aconitine, anthurine, anthurine and hippaconitine, which inhibit the target enzyme typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase, may act as a potential therapeutic agent for the management of typhoid fever. This is the materials and methods. The herb, these are all the phytocomponents selected for docking, aconitine, anthurine and hippaconitine. This is the reference. 3D structure of the typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase, PDB. 1GQN, this is the receptor structure, protein data well, 1GQN, typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase, crystalline structure of the target protein, typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase was retrieved from protein data bank and protein cleanup process was done and essential missing hydrogen atoms were being added. Different orientation of the lead molecules with respect to the target protein was evaluated by autoduct program. Best dog post was selected based on the interaction study analysis, protein preparation, and the ligand preparation. Three-dimensional protein structure of the target protein, typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase with protein data bank 1GQN were retrieved from the online repository of protein data bank and subjected to protein cleanup prior to docking simulation and ligand preparation. Phytochemicals subjected to the investigation were retrieved from aconitum heterophyllum, which is in Tamil, Adividayam, listed in the table based on the literature survey and 3D structure of the same were built using ChemDraw proof online tool version 12.0, ligand prepared through geometry optimization method, MMFF 94, the materials and methods, docking calculations were carried out for retrieved phytochemical, phytocomponents against target protein, essential hydrogen atom, Coleman united atom type charges and solvation parameters were added with the aid of autoduct tool. Affinity, MAP 60, multiple 60, multiple 60, Armstrong grid point and 0.375 Armstrong spacing were generated using the autoduct program. Autoduct parameters set the distance dependent dielectric functions were used in the calculation, van der Waals and the electrostatic terms respectively. Docking simulations were performed using the Lamarckian genetic algorithm uh, and the solis and wet local search method, initial position, orientation and torsion of the ligand molecule were set randomly. All the rotation, rotatable torsions were released during the docking. Each docking experiment, experiment was derived from two different runs that were set to terminate after a maximum 2,50,000 energy evaluation. The population size was set to 150. During the search, translational setup 0.2 Armstrong and quaternion and torsion sets were 5 were applied. This is the 2D and 3D structure of the phytocomponents. Ligand through 2D, aconitine and 3D, anthurine and hippaconitine. Docking post, aconitine with typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase, PDB, 1GQN. This is the uh, docking post of the aconitine. 2D interaction plot analysis and hydrogen, hydrogen 1 plotting with core amino acid analysis. This is the docking post of anthurine and 2D interaction plot analysis and hydrogen bond plotting core with, with core amino acid analysis. This is the docking course of hippaconitin with the typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase PDB 1GQN and 2D interaction plot analysis and hydrogen bond plotting with core amino acid analysis. Um, aconitin, rotatable bonds, we are, we are getting 11 and anthurin, we get nil and hippaconitin, we got 10 rotatable bonds and molecular weight, aconitin 645.7 gram per mole, anthurin 343.5 gram per mole and hippaconitin 615.7 gram per mole. Molecular formula C34, H47, NO11 and anthurin C22, H33, NO2, hippaconitin C33, H45, NO12. These are all the rotatable bonds and this is the compounds. Summary, this is the interactions with the 
four amino acid residues, aconitine two interactions, and anthurin two, and hippoconitin two interactions. Results total three bioactive lead compounds were retrieved from aconitum heterophyllum, means uh, in Tamil, Adividayam, which the phytochemicals such as aconitin, anthurin, and hippoconitin possess maximum interactions with the core am active amino acid residues present at the target, typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase. Conclusion, based on the re results of the computational analysis, it was concluded that bioactive compounds like aconitin, anthurin, and hippoconitin significant binding affinity against the target typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase by interacting with the active amino acid present on the active site. Thereby, it was concluded that these compounds may inhibit biosynthesis of aromatic amino acids essential for the survival of the pathogens. Salmonella typhi, thereby phytocomponents which inhibit the target typhoid 13 dehydroquinate dehydratase may act as a potential therapeutic agent for the management of typhoid infection. This is the reference. Thank you for giving this opportunity for BioLeaks and International Conference uh, APR. Thank you for giving this opportunity. opportunity. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I request the session chairs to ask questions. Madam, in which basis have uh, you selected three constituents only for this typing study? According to the literature review, sir. According to mm -hmm. the literature review, this is the potential phytochemical components. Acoritin, anthurin, and hippocoritin. This is the reference. Paramanic Pande. The reference phytochemicals I have selected, ma'am. Selected, sir. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Next, I call Dr. Manoj to present his e-oral presentation. My screen is visible, ma'am. Can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so good, good afternoon all. Uh, today I am going to present my study on uh, topic preparation, biological evolution and her of herbal mouthwash against oral infection. So mouthwash uh, generally uh, it is an uh, aqueous solution or it, uh, alcoholic solution of a uh, certain uh, synthetic chemical. Uh, which is used for the prevention or the cure of oral uh, pathogen or oral infection. In herbal mouthwash, we generally prepare a natural extract uh, which is uh, prepared from the plant uh, sources and it is mostly been used to uh, get the rid of dental infection, dental uh, abscess and uh, certain type of an other oral uh, diseases and nearly about every year 3.5 billion people are suffering from oral infection. So what are the objective of our study? Our uh, object, first objective is to compare and analyze the antimicrobial efficacy of commercially available synthetic formulation and newly formulated herbal mouthwash after using for some days. The next objective to signify whether the novel herbal combination would be a better alternative mouthwash for commercially available synthetic formulation or not. Then uh, for that, we have formulated the uh, formulation for uh, mouthwash preparation. So these are the ingredients for uh, preparation. Uh, then we have prepared the aqueous solution of uh, uh, aqueous solution uh, of the mouthwash by using these uh, formulated chemi uh, herbal formulas. And then uh, this is the uh, preparation what we have been prepared. Then uh, we have evaluated this particular uh, formulation for various kind of tests like physical, physical evolution we have done in order to taste the color, odor, taste and consider, uh, consistency. Then we also have uh, determined the pH of the uh, formulation and we have uh, got an idea that the pH is in between 6 to 8. Then we have compared the antimicrobial activity of this particular formulation against the gram positive and gram negative uh, uh, bacterial species and we have used a uh, standard as an history. So these are the result of antimicrobial assay. So uh, uh, what you can see that uh, it has a very good kind of an efficiency or uh, antimicrobial activity against uh, both gram positive and gram negative bacterial species. 
then uh, we have done the stability study of this particular herbal formulation at ph uh, at uh, temperature 3 to 5 degrees celsius where we have checked for uh, visual appearance phase separation and homogeneity and we have got very good result further we have increased the temperature at 25 degrees celsius, uh, celsius with the relative humidity about around th uh, around 60 and we again have tested for visual appearance phase separation and homogeneity so we have got the consistent the same, as that of an uh, earlier uh, temperature then we have further sir? increased that yes sir your slide is not moving sir they are moving, sir. Hello. First slide only showing, sir. Uh, actually, it is moving, sir. I am, I am, I am uh, moving them. Now it is moving, sir. It is moving, sir. Now. Hello. Yes, it's moving now. Yes, okay. sir. It's moving, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, okay, okay sir. Sir. thank you, thank you. So these are the results uh, where uh, we have again been tested for uh, 40 degrees Celsius with the relative humidity around 75%. Again, we have tested for uh, visual appearance, phase separation and homogeneity. So we have got a consistent result or like what result we have got around 3 to 5 degrees Celsius, uh, 25 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius as well. So these are the conclusion of our, our study that what are the formulation we have been uh, for formulated and we have been tried. It is uh, therapeutically efficacious uh, and it has a low cost and has a very good kind of an uh, potential. And it does not have an uh, kind of an uh, unwanted or undesired effect as that of an commercially available uh, formulation like it does not have a bad taste. It does not have any kind of an stain uh, causing efficiency or uh, it does not cause an uh, you can say alteration in the taste or the dryness of the mouth. mouth. So uh, what the formulation we have been uh, prepared over here, it is a very good kind of an formulation and it can be an alternative for a synthetically available commercial formulation in the market. So these are the selected references of our study. So this is all about my presentation. Thank you, thank you, madam, and thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I request the session charge to proceed with the questions. Oh, question. Okay, sir. Next, okay. I call upon Neha Singh to present a presentation. Okay. Uh, now, uh, my presentation is visible. Yes, ma'am, it's visible. You can start. Okay. Good afternoon, all of you. And uh, my name is Neha I have uh, present a poster presentation on the topic of development of lipid based nanoparticles for improvement of breast cancer therapy by target targeting CD44 receptors. In my uh, in my research, we have uh, created lipid based nanoparticles and uh, which are novel self-assembled system that functions as a complementary drug loaded delivery. Firstly, we uh, non-targeted system used to create a pH responsive, pH re uh, responsive environment in which lipid polymer conjugated with the targeted system that was used to modify the surface of lipid based nanoparticles to target CD44 receptor and we achieve a self-assembled system. Uh, following the encapsulation of anti-cancer drug in this lipid based nanoparticle, we had a strong effect that result in depolarization of the mitochondrial membrane potential as seen as shown in my uh, poster. Uh, <coughs> EFM, SEM and, and other uh, Im images are shown the pH responsive system that is polymer conjugated with targeting successfully. This polymer encapsulated drug release system manifests a pivotal attributes pH responsive drug release and also shows the SEM, uh, SEM proved the changes in the morphology of the CD uh, tubosome. In vitro targeting formulations show cytotoxicity and a higher degree of apoptosis. The enhanced cellular uptake was noted targeting formulation compared to the free drug. Uh, apart from this, uh, the cubosomes were prepared by a mixing excess solutions of pitentriol with the anti-cancer drug incorporation and stabilizer and heated at 70 degrees Celsius temperature and incubation for 30 minutes. For this polymer, excess solution was added. The mixture was solicited for 5 minutes. The resulting milky dispersion was kept at room temperature for the subsequent analysis and for stabilization. 
After this, these chromosomes further in further enhance the therapeutic potential of this strategy. When combined with CD44 targeting the cells, it establishes a robust and promising foundation for advancing breast cancer treatment. These findings also enhance and highlight the potential for an exceptionally effective and precise therapeutic approaches with far-reaching implications for future breast cancer researches and development of therapy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alakshmi. Thank you, ma'am. I request the session yes, chat yes. to ask for questions. No question. Okay, sir. Next, I call Navjit Kaur to present the e-poster, e-oral presentation. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, screen is visible? No, ma'am. Mm Uh, now, ma'am? Yes, it's visible now. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Navjeet Kaur. So, today, my topic for the presentation is a mini review on the phytochemistry and antidepressant activities of the plant Habenaria intermedia. In Ayurveda, it is known as Riddhi. So, I'll start my presentation with a quote Let's herbs are the healing warmth of the nature. So we should know this. So these are the contents. So let's start with the introduction. The world's number one factor contributing to mental health related disability is depression, a serious global mental health issue. When depression first appears, it often happens in mid to late adolescence between the ages of 14 and 25, with a median 20 month prevalence of 4 to 5%. Major depressive disorder has a negative impact on relationship, career, education, and is potentially linked to premature death, including suicide, obesity, and cardiac illness. When physical health issues are comorbid with depression in person over the age of 18, the functional impacts of depression can be more severe, complicating treatment Some options. Jo, question hai, so here are the uh, causes of the depression. So genetic, there are falling factors, genetic environment, stress, trauma, childhood difficulties, synthetic chemicals, noise pollution, electrical pollution, natural catastrophic disasters. So let's talk about the genetic depression. So in this kind of depression, variations occur at the DNA level, which alter the expression and or functioning. Uh, yes, sir. Your slide is not changing, ma'am. Uh, now it's changing, ma'am? No, ma'am. We can only see your first slide. Okay. But here I'm... Just a moment. Madam, your slide is... Uh, now it's moving, ma'am? No, ma'am. Maybe you can stop sharing and start sharing it again. Okay, sure. sure. Now it's I'll moving. It now it's moving? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now it's moving. Okay, okay. So, uh, genetic depression. Uh, in this kind of depression, variation occur at uh, genetic level or we can say in a DNA level, which alter the expression or the functioning of the gene product. And where environmental reason of the depression can be the sociological or psychological factors. And stress, it is a big issue. This is a complex, there is a complex relationship between stressful conditions and the person's attitude to combat the stress. 
then we have trauma or traumatic events which includes like loss of loved one a serious medical illness the end of the marriage or um financial loss childhood difficulties in comprises of most common childhood difficulties like emotional physical abuse dysfunctional upbringing etc synthetic chemicals include like major depressive dip episodes which occurs due to intake of some synthetic chemicals then noise pollution can be the major cause of depression noise pollution has been correlated to aggression hypertension hearing loss disruption in sleeps and we have electrical pollution these pollution is mainly due to the radio waves which are generated due to daily usage of gadgets electrical equipment and the natural disasters like earthquakes hurricanes etc they can also causes depression so uh, we have studied uh, various herbs as uh, as i told before my start my presentation herbs are the healing balms of the nature so herbs as antidepressant during the past years or past decades major challenges to understand the pathophysiology of depression studies mostly concentrate on more advanced and effective pharmacological therapies there are several medications available to treat depression however clinical examination of these medications have revealed the relapse rate rates adverse effects drug interactions so this has served as a justification for the creation of new antidepressant plant based including herbal remedies the therapeutic chemicals used to treat many illness including depression have been derived from indian medicinal plants and their derivatives due to their perceived safety potency and natural status herbal products are frequently used so ayurvedic herbal remedies have been subject of more investigation recently because it is known that they are helpful in treating the conditions for which they have historically been used all traditional system of medicine including siddha yunani ayurveda homeopathy so they all use herbal medicines to cure various ailments so review of literature plant review according to botany this plant that is herbinaria intermedia in ayurveda it is known as riddhi is a member of orchidaceae family the natural environment of the riddhi himalayan region and these himalayan ranges are irreplaceable treasure of medicinal plants according to ayurveda pharmacopoeia So, herbin area intermedia. It is a uh, also known as ridi, and it is found in Himalayan mountain regions. Geographical. This is the geographical status. Pakistan, Bhutan, Nepal. It is found in these places. Researchers have discovered that this plant contains flavonoids, tannins, steroids, and cumarin glycosides due to the presence of phenolic compounds. on the polyphenols like isoflavones flavonoids including hydroxyl benzoic acid and gallic acid these species looks to be substantial source of antioxidants consequently offering a strong anti free radical action or simply we can say it has antioxidant potential so this plant is also used as a tonic aphrodisiac depressive anthelmintic leprosy asthma and skin various skin conditions and it is the chief ingredient of a marketed formulation that is chaman prash So this is also a uh, popular polyherbal rejuvenator due to its rejuvenating effect it has been utilized traditionally in various herbal treatments from its rejuvenated effect we can say that it can be used for depression as well according to botany this plant is known as herbinaria intermedia and is a member of orchidaceae family and ayurvedic name is its riddhi chemical constituent it is it belongs to a Uh, uh, isoflavonoid category and uh, basically it contain phenanthrene flavone sterols thiamine tannins calcium and all are present in a significant amount so despite the fact that herbinaria species are traditionally used to cure various elements due to its therapeutic efficacy so in my research i have found why i have selected this because it is widely distributed throughout the himalayan regions So traditionally, the tubers of the plant has been used in the treatment of asthma, cold, fever, nervous, and skin disorders. Though very few studies have been shown anti-stress, hepatoprotective, and immunomodulatory activities of the plant, but these studies are too preliminary to justify its traditional claims. Now, a survey of literature revealed that no systematic pharmacological and phytochemical work have been carried out on this plant. so i have studied about this plant due to its antioxidant potency so the antidepressant activity is yet to be confirmed thus sorry 
thus it was considered worthwhile to screen antidepressant of activity of this plant therefore systematic research is needed on this plant to validate their traditional claims especially for antidepressant activity and to isolate their bioactive constituents responsible for antidepressant action so here are the references thank you thank you ma'am do the session chairs have any questions no question ma'am Thank okay, you sir. so much, ma'am. Thank you. Th thank you, ma'am. Next, I call upon Namami Dutt to present the presentation. Namami that can you present now? Okay, we'll move on to the next person. Next, I call upon Ruby Christian to present the e oral presentation. Ruby Christian, can you present your presentation now? Moving on to the next person, I call Shubham Paul to present the e oral presentation. I request Shubham Paul to present his presentation. Is there anyone ready to present next? Hello, ma'am. Uh, Ruby Christian here. Yes, ma'am. Please start. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, is the screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, shall I start? Yes, ma'am, you can start. Uh, good afternoon, one and all present over here. Uh, I'm going to present a report on the study of antimicrobial peptide along with antibiotic against the pathogenic microorganism. Now, as we all know that the world is looming with the problem of antimicrobial resistance with over 73.4% of death accounted due to antimicrobial resistance every year. It has become a global threat and more than 10 million deaths have been accounted by UK government uh, in the year of, it has been predicted for the year of 2050. Uh, it seems like uh, we are again going back to a human era where we would lose life even with the simplest of the uh, diseases that we have uh, we are contacting so uh, if we go dive deeper into the reasons of this antimicrobial resistance it has been found that uh, biofilm formation has been one of the key player which is preventing the antibiotics to enter into the cells and thereby uh, causing an antimicrobial resistance several mechanisms have been reported for it which includes uh, prevention of antibiotic penetration uh, uh, certain enzymes 
which is a great antibiotic presence of dna in the biofilm matrix which allow antibiotics to enter presence of e flux form and multi species interaction that is polymicrobial biofilm formation all these things are all these reasons are the key important reasons due to which the uh, antibiotic cannot penetrate into the cells and thereby the efficacy of antibiotics are, is reducing uh we are working on the antimicrobial peptide which are derived from the microorganism itself they are termed as lengthy peptides and if lengthy peptides possess antimicrobial activity we call them as lengthy biotics uh we have worked on the compound which is nisin uh it since 1969 nisin has been used as a food preservative uh it is consisting of 34 amino acid and it has been granted the status of grass the key important factor here to notice there has been no reported toxicity of the nisin uh, also nisin is known to penetrate the biofilm which is one of the main culprit why antimicrobial resistant is developing uh, so if we look uh, there is so many diseases which relapse or recurs because of the failure of the antibiotic so if we use nisin along with the antibiotic we can prevent the relapse and recurrence of the disease uh, it will be able to penetrate into the biofilm uh conventional antibiotics that we are using for second third generation they are not able to penetrate the biofilm nisin is been known to act against both gram positive and gram negative organism <laughs> and looking at all this uh key factors which are pertaining to the nisin we have used nisin along with the antibiotics to see whether it will be effective against the uh selected pathogenic microorganism or not uh, there are so many research article which support the evidence of nisin uh, that it is causing pore formation by altering the ph it is also causing hydrolysis of the atp due to which it inhibits the biofilm formation hence uh, here uh, since antibiotic is very some side effect of antimicrobial therapy drug resistance is developing uh, our focus is our research focus is to use nisin along with the conventionally available antibiotics and see whether they are effective or not whether they are giving synergistic effect or not so uh, this is how we have proceeded our work first of all it starts with selection of an antibiotic then selection of an antimicrobial peptide that i have already discussed nisin we have selected uh, we have checked the compatibility of our antibiotic by using dsc and ftir spectra the efficacy of antibiotic alone as long with n nisin has been tested against the pathogenic microorganism and checkered board assay was run to find out the fractional inhibitory concentration and to see whether the effect is synergistic or not <laughs> the ftr spectra of uh, pure drug that is metronidazole tinidazole and nisin has been stated over here uh, by uh, going for the combination that is mixture of metronidazole and nisin and tinidazole and nisin uh, here the ftr spectra reveals that all the characteristic peak of metronidazole and tinidazole has been retained over here and there is no incompatibility between the nisin and antimicrobial peptide similarly dsc spectra shows the same result where we have dsc of metronidazole and tinidazole and nisin and here you can see with their physical mixture the peak is still intact hence combining our antimicrobial peptide with the <laughs> uh antibiotic it is not causing any of the uh, degradation or diminishing of any of the pick hence we can say that both of these compounds are compatible with each other uh initially we need to uh, we tested the efficacy of our samples uh with the gram positive and negative microorganism the gram positive microorganism that was selected was s aureus and gram negative it was s typhi both are pathogenic in nature uh we total tested six samples which included first the sample of nisin second was food grade nisin because there is so much difference in the price of a purified extracted nisin and the food grade nisin the third sample was metronidazole alone fourth was tinidazole alone fifth and sixth were combination of the drug with the uh, nisin uh, we tested it against the standard that is streptomycin according to the procedure which was developed in our lab <laughs> according to the zone of inhibition study here it can be stated that uh, if we see the combination that is s5 was combination of metronidazole with nisin and x6 was combination of tinidazole with nisin we got a higher potency that is 67 to 75 which is higher than the uh, drug compound alone which indicates that if we use two of the compounds together we might be getting a synergistic effect this was a resulting case of gram positive organism that is tepilococcus aureus 
uh, if we compare this results with the gram negative microorganism sure the pure compounds that is metronidazole and nisin were not able to give any results in case of gram negative with the tinidazole we did obtain a zone of inhibition and percentage potency of 28.35 percent but if we see the combination yes uh, if there was no, uh, in case of uh, metronidazole, there was no potency alone, but uh, along with the nisin, the potency rose, uh, uh, has risen to 42%. Hence, uh, this preliminary screening study stated that if we use nisin along with the antibiotic, it might give some promising results. Uh, keeping as base uh, this uh, research uh, results that we uh, received, we proceeded for the checkerboard assay <laughs> uh, using 96 values place where we tested the antibiotic alone for its MIC and then antibiotic in combination with the nisin to see whether there is any decrease in the MIC value or not. Uh, the results obtained are as follow. Here you can see that nisin has an MIC of 125 microgram per ml for S aureus and 250 microgram per ml for S type C. Food grain nisin surprisingly had a lower MIC value uh, than the purified extracted nisin. Uh, it is reported that nation shows a promising activity uh, when EDTA is used in case of gram-negative microorganism. Hence, we tested the combination of nation also with the EDTA. Here you can see that MIC value was 500 millimole for gram positive and 1000 millimole for gram negative. Uh, the interesting thing to observe over here is metronidazole has an MIC of 4 microgram, whereas tinidazole has an MIC of 0.25 microgram in case of gram negative microorganism. Once we established this MIC value, we were interested to find out that how would our drug perform in presence of the uh, nisin. Hence, uh, next we opted for the checkered board assay, and the results were quite interesting. Here you can see MIC of A. Here the value A is basically missing. B is EDTA. So first we tested that how much EDTA would actually be required to give a synergistic effect. And you could see that instead of 500 and 1000 millimole for positive and negative, the value reduced to 250 uh, millimole. Hence we can say that 250 millimole would have a, a additive effect, synergistic effect on the uh, value on the MIC values. Similarly, we tested the combination of nisin with various antibiotics. So here you can see that nisin plus antibiotic, the MIC of A, which was initially 62.5, it reduced to 31.5. Similarly, for food grade nisin, which was 31.5, it reduced to 15.75. So if we compare these results, we found out that for all the combination of nisin with the antibiotic, the activity was synergistic because the FIC value was found to be between uh, less than 0.5. Hence, we got a synergistic effect for all the combination of nisin with uh, metronidazole as well as tinidazole. Uh, tinidazole was found to have a, a better result compared to a metronidazole if we go for the comparison of an antibiotic. On the contrast, this was the result for gram-positive microorganism. For gram-negative microorganism, here you can see that uh, we did get a reduction in the MIC value, which was initially uh, 62 and 31. Instead, we got a 31 and 15, that is two-fold reduction in MIC was observed. However, upon calculation, it was observed that the results are additive instead of synergistic. So in case of gram positive, we observed a synergistic effect of our nisin with the antibiotic, whereas in case of gram negative, the results were additive instead of uh, synergistic. Uh, however, um, if we do an overall comparison, an additive effect is still better than having no effect. Uh, there has yet been no study uh, where uh, nisin has been explored with the anti -micro, uh, antibiotics. Uh, since no new antibiotics are there in the pipeline, combining nisin with the available antibiotic would actually open up a new genre of antibiotic where we would be able to prevent the antimicrobial resistance. This is a preliminary study which has provided us with the good results and based on this result we would actually proceed further for the uh, more antibiotic screening and more susceptibility testing. Overall conclusion, nisin and EDTA was found to have an additive effect that is twofold reduction in MIC was observed. Combination of nisin with metronidazole and tinidazole has synergistic effect in case of gram positive as we stated earlier whereas it has additive effect for gram negative microorganism. MIC value for the tinidazole tested drug was lowered compared to metronidazole. Hence, a significant improvement was observed in the individual effect of an antibiotic when it was combined with nisin. There is possibility to explore this combination. 
Uh, as a result, we would be publishing our preliminary study in a journal of repute. The work has already been started. Uh, uh, since we have observed a positive finding, we will now test our antimicrobial peptide for the actual biofilm inhibition study and disruption study, and we would be applying for the uh, grant. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I request the session chairs to ask, <clears throat> ask questions. Ma'am, why have you choosing two organisms only? Uh, actually, sir, we have limitation of fund right now. We want to explore our study to different organism. Work has already been started, but uh, up, uh, it is in progress. But right now, we have only completed work with two microorganisms, which is we are still exploring number of microorganisms to get a more concrete result. Okay, good, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next, I call upon Sakshar Saha to present the e oral presentation. Mr. Sakshar Saha, are you able to present it now? Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible, sir. Uh, just a second. Uh, am I still audible? Hello? Yes, you are audible, sir. Hello. You are audible, Hello. sir. Hello. Hello, I'm audible. I can't hear. Uh, you are audible, Hello, am I audible? I can't hear anything. Share your presentations. Share your screen. Hello. Sir, share your yes. screen. Audible? Yes, sir. Am I audible to you? Because I cannot hear. Hello. Audible, audible, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Now I can hear sharing the screen. Uh, sir, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Please let me know if I'm not audible any of the time because I'm having a little bit of uh, internet issue. So please do let me know if somehow I'm not audible in any time of my presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for waiting for me. Uh, I've had some little bit internet and technical issues. So that's why I was late. So I'm just presenting. So a uh, very good afternoon to all in all present over here. Uh, myself, Sakshar Saha, I'm the research scholar of Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, GIS University, West Bengal, India, would like to present the topic of my presentation, that is exploration of antioxidant and antimicrobial efficacy, coupled with quantitative analysis of diverse phytoconstituent utilizing GCMS and HPTLC of the methanolic extract derived from Raffina sativa's foliage. So uh, I would like to go with the introduction. So basically, as we know that at present time, our uh, society is moving towards herbal medication because herbal medicine, herbal medicine is having an advantage of having a synergistic effect. Because an herbal extract, 
because an herbal extract is having multiple phyto constituent and combining those together all of those phyto constituent which we can get from a herbal extract herbal formulation which can have a synergistic effect additional effect super additive effect on our degenerative disorder so right now we know that um, diabetes we, uh, arthritis uh, alzheimer that kind of a degenerative disorder that is a chronic degenerative disorder which has um a very uh, good big impact on our society at this point of time so that is the reason i have focused on the herbal drug herbal source of a medicine where i could find different phytoconstituent to combat various diseases so my objective of my work to identify the preliminary secondary metabolites to study the antioxidant potential using various in vitro methods to identify the volatile compounds which are present in the crude drug of mine to identify the flavonoids and to evaluate the antimicrobial potential against various gram stain bacteria and i have also focused on some antibiotic resistant bacteria as well which are multi drug resistant so i have collected the plant uh, r sativus that is raffanus sativus of uh, in the month of august 2022 from the village of murshidabad it's in west bengal india the uh, the plant has been authenticated whether it is real or not authenticated by the botanical survey of india and they have given the authentication number uh, i have given here i have done the extraction process of my plant using the maceration method using methanol as a solvent we have used methanol because uh, methanol can extract out the polar and non polar both of the compound and we have done a very small study so i have sh i haven't shown here that methanol and ethanolic extract we have performed and we have found out the methanolic extract had a higher level of extractive values so i could get the high level of crude extract by the methanol maceration we have evaporated the solvent using the rotor evaporator but kept the temperature uh, at uh, 55 to 65 degree centigrade because 64.7 is the uh, boiling point for methanol so we could not increase the temperature more than that we have done some phytochemical screening that's a uh, screening of secondary metabolites what we have found out we have found out flavonoids cardiac glycoside anthraquinone glycoside and steroidal compound but we could not find tannin alkaloids polysaccharides and saponin by the preliminary secondary metabolite test we have performed the thin layer chromatography test so thin layer chromatography which is we know we all know that is based on the principle of a uh, solid uh, liquid uh, sorry partition coefficient that if the molecule i have used uh, the um, solvent system chloroform ethyl acetate and formic acid and what we have found out uh, we have found out the uh, rf value uh, refractive uh, value of um, we have compared it with the reference standard and what we have found out we have found out camphorol epigenin chlorogenic acid and caffeic acid which we could match with the uh, reference standard by the tlc method and we have seen the tlc plates under uh, lower nanometer lower uh, wavelength that is 254 nanometer higher wavelength that is 366 and the visible light what we have done we have done a preliminary uh, another screening it's a extra method of screening it is called chemical derivatization uh, which is named uh, i have named it a bio autograph analysis a very unique technique by which as we know that the uh, TLC slides have separated the uh, the various phyto constituent like I have seen camphorol, epigenin, chlorogenic acid. So what we did, we have sprayed in the TLC slide anisaldehyde sulfuric acid. It is called chemical derivatization, and it has shown some uh, uh, reddish and violet color band uh, band as per the literature survey. upon spray, uh, spraying this chemical and anisaldehyde and sulfuric acid if it is showing this kind of band under white light that is a visible light and 366 nanometer that means it has got polyphenolic groups having a polyphenolic group a uh, kind of um, proof that it is very much rich in antioxidant we have done the hptlc analysis of flavonoids where we have used 12 standard i haven't mentioned the standard because of the short of the space 
in the HPTLC analysis, the benefit of HPTLC analysis, we all know that we could quantify the compound, where in the TLC, we could not quantify like how much amount is present. So here in the HPTLC analysis, uh, S4 in this graph, in this graph, S4 stands for my extract. I have coded by S4. So um, in my extract, we have compared with with the standard obviously we have found out chlorogenic acid camphorol caffeic acid but the concentration of chlorogenic acid was higher that is 2.29 microgram per liter and um, that's a very much promising result to have a high amount of chlorogenic acid in my extract we have done HPTLC analysis of amino acid because we know at least in our bengal and uh, in all over the india i feel that uh, the leaves of raffinus sativus because we do eat the raffinus sativus as fruit we also do eat here the raffinus sativus leaves as well so as we are eating so to know the uh, the you know the nutritional value so that's why we have identified the amino acid profiling so in the amino acid profiling we have used 20 amino acids among which my plant extract has got three amino acid l glutamic acid l histidine and l tyrosine among these three, we have got the uh, L-glutamic acid as the higher concentration. That is also a very promising result. We have done the GCMS analysis, that is gas chromatography mass spectroscopy analysis, and compared with the library we had. And uh, I have found 39 compounds. I could not show it here in the slide uh, because of the short of space, but I have uh, shown here 25. And what we can see here, the percentage area I have highlighted, that is the higher level of percentage area. That means my um, extract, uh, my crude extract of raffinus sativus is maximum containing 17.79% uh, percentage of it, majority of the portion. And we know that GCMS analysis only uh, identify and quantify the volatile compounds. So here, by this method, we could identify the volatile compounds present over here. And 91215 octa decatetranoic acid is having the highest quantity and which the literature survey is saying that this compound specifically is having very good uh, anti-diabetic activity, anti-proliferative activity, anti-cancer activity as well. So that's a promising result. And we could see in the phytochemical screening that steroid is present. So that has also been proved in my GCMS analysis that the last compound which I have uh, highlighted, that is gamma cytosterol, that is uh, also present. And gamma cytosterol, we know it's a steroidal compound. We have done the antioxidant study where total phenolic content, total flavonoid content, we have identified and we could see the flavonoid is having higher value. That is 115 mg per 100 gram of extract. We have performed another four antioxidant study that is DPPH, radical scavenging activity, superoxide anion scavenging activity, ABTS, and hydrogen peroxide radical scavenging activity uh, against ascorbic acid as a standard. And as we know, ascorbic acid is the vitamin C, is a very potent antioxidant available. And we could get the IC50 value, that is the inhibitory concentration 50% value in microgram per ml. And um, we, can, we can see the comparison here. Uh, here is the cursor. So we could see that the maximum result uh, superoxide radical scavenging activity we have got, that is 198.5 for um, ascorbic acid, that is the standard one, and our sativas is having 140 uh, microgram per ml for my extract. So my compound is showing very potential for scavenging the free radical having a very good antioxidant potential. And lastly, we have performed antimicrobial activity. Uh, in antimicrobial activity, I have focused two gram positive and two gram negative bacteria. And here, E. coli, Escheria coli, and Staphylococcus aureus, both of these have been identified through several research and review paper that these two are MDR resistance, that is multi-drug resistance. And we know at this present time, multi-drug resistance is a big phenomenon. So where we could see we have used 50, 100, and 200 my, um, mg per ml, this three concentration, and this is the in, uh, interpretation of the zone of inhibition, where we could see that S typhi, Salmonella typhi, has shown the maximum zone of inhibition, and then uh, the E. coli, E. coli is responsible for for um, UTI infection, bacteremia, that is the infection in the blood. Staphylococcus aureus is uh, responsible for various uh, pulmonary infections. 
and salmonella typhi and bacillus subtilis is also very much dangerous when we are extremely exposed to it so this study also proves that my extract uh, having a very good amount of anti antimicrobial activity and i'm going to the previous slide this the six number of compound that i have highlighted here that is 15 hydroxymethyl furfuryl i have seen in the um uh literature survey that this compound so hypothesized that this very good antimicrobial activity which i have got by disk diffusion method which may be because of that particular conclusion of of my work um that this work actually proves that my uh, extract raffana sativa extract is extremely potential extremely potent for having very antioxidant activity and having various flavonoids which has a different effect like it says that it is having l glutamic acid it is having a cytoprotective activity anti cancer activity even l histidine which i have got in the amino anti diabetic in the literature survey and it is showing that it can reduce continuous use of l histidine can reduce the uh, fasting blood glucose level and postprandial blood glucose level as well so by which we can uh, we have done the preliminary section of the work to identify the chemical profiling and its value and in vivo method and few in vitro method though i have already done some of the in vitro method but the interpretation part is yet to be done that's why i could not show it in my presentation so this is all about uh, my today's presentation here are some of the references thank you so much everyone thank you sir do the session chair have any you. questions Sir, which the standard uh, using for standard R of value using for the SPDLC, sir? Analysis. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sir. Can you please come again? Uh, R of value not... for SP SPDLC. What are the different standard I have used for HPTLC? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, the standard I have used for HPTLC it was twenty. Uh, standard uh, I have used among which it was. chlorogenic acid camphorol routine uh, uh, coumarin we have used uh, because all of these are uh, all of this comes under the flavonoids and there was um, uh, lutein all of these things we have used uh, so do you want me to tell the all of the 20s um, standard no 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 okay so so these are yeah, of the standard uh, i have used what yes sir Sir, any okay, more question? No, sir. From anyone? Did Did you compare uh, the antimicrobial uh, activity with any standard also? The antimicrobial activity with? Sorry, yes. Sir, from again. Any standard drug? Yes, we have done. We have done, but uh, I could not. I did not give this. Uh, we have compared it with a tetracycline because it uh, has been a broad spectrum activity. But I could not show it because of some interpretation. I am yet to be done yet. So we have done it with a tetracycline because it is having a, a broad spectrum activity against the gram positive and negative. So thus, we could compare because of thus interpretation yet to be done. I could not show it here, sir. and one more question was uh, like yes sir similar uh, to your uh, research work has uh, the quantitative work been done already previously reported <laughs> on redis leaf uh sorry um, like you are asking like this kind of work on my particular leaf has for, been performed for, already uh, or not yes yes Since can so, we compare uh, so the, the uh, constituent uh, the level of constituent or the concentration you got through your study and was it reported previously also that uh, this leaf contains all this thing okay uh, sir uh, raffana sativa's leaf uh, the uh, what according to the literature survey i could perform yet that uh, there are lot of in vitro studies uh like in vitro anti cancer in vitro anti diabetic anti arthritis uh in vivo studies are there but chemical profiling is is there but not at this level 
even i would like to i would be very proud to tell you that the gcms analysis what we have performed where we could find uh, i could not mention the name right now because we are kind of in the way to kind of file a patent against it so it's i'm so sorry but we have uh, found out few of the uh, phytoconstituent through gcms analysis which has not been yet um, reported in the journal which we did search till the date so that is a part of innovation we could do and we are also um, uh, right now the process is going on we are trying to isolate some of the uh, phytoconstituent uh, which we have got from gcms analysis which is having higher level of percentage area like high level of presence is there so we are trying to isolate that as well so that is part that is a part which is not yet reported till date sir okay thank you thank you thank you sir any more question No. There are no more questions, sir. Thank you so much. Thank for you your so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all the uh, judges and juries present over here. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next person. I call upon Shubham Paul to present his presentation. Yes. Is am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. Okay. Please let me know whether my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. You can start now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Myself, uh, Subham Pal, Research Scholar, Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, GIS University. Today, my topic is Comprehensive Analysis of Epigenin, Myricetin, and Gallic Acid, and Quantification via HPTLC. And coupled with stigma sterol, campaign sterol, and gamma cytosterol identification through the GCMS analysis in methanolic extract of Cisas quadrangularis. So, uh, first of all, the objective of my proposed work uh, is to perform the thorough phytochemical analysis and isolation and quantification of the phytoconstituent, including some advanced analytical techniques like HPTLC, GCMS, and FTIR. And uh, another one that is uh, is to assess the in vitro antioxidant study of the extract uh, from the Cetus quantum glory. So this is my uh, plant profile. The particular my plant is having the family uh, in Vita C and it is having the common name that is called Harjora Harjor. And basically this particular plant is, has been distributed in the um, uh, more previous and native place of the native district of the West Bengal and also some of the tropical region according uh, accordingly in Asia, Arabia and African uh, African subcontinent. And my plant uh, has been collected uh, in the village of uh, Nodia district in the uh, month of October 2021. And the plant has been authenticated by the Botanical Survey of India. And I have performed the uh, extraction process by the methylation technique using the methanol with uh, consecutive uh, five days. This is the preliminary proximate analysis of my plant. Uh, this particular result that is showing that the my plant is having carbohydrate uh, amount that is 53%. Uh, the plant is having protein amount that is near about 4% and the add content of my plant that is near about 3% and the fiber content of the plant that is near about 16%. And the preliminary phytochemical screening of the plant that indicate the glycoside reducing sugar, cardiac glycoside, flavonoid and alkaloid that is present in my methanolic extract of my plant. So uh, from the TLC analysis, pre pre preliminary, we can identify the four uh, uh, polyphenols that is glalic acid, uh, quercetin, myrcin, and epigenin. And for the HPTLC analysis, uh, we can identify, uh, we can we can, we can can quantify the identified phytoconstituent. And among those, we can see that the gallic acid that is present in pretty much uh, a significant amount that is uh, 9.88 milligram in one gram. And epigenin also that is 9.99 milligram in one gram. Of my extract. So uh, from the GCMS analysis, total 47 compounds that I have been uh, identified uh, from the GCMS chromatogram of my methanol extract. And among those 47 compounds, the significant compound that is phytol, squalene, campesterol, gamma cytosterol, uh, gamma tocopherol, lupiol, uh, stigma sterol, and most of the compound that we can identify that is all about the polyphenols and the flavonoid and the steroid compound. 
now from the ftr spectral analysis that uh, from the ftr spectra uh, that can confirm the presence of the phenolic group and that can confirm uh, the presence of flavonoid group in my extract so basically this kind of spectral analysis they can confirm uh, the oh group that is the phenolic group that is present in my extract and the flavonoid compound that is present in my extract so in vitro antioxidant study total four uh, method that uh, has been performed uh, uh, that is uh, the dpph radical scavenging activity hydrogen peroxide radical scavenging activity superoxide anion scavenging activity and abts uh, assay and uh, from the four method of antioxidant activity um, the amount of ig50 value of my extract that is pretty much uh, comparable to my standard value that is ascorbic acid and in the total phenolic content and total flavonoid content, the amount that uh, has been uh, correlatable with the standard of gallic acid and quercetin, and this total phenolic content value and the flavonoid content value, it is also having a significant amount. Lastly, uh, what we conclude uh, from this particular study that this particular Cisas quantum glueris plant is having diverse phytoconstituent that can be identified and that can be isolated, that can be uh, quantified by uh, several advanced analytical techniques like FTIR, GCMS, HBTLC, and TLC. And it is a good antioxidant. So we have a further scope uh, to explore this kind of, uh, using this kind of plant to explore other pharmacological activity also. So this is my some reference. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request the session chest to proceed with the questions. No question, ma'am. Okay, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I would like to ask one question, sir. Uh, sometimes it is reported that this plant contains steroids also. Yes. Keto steroids. Yes. So, uh, in your investigation, I uh, saw that it was absent. In your, uh, I can't hear you here. I can't hear you properly, sir. In uh, the picture, it is reported that uh, this plant contains steroids mm. also. Mm. But in your phytochemical studies, it is absent. No, sir. In the GCMS analysis, I can see you that in case of GCMS analysis, there are several steroid compounds that is, uh, we can see the gamma cytosterol that is present in my particular uh, uh, GCMS analysis. And uh, though we have not, uh, we have not present the total 47 compound uh, that I, has been identified uh, through the GCMS analysis. So, uh, out of 47 compounds, there are a lot of compounds that is uh, steroid set that we cannot present here in the short phase. So, total 47 compounds. Uh, actually, to... actually, not not all the steroids. Uh, can you please uh, move to slide number 4? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Here, perhaps your uh, steroid test is negative. Uh, sir, that is, I think, sir, some typographical mistake, sir. So, uh, we have performed the steroid phytochemical state and it has showing positive results, sir. So, so I think uh, therefore, that, I asked that yes, uh, yes, sir. you yes, were sir. doing it. It is a typographical mistake, sir. Sorry, sir. So, okay. I, have, I, have, I have found some uh, steroid in my plant okay. also, sir. Okay, okay. Any questions, sir? Any other no questions? Question. No more questions. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next person. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I call Sushma Somkwa to present the e-oral presentation. Yes, Yes, ma'am. Please share your screen, ma'am.
מאם? Ma'am, your audio is very less, ma'am. Can you uh, move towards the speaker? Is it audible now, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, it's audible. Okay. So, my name is Sikna Sankar. Uh, and my... My presentation, presentation is on group QSR study of on perimedine. One minute, one minute. Group QSR study on perimedine negativity for their anti cancer activity. So let us proceed with the introduction part first. So, qualitative structure activity relationship. QSR is a fascinating field that connects chemistry and computational model, model, modeling. So, the definition for QSR, the QSR is the quantitative term parameter derived from the chemical structure of a molecule to a quantitative measure of a property or activity. If we say in simpler terms, it helps us to predict how a molecule structure influences biological activity or other property. Now come to the group QSR. Group QSR is also known as group or fragment-based QSR. Instead of analyzing the entire molecule, group QSR focuses on the specific fragment or group within the molecule. Uh, these fragments are evaluated using descriptors and specific fragmentation rules are applied to data sets. The aim of this study is to illustrate the relationship between the molecular structure of novel uh, molecule of pyrazolopyrimidine derivative and their anti-cancer property. Platform used was V-like molecular design suit software and the approach for group approaches group QSR. Within these studies, emphasis was placed on partitioning molecular descriptor information into substituent group-based descriptors. Uh, the statical significant value in model R square degradation coefficient. The minimum square uh, degradation coefficient is the value of biological activity and their physicochemical property. Now, it should not be less than 0 0.7. Then cross validation. Cross validation is done between the training set and test set. Then it should not be less than 0 0.5. External validation value. Uh, it is B1 out and it is done by software only. So now come to the methodology. A series of compounds, pyrozoloperimidine derivatives are selected uh, yeah. from online available database. And it is taken from ACS, Journal of Medicinal Chemistry. And the compound was selected in manual method of creation of fragments used for group QSR study. Uh, you can see in the structure, as shown in the figure, see all compounds were divided into four different fragments. And the W atom were chosen for further study. Once all the molecules got opened in group QSR worksheet activity was inserted, and the physical chemical uh, descriptors were calculated for each four fragment. This is the 24th molecule of pyrozolo pyrimidine derivatives are taken. Then model building is done for group QSR using advanced data selection tool. IC50 values were selected and uh, this is dependable variable and descriptor were selected as independent variable. Descriptor data set was then divided into training and test set by sphere estimating method. For modeling, uh, for model building, uh, simulated analysis method was used from regression method and the following parameters were selected. Uh, these are the parameters. Cross correlation limit as 0 0.5, terms in model as switch, minimum temperature as 0 0.0001, decrease temperature by uh, 10, perturbation limit as 1, and the variance cutoff as 0. Maximum temperature as 1000, filtration as given temperature as 10, seed as 9, 999, term selection criteria R square, and the scaling is auto scaling. 
three models for group PSA are the built by model building wizards, and these are the these are three models. Uh, model one, this is the statical parameter for all the three models. For model uh, G, uh, for model one, these are the statical parameters. Uh, the radar plot is plot between this training sets and test sets, which show closeness between the actual and predical, uh, predicted activity of training and test uh, The equation explains about 90% of the total variance in the training set and has internal and external predictive ability of about 76% uh, and about 73% respectively. The FP test 12.7318 shows the practical significance of the model, which means the probability of failure of the model is very low. This is the contribution plot. You can see in this structure, all the values are in negative. And the developed group QSR model results that all the districts that play important role and are inversely proportional in determining biophysical activity. The next most important factor is that three districts, R3 Chi 2 R3 Kappa 3, and R3 Chi 3 show the substitution at R3 Chi 2 stable for designing of new. Component. Lastly, the premise of this vector R1, that is the to come, which is also inversely proportional to the activity, so the role of R1 site in determining activity. This is the radar plot for model 2. Uh, the equation explains about 85% of the total variance in the training set and the internal and external predictability of about 70% and about 80% respectively. The F test 17.4019 shows the statistical significance of the model, which means the probability of failure of the model is very low. This is the contribution for plot uh, for model two. The developed GQSR model divides the descriptor R3. The value for chi B2 and R3 uh, K3 uh, alpha suggests that the R3 cipher modification is in compound for better activity indicates the importance of R1 size. This is the radar plot for model 3. The equation explains that the correlation value is quite good, but about 80% and prediction ability of the model is good too. The F test 17.401 shows the statistical significance of the model, which means the probability of post failure is less. This is the contribution for uh, contribution plot for group, uh, model 3. In this group QSA model, the same descriptor are repeated as in model 2, and it reveals that all the descriptors play important role and are inversely proportional in determining the biological activity. Lastly, the presence of this uh, descriptor R1, which also inversely proportional to activity, shows the role of R1 site in determining activity. So these are the descriptor meaning chi B2. This descriptor signifies atomic valence connectivity index, this descriptor defines the total number of CH2 group connected with two single bonds. Kappa 3, this descriptor signifies third kappa shape index. Chi 3 cluster, this descriptor signifies simple third order cluster chi index in a compound. And K3 alpha, the descriptor signifies third alpha modified shape index. It is finally concluded that it is proved by the generated group PSR model that some molecules with the like chi 2 uh, CH2 count, kappa 3, chi 3 cluster, and chi 3 alpha are most promising for the anti-cancer activity of parallel of the value. Position of descriptor like R1, R3, R2 signifies the location of fragmented, uh, fragmented group in a parent compound. And uh, as we have studied in the plot, the negative contribution of the descriptor in group QSR model results that this descriptor could be removed or replaced to get good anti-cancer activity. Statical parameter of all models with satisfactory values and prove the acceptance of models for designing new compounds of promoting anti-cancer activity. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. I request the session chairs to proceed with the questions. Are there any questions, sir? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. We'll move on to the final presentation of the day. I call Mittal Patel to present the e-oral presentation. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, is my voice audible? Yes, ma'am, your voice is audible. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, here I am to present my topic that is uh, formulation and evaluation of preloxifen hydrochloride for bone health. Uh, Starting with the introduction, a brief uh, overview of osteoporosis that's a growing concern uh, with both male and female due to certain lifestyle conditions, due to physiological conditions, then due to hormonal changes. And with the passage of years, it's an increased concern. And uh, the current treatment or therapies that have been used for osteoporosis, basically what people do is they take either calcium and D3 supplementation or there is an anti resorptive therapy including biphosphate and uh, denosumab. And the third option is hormonal treatment where they go for uh, estrogen, uh, testosterone and uh, PTH analogs. Uh, the rationale for selection of drug that currently I'm working for eloxifen hydrochloride because uh, in the market, uh, this is one of the most prescribed drug uh, for osteoporosis for uh, growing bone cells and decreasing the osteoporosis concern. Uh, basically, uh, the existing treatments like bifosonate has certain drawbacks of AFF and uh, osteonecrosis. Uh, hormonal therapy has side effects like uh, forming of blood clots or endometrial and breast cancer. And bone building agents, like uh, suppose if patient is on a uh, biphosphonate or something, they have to go for injections and uh, uh, it's, uh, like, it's not an oral therapy. So uh, the patient uh, non-compliance is there and it is a long-term therapy like you need to take for certain years. So reloxifen is selective estrogen receptor modulator. So it exactly mimics the estrogen and uh, it increases the density of bone. And with uh, if we compare it with the biphosphonate, that is a second option. But there, uh, the side effects and the patient compliance is a major issue. Talking about the drug, uh, the drug has a positive, uh, negative effect that is antagonist on estrogen, that is a receptor of breast and endometrium, whereas it has an agonist action on the skeletal system. Uh, so 60% of the dose is absorbed and uh, it is extensively distributed uh, on the oral administration. Uh, the issue with this drug is uh, extensively, extensively first pass metabolism and uh, the, there is an excretion rate uh, in the feces and 2% in the urine. Uh, rationally for uh, selection of uh, the work that is uh, the drug over here where it has it belongs to BCS class 2 drug having the poor solubility and dissolution rate and the main issue is the metabolism that it undergoes 98% pre-systemic metabolism and it has only 2% barbability. So what I have done is I have selected calcium phosphate as a carrier. Now why this as a carrier because calcium phosphate is a new, uh, natural supplement that we take in our daily routine and it has intact mechanism of absorption and directly uh, readily absorbed to the bone. So this carrier has been uh, has been explored for certain control targeted delivery. Uh, it also prevents the endocytosis means here it is protecting the drug from the first pass metabolism and it, it, ha it has like intact mechanism of being an osteoconductive material with a high affinity with the bone and it is a good safe option because it's a natural element so none of the toxicity or incompatibility issues could arise so here there's a basic mechanism of uh, absorption of the cap where it offers both the transport that is saturable that is transcellular and non-saturable that is paracellular so what exactly it does uh, when it is entering into the cell uh, there's a rupture of ly lysosome and uh, it forms an endo uh, endosome formation and with this, when it is entering, it helps uh, to release the drug within the cell. 
the novelty of the work is uh, right now raloxifen uh, uh, for this drug or the published articles or the patents has done either size reduction either size reduction or they have tried to improve solubility, permeability, dissolution, retention. But the work has been less focused to barability due to, uh, that is due to the metabolism of drug and the on-site release that exactly where it has to go to, uh, go to the bone cells. So novelty of work is here. What the issue is like targeting the barability that is first pass metabolism. This drug has been loaded on the calcium phosphate that is the best carrier of choice for bone delivery. And here itself, it has an integrate mechanism to get absorbed onto the bones. So it is protecting the drug from metabolism and wherein we can go for higher uptake of drug with improved barability so that the side effects are reduced and we get a proper therapeutic action. So this kind of uh, CAP loaded drug particles, oral particles has not been explored yet. Uh, now moving on to the experimental work, uh, basic identification of drug with the melting point was done. Uh, a, preliminary, uh, a preliminary check for the drug of FTI spectra was done, which was a match with the standard. Uh, calibration curve in different buffers has been uh, done. Uh, manufacturing of the particles was done by co-precipitation. So here calcium salt and phosphate salt both were simultaneously mixed on the high pressure homogenizer at 12,000 RPM uh, in, uh, like, like maintaining the pH with 0.1 normal NOS that is pH 10. Further it was sonicated uh, centrically the particles were allowed to properly dry and finally we can get the carrier that is CAPA particle. Now for forming this particle, I have screened certain salts uh, that have been reported. Different combinations and concentration of calcium and phosphate salts were explored in the form of batches A1 to A6. So out of all these uh, batches, when uh, the particle size and percentage yield was uh, considered as an outcome, A3 batch uh, provided with a good uh, particle size and percentage yield out of all the six batches. So this was further selected for loading of drug. So firstly, in this method, the drug was dissolved in ethanol and with a rapid mixing. Uh, when it is in the mixing condition, the carrier particles were added uh, into the uh, drug solvent system. Uh, after a certain period of time, for specific hours, uh, the drug loading was allowed on the particles. Further, it was sonicated, uh, ultra centrifuge and dry at 40 degrees Celsius. So uh, this step, after this step, we can obtain the drug loaded particle. Two factors were considered uh, basically that is drug in carrier ratio and the stirring time. Uh, so one is to one, one is to two and one is to three ratio was explored along with the stirring time of 12, 18 and 24. Uh, now out of uh, these factors, the batches were evaluated for entrapment efficiency, drug loading and drug release. So nine batches were formulated as per three to two factorial design. So uh, uh, after getting uh, from the experimental design, uh, the responses, the mainly focus was entrapment efficiency and drug release at six hours, which I would explain further in the form of graphical form. Uh, this is the release of all the batches, a graphical representation. Uh, with this uh, figure, the DOE, uh, as we can see with the increase in the drug carrier ratio and stirring time, more amount of drug loading was been observed. Uh, same goes that if the drug carrier was at higher ratio and stirring time was enough, the drug release Hello? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Your audio will. Hello. Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, sorry, just got disconnected. I'm no quickly problem, connecting back. No problem, ma'am. Just connect back. Just give me a minute so I can quickly connect.
जस्ट आई एम शेयरिंग दिस ओके मैम सॉरी फॉर द इनकन्वीनियंस so with the increase in uh, drug carrier ratio and uh, uh, with the increase in uh, studying time a better drug loading and drug release was found to be observed uh, this is an uh, whole list spectra from which uh, three further batches were been selected uh, to determine the per percentage prediction error so predictive value was compared with the observed value and percentage prediction error was found to be less than uh, 5% uh, this is actually uh, at uh, the dsc spectra the first spectra showing uh, of pure drug that the pick was found to be sharp and in the second spectra the drug was being loaded on the cab particles so there you can observe that there is an uh, pick widening or uh, the absence of pick showing that the reloxifene has been uh, successfully adsorbed on the cap carrier drug was done on the carrier Uh, so right now the work is at this stage uh, further uh, the publication work and the cell line study uh, would be done to efficiently check if uh, the drug could proliferate uh, the bone cells uh, so the outcome of uh, the work could be a non invasive a non invasive uh, oral efficient uh, delivery of reloxifen hydrochloride uh, where we are just using a normal uh, calcium supplement so it is adding as a supplement also and it is adding means it is acting as a delivery uh, agent uh, to successfully uh, carry the drug uh, and avoid its metabolism and bypass mechanism system due to its uh, intact absorption to the bones so hence uh, the final outcome would be increase in viability and uh, resolving that issue and to efficiently deliver the drug that is therapeutic effect these are some of the references of the work and further uh, we are also planning to explore this combination along with the d3 so uh, this would be completely a target for the osteoporosis drug delivery uh, thank you all thank you ma'am i request the session chairs to proceed with the questions इन्फॉर्मेशन टू बी पास इज दैट द सर्टिफिकेट विल बी सेंट टू यू बाय मेल बाय नेक्स्ट वीक एंड all the sessions एंड की नोट सेशन आर कंप्लीटेड बाई टूडे सो दे विल नॉट बी अ सेशन टूमोरो and the session chair sirs are kindly asked to submit your evaluation form to ms ramya any other queries that all the participants might have you can ask to ms ramya and i will propose the vote of thanks on the behalf of the 11th world conference on pharmaceutical science and drug manufacturing i would like to express my gratitude to our session chairs dr murugesan dr ravindran and dr satish for their time and consideration and guidance throughout the session i would like to thank all the participants for their present presentation in making this conference a very informative and interesting one i thank all of you once again for your participation with that the meeting has been concluded you may exit the room now thank you all thank you thank you thank you sir